Awesome. If sergeants will start their recordings, I'll begin mine on the PC. According to the cloud, in progress as well. Backup is rolling. Excellent. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the committee on subcommittee on zoning. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video to minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, uh, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you um, and good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, the chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I am joined remotely today by members uh, Ayala and Carnegie. Uh, today we will hold public hearings on rezoning proposals for the 1045 Atlantic Avenue and the Special Navy Yard District in Brooklyn, as well as a development proposal for 250 Water Street in Manhattan uh, and a proposed citywide zoning tax amendment concerning a special permit mechanism for hotel development. Uh, before we turn uh, to our hearings, I will first recognize the subcommittee council to review the remote meeting procedures. Thank you, Chair Moya. I am Arthur Ha, counsel to this subcommittee. Members of the public wishing to testify were asked to register for today's hearings. If you wish to testify and have not already registered, we ask that you please do so now by visiting the council's website at www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Members of the public may also view a live stream broadcast of this meeting at the council's website. As a technical note for the benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. When called to testify, individuals appearing before the subcommittee will be recognized by the chair to speak. Applicant teams will be recognized as a group and called first, followed by members of the public. Please take a moment to check your device and confirm that your microphone is on before you begin speaking. Public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you would like to submit written testimony instead of appearing before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. During the hearing, council members' questions should use the Zoom raise hand function. Council members' questions will be announced in order as they raise their hands, and Chair Moya will recognize members to speak. Witnesses are requested to remain in the meeting uh, until excused by the chair as council members may have questions. Finally, there will be pauses over the course of this meeting for various technical reasons, and we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. Uh, chair Moya will now continue with today's agenda items. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Uh, I now open the public hearing on pre-considered LU items for the 1045 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal under ULURPS number C210276ZMK and N210277ZRK, uh, requesting zoning map and zoning text amendments relating to property in Council Member Cornegie's District in Brooklyn. For anyone wishing to testify on this item, if you uh, have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Um, and I see we have uh, council member Carnegie uh, on. I want to turn it over to him if he has any opening remarks before we start the presentation. Thank you, Chair Moya. Um, I just wanted to express uh, my support for this project. Um, what we are here in Bedford-Stuyvesant and Northern Crown Heights is no less than the epicenter of gentrification. And in an effort to create more affordable housing units, um, there is a need to be creative. And along that Atlantic Avenue corridor, it allows for um, a zoning change to have more affordability. Um, the feasibility study that has been done has stated and dictated that uh, the, a building of uh, this magnitude does not affect the ancillary homes in, uh, that are located in, in close proximity, uh, including sight lines and including shading. 
Um, it has also, you know, uh, been brought to my attention that this is one of the ways to create um, by far one of the uh, highest degree of affordability in the district in one uh, site. So I am in full support of, of this project at 1045 Atlantic Avenue, and I want to register that for the record. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya. Thank you, uh, Councilman Cornegy. Um, I uh, now would uh, ask the council to please call the first panel for this item. The applicant panel for this item will include Tucker Reed and Vivian Liao uh, and Elizabeth Canella of Totem, Colvin Granham of Beverly Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation and Eric Palatnik as uh, Land Use Counsel for the applicant. We also have available for Q&A Jason Diaz and Bhaskar Srivastava. Good morning, can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you so much for having us here today to the subcommittee and to Councilman Cornegy uh, for those remarks. My name is Vivian Liao, I'm uh, one of the principals. Excuse me, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, panelists, I need you to uh, uh, be sworn in first. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Would all panelists please raise your right hands? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony uh, you will provide before the subcommittee will, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, uh, and that you will answer truthfully to all council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 My, my apologies, and, and just quickly as a reminder, sorry, uh, thank you for that, uh, Arthur. Um, just a reminder, when you're ready to present your slideshow, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen, and slides will be advanced for you by our staff. For the ben benefit of the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and now you and your team may begin. Um, and again, if you can, uh, we ask you to restate your name and the organization for the record. Thank you. Sure. I was just so excited to get started. You can uh, bring up <laughs> you can bring up the presentation now. Uh, again, my name is Vivian Liao. I'm one of the principals of Totem, and thank you all for having us here today. Uh, we're excited to be partnering with our friends at Bed Stuy Restoration Corporation to help bring new affordable housing and other benefits to Central Brooklyn. You'll be hearing from some of the other team members in a moment, but first a quick intro to our firm. You can go to the next slide. We started Totem five years ago, uh, bringing our collective experience in government, urban design, and real estate to focus on local projects that benefit communities. The common thread tying our projects together is the approach we take to centering the voices of communities in which we work. As a group of former public servants, we see the opportunity to leverage the power of the marketplace to create lasting benefits for the community. We're literally trying to chart a new way of development, one building at a time. This slide shows the hallmarks of a totem development, how we're trying to build intentionally and with the community in mind, focus on a few key principles. Uh, around housing affordability, economic mobility, inclusive infrastructure, and sustainability. And we're particularly proud of how we plan to put these principles into action, specifically at 1045 Atlantic Avenue. And for more details on that, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Tucker Reed, now to take you through the details. Thanks, Vivian. Good morning. Tucker Reed from Totem, uh, principal of Totem, um, and thanks for having us this morning. Next slide, please. Um, Building on the remarks by Council Member Cornegie, thanks again for uh, you know your support and leadership on this project. Um, re really, what the major uh, issue that we're trying to address with this project is the uh, need for a um, large amount of new affordable housing in Community Board Three in Bedford Stuyvesant. So, you know, this we with all of our projects, we're really data driven. I think you know, hopefully, this visual helps us understand. Uh, on the left-hand side is the amount of affordable housing that's been built in Community Board 3 since 2014. Um, uh, about uh, Only about 200 units of inclusionary housing. On the right-hand side is the amount of market rate uh, of which there's been more than 3,200 units. Um, so only you know five to six percent of new construction has been affordable, only 200 units or so. And so we're excited about the opportunity to bring a significant amount of affordability to this site. Next site, slide please. Um, just to orient us to the site, here's the zoning map. Next slide, please. We zoom in on uh, Atlantic Avenue. We are on Atlantic between uh, Franklin and Claussen. 
um, our, uh, the current zoning of the uh, five lots that we own uh, is designated as M11, which allows for one FAR of, of uh, commercial development. Next slide. And you know, over the last two years, working with city planning and council member Cornegie, we've arrived at a, a zoning overlay of a C63A, which is an R9 equivalent uh, for the site. Next slide. Which would result in a building per oh, um, the land. Um, sorry, just the land use map that shows we're really a, a kind of commercial um, uh, hole of the donut in a, a sea of uh, of housing that surrounds the site. Next slide, please. Um, and we're also very aware of the fact that uh, there has been an ongoing dialogue um, with the community boards and city planning over the last number of years to develop this M Crown framework. Uh, we actually fall on the purple trapezoid here with the yellow project site highlighted, which had been uh, designated for higher density commercial uses. Um, but as a product of our conversations with particularly community board three over the last two years has expressed to us a real desire to see as much affordable housing built on our site as possible. And so we've really tried to wed uh, the priorities around affordable housing with community board three with the uh, kind of guiding principles around the M Crown planning district here that called for some reactivation of commercial uses. And so you'll see on the next slide, what we tried to do is create a building program um, that, that tries to thread that needle. So uh, C63A we would have a, a retail base of about 33,000 square feet, 25% of which we would set aside for small, um, small neighborhood business owners, uh, priority of council member Cornegie. Um, a, a, at least one floor of uh, commercial office use um, or um, uh, community facility use in keeping with the um, uses that were identified as priority in the M Crown planning framework. And then the balance of the building being uh, multifamily apartments, approximately 420 of which 126 or 30% would be set aside uh, as permanently affordable housing. Next slide, please. Um, another result of the conversation with the community board about uh, density and height on, on this site in particular was to really make sure that we did our best to design a building that had as de minimis impact as possible from a shadow perspective on the surrounding um, buildings um, and also took into account sustainability planning uh, around green infrastructure of which will be a hallmark of this uh, project in particular. So if we go to the next slide, we could quickly just talk the committee through uh, the great pains that we took from an urban design standpoint to carve the building to reflect the pathway of the sun across the site. So here is the kind of as of right box at C63A. And as you start to go through the progression, next slide, please, you start to see how we've taken the bulk um, and reoriented it uh, to allow for the pathway of the sun as it crosses the site uh, throughout the day. Uh, can keep going kind of through this progression. Um, and then using that green infrastructure as, uh, to move up the building with setbacks and green walls, et cetera, um, to provide privacy also to uh, the backyards of the buildings uh, that abut our site. And so the next slide, I think it shows the, oh, sorry, I go back one side. Sorry, just the, the, the final you know, product here um, shows I hopefully the great pains that were taken to carve the building to reflect the solar path of the sun and have uh, de minimis impacts from a, from a shading standpoint, um, but also the uh, green and sustainable um, elements that have gone into creating what we hope will become a kind of marquee building in the rest or in the um, bed -Stuy community. And next slide, the last thing, um, after many conversations with city planning, just to arrive at the density multiple that kind of supports the R9 designation. I really looked at the Fulton Street uh, rezoning that was done a number of years ago, um, and that was an 80 foot wide street. And the uh, kind of density multiple uh, that was arrived at for Fulton Street was one and a half times the street width um, for the building height. And so we applied that same multiple here on the Atlantic Avenue uh, site, which is 120 feet wide. Um, and allows for a building height of uh, uh, max at 175 feet. Next slide, please. Um, and then just a few views of the rendered building uh, on Atlantic Avenue. This is from the Barclay Center side of Atlantic from the Southwest. Next slide. Um, from the Southeast, really taking into account the kind of height 
um, precedents that are uh, created by the Armory Building on Atlantic Avenue, not far from us. Next slide, please. Um, and then um, the kind of ground floor activation of the building, you see that we're trying to create um, a, a building here that is welcome and inviting uh, to the neighborhood, particularly from a pedestrian safety standpoint, Atlantic Avenue with all the vehicular traffic often doesn't feel like the most inviting pedestrian thoroughfare. And so uh, we've worked with city planning here to widen the sidewalk uh, an additional um, uh, to, a, to a wider street that would accommodate both tree plantings and retail activation, but uh, ped a pedestrian friendly and inviting environment. Next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my partner, Liz Canella to talk a little bit through the further program elements of the building. Hi everyone, uh, Liz Canella, project manager at TOTEM. Next slide, please. So a lar the large part of the project is, is sort of why we're doing it um, and the community benefits that are accomplished for Bed-Stuy. So as a reminder, slide three, we talked a little bit about the housing production in the neighborhood. Um, and with this, pro and there's only been about 200 units um, over the last, like, almost a full decade. Uh, so in this project, we're able to build 126 units of affordable housing and the we would be pursuing option two where there's an average of 80% of AMI. Um, and something that was important was to include uh, units starting as low as 40% of AMI um, in that average. And happy to answer a little bit more questions there, but in, in addition to the housing, there's also uh, an important jobs piece and to which we can go to the next slide and I'll turn it over to Colvin. Good morning. Uh, my name is Colvin Granham. I am the president and CEO of Bethesda Stuyvesant Restoration Corporation. Um, the first thing I would like to do is just acknowledge C Councilman Cornegie for his of vision and guidance, not just with respect to this project, but with respect to um, housing and small business development in central Brooklyn. So this project is in many ways intended to reflect the priorities and preferences that he's established over his term, his, his tenure as a council person. Uh, Beth Establishment Restoration uh, is the nation's first community development corporation. Our mission is to relentlessly pursue strategies to close gaps in family and community wealth so that all families in central Brooklyn are healthy and prosperous. Our strategic direction is to close, to disrupt and close the racial wealth gap. We do that through economic, economic mobility services and programs um, that are intended to help people increase their income, um, save more, and uh, build strong uh, careers. Um, housing is a major part of that, and we're very pleased to be a part of this project team, um, working with TOTEM, uh, a firm that we've worked with on multiple projects. Um, we're excited uh, about the significant amount of affordable housing units that are being added to the Bed-Stuy Crown Heights area and the effective use of 1045 Atlantic as a transit oriented housing site. Um, our collective team, which includes St. Nick's and others, um, has great experience and has been effective on other projects in the areas of drive training, MWBE engagement, um, economic mobility services, affordable housing marketing and administration, and small business support. You see Crescent Consulting, They'll be working on the MWBE issues. Um, 32BJ, as you well know, provides uh, prevailing wage jobs. Collectively, we will be recruiting folk to work on the construction side. We will also be recruiting local residents who are entrepreneurs to open businesses in the commercial sites. Um, we expect this project to be not just a generator of affordable housing, but a generator of economic development and equity. Thank you. Thank you, Colvin. Next slide, please. And I'll just round out quickly um, the rest of the building program uh, and community benefits that we see 
being created in this project. Uh, first of all, we're excited to, to pilot both with uh, Restoration and the Brooklyn Community Foundation, the idea of a kind of tenant-led community impact fund the building. The building will contribute $50,000 a year to seed uh, grants to local community-based organizations. And that effort will be hopefully guided by the residents of uh, the building, both the affordable and market rate residents who can come together and think about how to distribute these funds uh, to support local based uh, nonprofit groups that benefit the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Uh, or, you know, my partner Vivian mentioned that design and urban design is really at the forefront of our thinking about uh, our development projects. This site in particular along Atlantic Avenue, for those that are familiar with it, know that it has been neglected for many, many years uh, in many places in the public spaces, particularly under the MTA infrastructure. There's often trash strewn about, et cetera. So we look forward to working with the MTA and the community board on reactivating these spaces and creating warm, inviting, uh, safe spaces for uh, community to access both our site uh, and also reclaim some of these forgotten spaces from, from trash and dumping, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, we're excited to partner with UNI, who is going to provide secure bike parking uh, on site that is free and open to the public. Uh, UNI is a, uh, a uh, black and brown led company founded in Crown Heights. Um, and we're excited about the entrepreneurial spirit that they're gonna be bringing to the building. And we think it's kind of representative of the types of partnerships that we hope this building will bring uh, to Bedford Stuyvesant. Next slide, please. Um, and then also most excitingly, uh, we have uh, hope, we're hoping to pilot a uh, technology here um, that would use uh, bat battery technology to capture energy uh, at off peak times during the grid and use it to uh, both power our building, uh, but also potentially to uh, pump energy back into the grid uh, at times when there are peak usage that um, you know, require strain on the grid. So like floods, brownouts, blackouts, et cetera. Um, using this technology, we're excited about the fact that we are going to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of the project greatly. In fact, we are not going to have any cooking gas in the building. All the appliances will be powered by electricity. Um, and hopefully, you know, piloting a, a very green technology uh, with this addition that will make uh, the building close to carbon neutral, uh, which we hope is a precedent for future development um, in the area as well. And then finally, um, last next slide. Um, you know, there's a, a number of green infrastructure elements that are built into the project um, that we already mentioned, things like carving of the sun in the green roofs, but also bioswales in the street, uh, et cetera, things, uh, priorities particularly that were articulated to us by Borough President Eric Adams, um, and we we're excited to incorporate into this project. And so finally, on the last slide, just a summation of um, all of the program elements that we talked about that uh, ranging from the uh, significant amount of new affordable housing that the project brings um, to the kind of inf inclusive infrastructure and sustainability components that went into our thinking and have informed uh, the development. And thank you for the opportunity to present before the subcommittee and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of questions before um, I turn it over to Councilmember Cornegy. Um, so, how did you determine the C six three A was a, an appropriate density to propose for this site uh, on Atlantic Avenue? Uh, one, because the Borough President and Community Board three both recommended a lower um, C six two A zoning district that would allow a seven point two uh, FAR and one hundred and fifty uh, one hundred and forty five height. Uh, how do you uh, uh, respond to those recommendations? Um, thank you for the for the question, Chairman. I mean, I, we, yeah, we definitely have gone through a long dialogue with both the city and uh, the local council member and the community board on just this topic. Um, you know, the the urban planning rationale that went into the height proposal here is really driven by a, a few factors. One was the street length, uh, width and the kind of precedent that's been set for uh, other development in the neighborhood in terms of a density factor uh, that was really recommended to us both by city planning and by Councilmember Cornegie. Um, but also, hopefully it came through 
you know, the significant amount of community benefits that we're able to provide uh, in this project um, and the additional density certainly underwrites the, our ability to provide that depth of community benefit and the amount of affordable housing here. Um, and so while the 30 feet uh, of difference may not seem like a lot to, to some folks, it obviously drives a lot in terms of project value and our ability to provide these benefits. Um, and then just lastly, and our architect, Bosker, is here to help uh, answer questions if, if we'd like to drill down into this further. But our ability to solar carve the building uh, and remass the density, um, the flexibility that C63A uh, really makes that possible. At the lower density, uh, there is not room to carve. And so the box of the building uh, outline would be fairly fixed. And we had concerns about the impact on the shadows in that case. And good after, good morning, it's Eric Palatnik. Good morning, Councilman. If it's okay, if I could add to, to Tucker's response a little bit there. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Good morning. So uh, I just wanted to call to your attention that uh, you may recognize Tucker and his team. They're a team that just came before you on a rezoning that we completed on Fourth Avenue, uh, and and we were able to complete such a successful rezoning there through a careful balance between the community's needs, what the city wanted to see, what the council people wanted to see, and and ultimately coming up with a great development. And, and here I think we're mimicking the same thing here. Uh, there is, a, as you know, a C45D across the street, so there, there is a, a precedent, at least for a taller building. Now, it's the extra few feet here that Tucker was just speaking about that we've uh, addressed through what we're calling solar carving, but it's really through good architecture. And, and the good architecture is able to be done hand in hand with the bulk that we're getting, because Bhaskar is able to design a nicer building that is able to address uh, the concerns of people with height. So if you'd like, we could show you some pictures of it, because we haven't shown you any pictures, uh, maybe that'll help ease ease some of the concerns. Uh, is that okay with you? Is that acceptable? Yeah, it's totally fine. Oh, but great. Bhaskar, is it okay if you speak for a few minutes and uh, whoever's controlling the screen, can they pull up uh, some imagery for us? So, uh, the, uh, this is Bhaskar. I'm the principal at Density Works Architecture. We are a, a minority and woman-owned business, a uh, small business ourselves. And we've been uh, taking a deep look at this. I live, I've lived in the neighborhood in this community district for the last 20 years myself. And uh, I'm very intimate with the street character and, the, uh, and parts of it uh, that are landmarked uh, and the street character is very precious to the community here. At the same time, uh, around our community district, there is one, this very unique corridor of 120 foot roadbed that Atlantic Avenue provides us. This really wide piece of infrastructure can actually handle a lot of street traffic, pedestrian traffic, infrastructure. And uh, the for a wider right of way to support a taller building is not just a land use rationale here, but form-based zonings all across the planet are using that. When you have a big piece of infrastructure that's been handed out down to us through uh, planning or eminent domain, whatever it is, and uh, to, to take that piece of infrastructure and load density on it because it has uh, immediate access to transit, uh, is probably the highest best use of this uh, uh, right away that we have been provided here. So we looked at Fulton Street rezoning where Fulton is an 80 foot right away with 5.6 FAR and a maximum building height of 115 feet. Now Atlantic Avenue is 120 feet right away. So which is one and a half times Fulton Street. So if you take one and a half times 5.6 FAR or one and a half times uh, a building height of 115 feet that's allowed on the 80 feet, feet right away on Fulton. You come up with an FAR of about 8.5 and a building height of approximately 175, which uh, uh, automatically led us to a C63A, R9A kind of volume that uh, was, you know, like an off the shelf product in the city planning uh, uh, you know, in the zoning districts that was available to us. And it was remarkably close to exactly the one and a half times the density of Fulton that this street could support. Um, and there's very 
few streets uh, that are, have this kind of right of way and proximity to transit to give it away to like a lower density would be giving up uh, an opportunity that could address our infrastructure need, could address our sustainability uh, needs, could address our uh, um, inclusionary and affordable housing needs. Uh, so that was our rationale for uh, the massing that we proposed here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the, the added information there for us. Um, just wanted to skip to uh, one last question. Uh, at the end, you, you kind of were talking about the tenant-led community uh, impact fund of uh, $50,000 uh, a year to be distributed to local organizations um, in a participatory process, which is a very like novel con uh, concept. Where did the idea come from uh, and when do you anticipate uh, the work to begin? Uh, yeah, thank you. I think um, the concept came really out of our conversations with um, both Bedside restoration uh, and Colvin's leadership and vision and, and urging to make sure that the building creates benefits that connect back to the neighborhood. Um, and, and some of our own thoughts around how to make sure that when you're introducing uh, new uh, density into a neighborhood that there's connect, connective tissue created between the new residents that are moving in uh, and the existing community, uh, as well as helping to hopefully mitigate some of the impacts uh, of the you know, introduction of, of new units, which are both needed from a housing shortage uh, standpoint, but also, um, you know, can, can put a drain on community resources in, in terms of, uh, you know, serving new neighbors. And so uh, this was our attempt at trying to pilot a, a new approach to sharing uh, some of the benefits that are created by the building uh, with the actual neighborhood that it's located in. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That's that's it for me uh, in terms of questions. Uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Cornegy. But before that, I just want to uh, uh, acknowledge that uh, we've been rejoined by uh, Councilmember Borelli and uh, also joined by Councilmember uh, Reynoso. And just as a reminder uh, to my colleagues, uh, we have a five-minute um, uh, clock set up uh, for questions. You can always come back again for a second round of questions if uh, need be. Uh, but now I'll turn it over to Councilman Pornigy. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Moya. Um, again, I just want to reiterate my support for the project. Um, uh, it, 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 you know, I think that the way that it was articulated by both uh, the nonprofit partner and um, by the developer is that this was a painstaking, thoughtful process to make sure that this doesn't have a negative impact, but only a positive impact. My community um, has unfortunately had the, dis, uh, the misfortune of projects happening to them and not for them. Um, it was a long, tedious, drawn out process to get to a place that could provide maximum affordability, uh, some commercial viability in an area that had been underutilized, uh, at least for residential. So I, I think that um, it, is, it is time that in these communities where affordability is a real, real issue. And like I said, I stated earlier, we are clearly at the epicenter of gentrification in Bedford-Stuyvesant and, and, and Northern Crown Heights. Uh, it requires us to be bold in our thinking and move forward with things that may have not necessarily been a part of the lexicon for development in the past. So this is one of those projects that I, that I support at first blush, I know that the uh, borough president's office and the community board and yeah, community board three uh, had their misgivings about it. I still stand firmly in my support for the project. I believe that it's what Bedford Stuyvesant needs to begin to do in order to create affordability, but also not push out, you know, as we create deep affordability, not forget our middle class on projects like this. So the range, I think, is the right range. The partnership, I think, is the right partnership. Uh, so I, again, stand firmly in my support for this particular project on Atlantic Avenue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman Pornigy. Uh, I turn it over to our council to see if we have any council members uh, that uh, may have any questions for this panel. Uh, no, Chair Moya, I see no members with questions for this panel. Uh, excuse me, Councilmember Ayala. 
Council Member Ayala with a question. I'm sorry, and I Thanks think I'm now. It's okay. Thank you. I think I may have missed this, but how many how many stories is this building? Seventeen. Seventeen stories. And what's the total unit count? I know there's 126 units of affordable housing. I think I heard. What, total that... about 420, 420 units, out of which 126, uh, about 126 are affordable housing, inclusionary housing units. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I think you know, I don't know, I. I, I like the idea. I like, I love the project. It was, it looks, you know, it's, it's a beautiful building, beautiful design. I just worry about the density in that, in that community. Um, and I agree with, with Councilman McCornegy. I mean, we have to be, um, you know, we have to start thinking um, about the future of that community. And, you know, we need to start building affordable housing because we're not, you know, it seems like, like that part of Brooklyn is kind of at a standstill. Um, but that's a lot of density for that community. And um, the community board is, is in opposition. I'm assuming. Did I hear correctly? The community board actually voted unanimously in favor of the project. Um, I just, they recommended a slightly lower density uh, in terms of uh, height. Hello. I, I just, I just want to add, uh, Councilmember Ayala, I, I, you know, under normal circumstances, I feel the same way, except it's on a commercial thoroughfare. And it's one of the widest streets that we have here, not just in my district, but in Brooklyn. And it's been tremendously underutilized. And, you know, so changing the, the you know, uh, uh, its landscape from low density commercial um, is, I believe, the right way to go. If this would have been in the center of Bedside, I would say, you know, obstruction of views, out of context, perhaps. However, it is on a commercial thoroughfare. And if we're not going to do it, and be bold there where it's been that thoroughfare, for example, has been tremendously underutilized and we can get affordability there. I, you know, that's where I take uh, exception to uh, the density argument because <clears throat> what, what can happen in the future 10 years from now under another administration is that we don't get the affordability and we still get uh, uh, a height. So I've got, I've got an opportunity to set a precedent for on commercial thoroughfares, on underutilized, on um, low density commercial thoroughfares, getting affordable housing, um, I'm gonna do that all day, every day. So generally it would be out of context if this was uh, bedside proper, meaning if it's on Fulton Street, meaning if it's on you know, Malcolm X Boulevard, places where there's low density, here, here we have an opportunity on a commercial thoroughfare that has characteristically been low density commercial, get affordability, um, and the studies have been done to protect the ancillary communities and uh, blocks from shading and from, um, you know, and, and from any disproportionate negative impact. Um, uh, so that, that's why I stand. So at first, that, at first blush, yes, our communities don't want to be oversaturated and have our density violated. But on commercial thoroughfares, where that can happen and we can be responsible for that and lead the charge for affordability, uh, that's why I stand in 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 in, um, in in support of the project. So I understand you, uh, Councilmember Ayala. We serve similar districts. I get it. Yeah, yeah. No, Doctor, I mean... may, I, may I say a couple of words about this? Yes. yes. Um, you know, it's interesting if you look at the um, rendering, you will see that a lot of that density is actually been give, being given back to the community, like it's not being put a fully utilized. Uh, we are not creating a block, a building that's, you know, just one cube, but you can see the amount of effort that went into um, accommodating and responding to the concerns about height. As a, an affordable um, housing advocate, I have been respectfully arguing that we should not be afraid of density that for people of color and people of low and moderate income means, density is a means for us to have a place in this city. Wherever, whether it's Brooklyn or elsewhere, the density is low, people of color are displaced. So I think this is a very innovative way to make sure that if our city grows, that people of color are included. Throughout the city, density is not an issue. And as we look to the future, 
um, density is a way to make housing available to people of a range I'm of inspired. incomes. So I would request that you look at it that from that perspective as well. Un un understood. Um, is there any any? And I'm I'm sorry. I, is there any possibility? Is I mean, are we stuck on the 126 uh, as a as a as a number of uh, affordable units for this project? Because that's that's 30 percent of the project, and it's I mean. Uh, I, I would argue, right, that there is a significant need for affordable housing in that community. And if, um, you know, 70% of it is market, then is there room for that? Well, in, in addition, council member, uh, uh, in, in terms of the mechanisms available in the zoning, 30% is quite, uh, is probably the maximum amount in there for this kind of a development. But in addition, there's 25% of retail being set aside for affordable retail. And uh, there's about uh, 9,000 square feet of community services spaces in the commercial second floor being set aside for neighborhood services, which could be you know, uh, senior centers or childcare or other services that could be provided on the second floor. So, so it's not just the housing, but it's other things. And in addition to that, as Tucker mentioned, the building itself is striving to be a low burden on the infrastructure by being sustainable, by performing better from an energy perspective. So it's a lower burden on the city's already strained infrastructure. And at the same time, it's trying to create infrastructure for the community and the neighborhood by having uh, rechargeable battery stations that can give back in times of need when the infrastructure is hard pressed. Thank you. Uh, I, I just also want to add to that, um, uh, Councilmember Ayala. You know me to be someone who always tries to uh, get a double benefit out of a project. Uh, the the commercial affordability, the displacement of our small businesses uh, in our communities has led to is a trend that people don't talk about often. They talk about the trend of displacement for residential residents, but very rarely mention the displacement of commercial tenants. So for me, being able to create residential affordability simultaneously, hand in hand with commercial affordability has been what I've attempted to do on every project in my district. If you ask around, if you ask anybody, my goal has been, and I've sat with developers over and over again, and they generally uh, lead with uh, the, the, the commercial affordability because for me as the former chair of small business, that is an added, added benefit and will help bolster our community over the long term. Uh, we know that our small businesses have the tendency to hire immediately from their community um, so that's a, that's a means of job creation. So there were a lot of considerations on this project. Um, and I just didn't want to like, you know, kind of hog the stage on what we thought about in those projects. But now that you mentioned the commercial affordability, that was a huge benefit to this project. And moving forward, I think it's a replicable model for your community and marginalized communities throughout the city where we don't just solely focus on residential affordability, but we actually build um, this network or this ecosystem that has residential affordability and commercial affordability. I know projects and districts across this city that focus wholeheartedly on residential affordability and uh, that residential affordability was paid for by overpriced commercial rentals and uh, uh, provide zero services for the residents that live in the very buildings. I know for a fact that there are buildings in the city of New York that are affordable buildings that have a big box store at the bottom that the people who reside in the building can't even patronize. So the thoughtful process of creating an ecosystem around residential affordability in conjunction with commercial affordability is a more sustainable model for communities going forward. And it was that thought process and then some that led to me being supportive of this particular project and projects like it. Like again, I think are replicable, replicable throughout the city, especially in marginalized communities. If we do not urban plan in that way, we will have out of context buildings where you have deep affordability in the building and so residents, residents unable to access the commercial. Council uh, 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 yeah, so member, it, I'm it's, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. Uh, Thank you uh, for that. We're, we're trying to keep it to five minutes because we do have a long uh, day today of hearings. So, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, you, no, 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 uh, we totally understand. Um, I just need to uh, uh, keep the, the, the hearing moving. So um, thank you for that. 
let me just uh, quickly recognize that we've been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Rivera and uh, Council Member uh, Barry G. Uh, if we could, uh, uh, there he is, the, the number one Met fan uh, at City Hall. Um, if, if we could, uh, Council, is there any other uh, Council members that uh, have any questions for this panel? Uh, no, Chair. See no other members with questions for this panel. Okay. Council Member Ayala, did you want to come back for a, a, a second round of questions or are you okay? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, there being no further questions uh, for this panel, the panel is excused. And uh, uh, Council, do we have uh, any members of the public who wish to testify on uh, 1040 Atlantic Avenue for zoning application? Yes, Chair, there are uh, approximately five public witnesses who have signed up to speak. For members of the public here to testify, please note again uh, that you will be called in a group, uh, uh, you will be called in a panel. Um, if you are a member of the public signed up to testify on the 1045 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the Chair says that you may begin. Please also note that once uh, everyone in your panel has completed their testimony, you will be removed uh, from the meeting as a group, uh, and then you will be able to view the live stream broadcast of this meeting on the council website. And we will now hear from the first panel, which will include Frank Lang, Raymond Rivera, Rohan De Freitas, Renzo Ramirez, and Shabazz Stewart. First speaker on the panel will be Frank Lang. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you all. My name is Frank. My name is Frank Lang, and I'm the director of housing for St. Nick's Alliance. St. Nick's Alliance is a 46 year old not for profit based in Brooklyn. And we are delighted to be a part of this project uh, as the administering agent. Our responsibility working with the development team and, and bed -Stuy restoration is to ensure that the marketing and lease up of the units, both the initial marketing and lease up and the ongoing compliance of the building follows fair housing, re uh, reaches out to a wide variety of residents deep in the community and beyond and uh, adheres to the HPD and HDC guidelines in terms of making sure the process is done. Uh, we are an extremely experienced organization, and uh, we're delighted to be a part of the project. And um, just testifying to assure the panel that the process is being done in a way that's going to, you know, ensure that all residents of the community have a fair and open ability to to live in these buildings. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be Raymond Rivera, who will be followed by Rohan De Freitas. Time starts now. We're going to come back to Raymond Rivera and the next speaker will be Rohan De Freitas. Rohan, who will be Time. followed by Renzo Ramirez. Time starts now. Rohan. Uh, we will come back to Rohan. Uh, we're going to come back to Rohan. Okay, as, here I go. As well here as go. I oh. just, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's having technical difficulties. Good morning, everyone. And, um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to uh, speak on behalf of supporting this project. First and foremost, let me say I represent a major consulting company that's involved with this project, Crescent Consulting, and we'll be involved in helping to assist in the diversity component of this project. And as 
Colvin mentioned earlier, we will be working very closely with the bed sty restoration to ensure that the minority and women-owned businesses and local businesses from Brooklyn are included in a, in a development like this. But more importantly, I think it's, it's good for the council to understand that with developers like Totem partnering with bed sty restoration, projects like this are put forth to accomplish all of the great things that you've heard the project is set scheduled to do. And then more importantly, we will be working to ensure that local residents are given every opportunity and local businesses are also given every opportunity to participate in projects like this. For the 30 odd years I've worked in this business uh, over these years, it's projects like this that excites me in terms of being involved and ensuring that local communities uh, can see economic opportunities when projects like this are developed. I, I urge you to support this project uh, so that you know the community can flourish tremendously on initiatives like this. Thank you and have a good day, everyone. Thank you and thank you for your testimony today. The next speaker will be Renzo Ramirez, who will be followed by Shabazz Stewart. Hello, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Renzo. All right, great. I'm Stas. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Renzo Ramirez and I am a member of 32BJ SEIU. I am here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project at 1045 Atlantic Avenue. 32BJ is the largest property service union in the country, representing 85,000 property service workers in New York City, including many who live and work in the bed neighborhood. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I'm happy to report that the developer, Totem, has made a credible commitment to creating prevailing wage building service jobs and 126 affordable housing units at this site. We estimate that this development will lead to creating as many as 14 new building service jobs. On behalf of 32BJ SEIU, I respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Renzo. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, Council, do we have any other speakers? The next speaker will be Shabazz Stewart, who will be followed by Raymond Rivera. Five starts now. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Shabazz Stewart. I'd like to speak enthusiastically in support of this project, um, really from two perspectives. Foremost, um, as a resident of Crown Heights and bed for most of my life, um, we desperately need affordable housing. And I think this project will deliver that in a portion of the neighborhood that's desperately underserved by affordable housing availability. But secondly, also as the founder and CEO of UNI, um, that's going to be at this project, the, the city's first secure um, bike parking um, uh, uh, network on scale, um, I think this is gonna be a great location that's gonna provide um, a really valuable intermodal transportation opportunity um, to the residents of Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights and beyond. I think it's great that it's in proximity to um, a busy subway station. And um, I look forward to um, playing a role in partnership with Totem um, in bringing this uh, transit and climate friendly um, utility to the area. Thank you so much. Thank you. Raymond Rivera will be the next speaker. Time starts now. Should we try them again? Raymond Rivera will be the next speaker. I, I can see uh, Raymond Rivera and I can see, it appears that he is microphone, his microphone is enabled. Okay. Uh, appear to be having a technical issue with Raymond Rivera. And that was the last uh, speaker on this panel. Okay, um, are there any council members that have any questions for, uh, for this panel? 
Uh, no chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, um, there being no uh, further questions for this panel, uh, this panel is uh, now uh, dismissed. Now, council, can you call up the next panel, please? If there are any additional members of the public who wish to testify on the 1045 Atlantic Avenue proposal, uh, please press the raise hand button now. Uh, and Chair Moya, the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any newly registered members of the public. Chair Moya, there are no additional members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items uh, for the 1045 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal under ULERPS number uh, C210276 ZMK and N210277 ZRK. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on pre-considered LUs for the proposed uh, Special Navy Yard District under ULERPS number C210462 ZMK and N210463 AZRK, uh, seeking a zoning map and zoning text amendment relating to property in Council Member 11's district in Brooklyn. Once again, if you wish to testify on this item, please visit the Council's website to register. That link is at www.council dot nyc dot gov forward slash land use. Uh, you may also submit written testimony by emailing it to land use testimony at council dot nyc dot gov. Um, and seeing that we don't have um, council member 11 here, uh, council, can you please call the first panel um, for this item? Mr. Chair, I, I it appears that council member 11 is. Oh, okay. Here. I'm not aware if he. Do we have uh, council member Lee? Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a, a council member 11 in the list, uh, but um, perhaps he's not quite okay. uh, ready or available. Okay, let's uh, proceed with uh, the applicant. The applicant panel for this item will include David Ehrenberg. Uh, of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, as well as uh, Shani Leibowitz and Melanie Myers, Land Use Council for the applicant. Okay. Um, Council, can you please um, uh, administer the affirmation? Panelists, please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. David Ehrenberg. Do you oh, affirm yes. to tell, sorry. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Shani Leibowitz. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, before we begin, um, that as a reminder for anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation, uh, please send an email request to the land use uh, to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, for the record, panelists, as you begin, uh, I'll ask that you please uh, restate your name and organization. Um, and now your team may begin. Thank you. 
Thank you and good morning. Uh, we will be presenting um, a PowerPoint, which I think um, you have. So if you could pull that up, it'd be great. Um, again, my name is David Ehrenberg. I'm president um, and CEO of the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. And um, after a few slides, I'll be handing it over to Melanie Myers, our um, outside counsel, who will be going over some of the more technical details of uh, the special district application. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So very quickly as a um, way of introduction to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, um, we are a former federal naval shipyard um, on the waterfront here in Brooklyn, um, effectively taking up the entire waterfront between Dumbo and Vinegar Hill and Williamsburg. Um, we are, the property is now um, controlled by a mission-driven not-for-profit whose mission is to create uh, high quality middle-class jobs in the manufacturing and industrial sector and connect local residents to those jobs. And over the years, we have developed what we believe to be um, a real leading uh, model for place-based economic development at this scale. Uh, next slide. Uh, very quickly, we're, we're large, we're 300 acres, which is about half the size of Prospect Park, about one third of the size of Central Park. We have over 70 buildings here at the Navy Yard, which we administer and nearly six and a half million square feet of property under roof of buildings. Um, we're home to 450 um, tenant companies who employ over 11,000 people here. We are just about to hit 12,000 um, jobs at the yard. Uh, next slide. We think it's important to very quickly touch on our model and mission um, before getting into the special district, because in many ways, uh, we think of the special district ap application as the physical embodiment of that mission. Very quickly, um, we start with a focus on high quality middle class jobs in the manu manufacturing sector, and particularly the modern manufacturing sector, uh, which pays living wage, um, living wage jobs, um, and yet is a deeply accessible um, uh, industry with over half of the workforce or just uh, just under half of the workforce having nothing more than a high school diploma and the vast, vast majority having less than a uh, college degree. We then use the, the tools that we have as a mission-driven not-for-profit landlord to help um, our tenants create these kinds of jobs. Um, again, we focus on manufacturing companies, which often struggle to find long-term permanent um, homes in the Navy um, in the city. Um, and we provide to them both the rents that they can afford as well as the long-term stability so that they can continue to invest in their companies and, um, and continue to grow and hire more and more Brooklynites and uh, local residents and New Yorkers more generally. And then um, the last piece of uh, the mission for us is workforce development. And we've developed quite a range of workforce development tools here at the yard. Um, from direct placement of adults looking for jobs um, to internship programs focused primarily on the CUNY system to um, physically having CUNY uh, schools here at the yard and having opened a new career in technical education here um, at the Navy Yard, which has become a model uh, for such schools here in the city and, um, and elsewhere. And when you bring all three of those things together, what we're really trying to do as a mission-driven landlord um, with a large physical holding is to create a truly equitable central business district. And then importantly, the partnerships that we have, we're deeply embedded in the local community. Um, uh, we've been here for uh, nearly uh, for 200 years, uh, for over 200 years. Uh, and have developed long-term relationships. And so this special district, this master plan, uh, we went through a, a, a long process of uh, working with local community stakeholders, community board, local NYCHA residents, um, but, in many, but in many ways, and most importantly, our work with them way predates um, this, this planning exercise. Uh, next slide. Um, and uh, we've seen extraordinary growth at the Navy Yard. Um, in the last eight years, we've uh, doubled the number of jobs from six to 12,000. And based on the developments that are underway and tenants moving into the Navy Yard, we will hit 20,000 in the near future. We have been expecting to close, be closing in on 20,000 jobs by this point. Um, the pandemic obviously slowed that down, but it is important to note that we are just over our pre-pandemic employment numbers here at the Navy Yard and continuing to grow quickly. So we've provided a real stability in the employment sector, um, in, in the commercial sector, 
uh, here in our in our area of Brooklyn. Next slide. We are here today, though, because much of that growth, which will have um, over you know more than tripled the number of jobs at the yard, is based on adaptively reusing historic buildings that the Navy left to us. In many cases, well over a hundred year old buildings. Um, while we have significant investments to continue to make in our existing buildings, um, all all major buildings here are fully utilized. And so we don't have vacant buildings or underutilized buildings, which we can go in um, adaptively reuse and invest in and create hundreds or thousands of jobs at a time. Um, and so we are now space constrained. Uh, however, we see very strong ongoing demand for the kinds of space that we, um, that we provide you know, over 200,000 square feet of new leases for manufacturing companies signed during the pandemic, which is a real testament to the need for this kind of space. And that creates an imbalance where we don't have the space anymore in our existing buildings to meet that demand. And it means that we may pass up, unless we figure something out, uh, we may pass up job growth for both ourselves and our local community in the coming years. Uh, next slide. And so we, um, a few years ago, recognized that this was um, going to be happening and um, began a master planning process that led to the special district application to really envision a new ground up uh, development scheme here at the yard. So moving away from adaptively reusing vacant buildings that the Navy left us to building new construction buildings tailor made for manufacturing companies in urban America. Uh, at the same time, as you'll see, all of the development sites um, that we're focused on are at the edge of the yard and it allows us to integrate the Navy Yard into the surrounding community in ways that frankly have not been the case for generations and frankly hundreds of years. Um, and we also in this uh, special district grappled with the fact that there are uses that are not typically allowed in manufacturing zones, which have become essential for our, um, for our mission. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the future, but we are looking to add some uses that will help us connect local residents to not just the jobs here at the yard, but also the skills necessary um, for those jobs in the future. Uh, next slide. And um, as I said, the vision here is to create uh, large scale ground up developments of, for modern manufacturers um, in types of buildings that have never been built before in urban America. And this will fuel the next phase of significant job growth here at the yard, bringing us to a total when these buildings are built of over 30,000 jobs here at the yard. So an additional 10,000 compared to where we will be in the coming years. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the major development sites that are available to the yard um, are at the edge of the yard. Um, and that has gone into a lot of our thinking about the types of development that are appropriate um, on these sites. Next slide. Um, to restate what the uh, what the special district seeks to do is to optimize these buildings for modern manufacturers to preserve the war war working waterfront while allowing us to integrate um, with the local community more and allowing us to continue our mission of connecting local residents to the skills and jobs at the at the yard. What we are not seeking to do is add any density at any height or any uses that are inconsistent with the current understanding of our mission. Next slide. Um, and so uh, in the three main buckets are um, of what this special district seeks to do is to optimize the buildings for modern manufacturers. Uh, the industrial zoning was written in the 1960s or adopted in the 1960s and a lot has changed in uh, manufacturing uses since then. Um, particularly parking and loading requirements um, under existing zoning are significantly higher than are necessary. And so the special district rationalizes parking and loading requirements based on our experience of exactly what manufacturers truly need. Um, it would allow for some additional signage consistent with what's already at the yard, um, but to help with wayfinding and a sense of arrival when you get to this historic part of the of the waterfront, but which frankly, many New Yorkers don't fully understand, and allows for these extra large manufacturing floors at the base of the buildings, so that as manufacturers truly get to scale and need a fully functioning factory floor in an urban setting, we're able to provide that in these buildings 
that requires some bulk adjustments um, in the special district. Next slide. Um, and uh, the next thing is the um, integration with the local community. And so what we are proposing is at, on those development sites that are again at the edge of the yard, we open the, the perimeter of the yard um, to the public and create truly engaging public spaces at the yard's, yard's edge. Um, the rest of the yard would remain inaccessible um, to uh, the general public as it has been for many years. And we think that's important in order to preserve the working waterfront nature of what happens at the yard with our very heavy manufacturing uh, and uh, ship repair and maintenance, et cetera, that happens here. But we believe there's an opportunity for this integration. We would then line those public spaces uh, with programming that showcases the yard um, and is um, uh, and is consistent with what's happening at the yard. So we're imagining showrooms for products being manufactured at the yard or museums uh, um, focus on engineering and robotics, things like that. Um, there are then a set of shared amenities and resources, which frankly we could have now at the Navy Yard, but would not be we would not um, we would not be allowed to make those accessible to the community. Um, things like um, uh, conference centers or child care centers, um, which we want to which we are allowed as accessory, but we want to make um, as a right in the special district so we can open those facilities up to the general public as well. And when we do all of this, it's extraordinarily important for us to ensure, again, that we can maintain the efficient operations of our uh, industrial manufacturing companies here at the yard. And a lot of thought has been given in the special district to that. Um, and lastly, and there is, I apologize, there is not a slide for this, but there's a there are some additional uses. I've mentioned childcare, um, which we see as absolutely essential to the vision of an equitable central business district um, that is not allowed under current zoning and manufacturing zones unless it's accessory and exclusively available to um, those uh, working at the Navy Yard. Um, and educational uses, which have become more and more and more a part of our mission um, as the skills required for all jobs in our um, economy um, increase. That's also true in manufacturing. And so our partnerships with local um, uh, high schools and particularly the CUNY system, we see as an absolutely essential piece of our, of our mission. Um, with that, I will hand it over to Melanie Myers, who will um, go through a few more of the technical details. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, thank you, Chair Moya and council members. My name is Melanie Myers, Freed Frank uh, Land Use Council for the applicant. And next slide, please. Thanks. So the actions before you today are a zoning map and a zoning text amendment that together will create the special Brooklyn Navy Yard District and will establish spe special rules to facilitate the master plan buildings that David spoke about. The zoning map amendment, which you can see on your left, will regularize the zoning near the perimeter of the yard with a uniform M21 district at the master plan sites and will map the special district over the, over the yard. Um, as part of the text amendment, and you can, as you can see on the right um, of the slide, there will be three perimeter subdistricts, and these are tied to the master plan sites, and there'll be one core subdistrict relating to the rest of the yard. Um, Next slide, please. Overall, there are, there are five main aspects of the special district text, um, and they're focused in large part on the perimeter subdistricts where um, development is expected. These are use, signage, building form, parking and loading, and open space and urban design. Next slide, please. So, First, the text will allow, as David mentioned, a, a limited amount of additional uses, and these will be there to support the core manufacturing functions of the yard. These will include academic, daycare, other community facilities such as museums, and it will al allow for additional retail opportunities so that yard tenants can present their products to the public. Next slide, please. Second, the the text will allow for a limited amount of placemaking signage at defined locations at the perimeter of the yard. And these will be similar to the signage that exists today on building 77. And this will allow for the yard to have an identity along each of its boundaries and to better integrate and announce itself to the public. 
Um, next slide, please. Third, as David mentioned, there'll be limited modifications to height and setback and other bulb controls at the barge basin and the flushing subdistrict. So on the east and the west of the site. And what this will allow is a tripartite form of building that um, allows for more office-like space for early stage prototype design at the upper levels, um, initial production and um, more standard manufacturing activities at the mid-level floors and at the lower portions of the buildings, so extra large scale manufacturing space to provide for the maximum amount of flexibility and needs of the manufacturing community. In addition, the uh, zoning will require that development be set back from the shoreline by at least 30 feet. And this is thinking ahead and allowing for the opportunity to introduce uh, resiliency measures at the yard into the future without there being a conflict with the development that's being proposed. Next slide, please. Fourth, um, the parking and loading measure, uh, measures that exist in zoning today will be rationalized and improved by in three ways. There'll be limiting curb cuts from the surrounding streets for the new development to ensure that uh, traffic is coming into the yard in, in as efficient and least uh, interfering way as possible with the surrounding streets. There will be uh, a, a parking controls will be replaced by a transportation management plan that will incentivize alternate forms of transportation to the yard and provide for ongoing monitoring of traffic conditions at the yard and in the area. And finally, the loading will be, uh, rather than the excessive loading that exists today under zoning, it will be allowed to be tailored to the yard's actual needs. Next slide, please. Finally, as part of the special district, there will be an, a requirement that publicly accessible open space be built as part of each of the master plan developments. When complete, there will be almost 190,000 square feet or approximately 4.3 acres of open space introduced to the yard. This will include plazas and the flushing and Navy Street frontages and a waterfront esplanade in the barge basin area. As David said, there will be requirements for these spaces to be surrounded by active uses, by transparency, by building articulation at the ground level, so that to provide for additional vitality at these locations and to make sure that what's being created is an inviting and attractive amenity. Next slide, please. And that, uh, that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. We'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Um, just uh, two quick questions. Uh, the, the Navy Yards Master Plan uh, calls for the construction of new vertical mixed use buildings with predominantly industrial space, but nothing actually is uh, in the proposed special district, uh, which would require the development to be predominantly industrial. They could, for example, uh, be new buildings uh, with predominantly office space there. Uh, what assurances does the public have that the Navy Yard will continue to prioritize industrial jobs and development? Um, as a mission-driven not-for-profit, uh, in manufacturing and industrial jobs have been at the core of what we've done for 60 years. Um, and there is that, that will not be changing. Um, proposals to limit our ability to and and tailor the the, the zoning uh, more narrowly to only allow uh, manufacturing doesn't work because um, of our unique financing structure that has allowed us to borrow very large amounts of money um, to fuel this current phase of um, of development um, and and all for. Uh, the manufacturing uses that we've developed. And so while we understand the desire um, to ensure that we will continue to focus on manufacturing, that's what we've done for 60 years and that will, that's what we will continue to do. And we need the flexibility in order to continue our, continue our successful execution of our mission. Yeah, and if I could say just one thing, in addition, for the additional uses that we're asking for permission for as part of the special district, all of those would be limited to a quite 
small amount. Um, the Navy Yard as a whole allows for about 22 million square feet of, to, of development, both today and under the zoning. In terms of those additional uses, it's less than a million square feet. So we are trying to make sure that those additional requests that we're asking for are very much a limited portion of the development as a whole. Uh, thank you. And historically, the, the Navy Yard um, has accommodated its expansion uh, through the mayor of uh, the mayoral zoning overrides. Uh, why was it now deemed necessary to create a new zoning special district? Um, the next phase of growth, like I said, is um, requires these new buildings. And so we thought as we were planning for that next phase of growth, it made sense to rationalize um, the, the rules of the road, uh, the zoning uh, um, at the yard, so that we could go ahead and execute on these uh, buildings without the need for um, repetitive mayoral overrides. Um, and so it is our um, expectation that if passed, this would al allow for the next phase of development and overrides would no longer um, play as large of a role at the yard or may not be necessary at all. Okay, uh, thank you. That's it for me. Uh, I'm going to uh, check with our council to see if uh, we have council member uh, Levin on for any questions. Uh, Mr. Chair, please stand by uh, while we just make sure. Uh, in in the meantime, if they're trying to locate Council Member Levin, do we have any other Council members? Uh, who have any questions for this panel? No, uh, I think we have Council Member Reynoso. Who Council Member Reynoso has a hand up. Yeah, I just uh, more of a comment, Chair. Uh, just really uh, excited to, to see how this process uh, develops. Uh, the Brooklyn Navy Yard um, is a model um, related to like manufacturing development and economic development in the country. And uh, I think this project can definitely um, <clears throat> be be something that assists in, in continuing that trend. Um, I want to hear what Councilmember Levin has to say. You know, I'm always uh, concerned about office space um, or any commercial space in manufacturing districts. But in this case, um, you know, the rationale to allow for these spaces to to highlight the work that's happening from the manufacturers is, is really something that I think is could be special. I'm also a big fan of any public access that is available in the Navy Yard. Um, you know, I, I have to go through Flushing when I'm riding my bike. One day, hopefully I can run through the Navy Yard safely. Um, so I'll be excited about that one. Um, but again, just uh, wanna thank uh, the team at the Navy Yard. These folks really get it, very, very thoughtful, um, communicate very well, uh, again, concerned a bit about the commercial space or so mostly the office space, but if it's again to complement the work that's happening in the manufacturing, um, it'll, it'll be a home run. So again, thank you so much chair for allowing me to um, say a few, a few words. So I do have one question for the applicant. It's just a waterfront access um, for, for actual work, um, uh, maritime use. Uh, really wanna see that grow in the Navy Yard. Is this, some, this something that it can assist or impede that growth, or is it just too shallow? Just want to understand um, what the waterfront access looks like and its ability to to to, to assist uh, manufacturing businesses. And that'll be my last question. So thank you again, Chair. Um, you. Yeah, and um, thank you for the question. So the the master plan was um, was pretty carefully tailored to make sure that the working waterfront here was preserved. Um, the areas of the waterfront where public access will be granted under this special district um, are frankly too shallow um, it, to allow for real commercial uh, ship repair or maintenance. Um, we, there may be opportunities to have very small uh, boat production there, which we will explore as we build these buildings. Um, but the majority of our maritime uses here are um, in the core 
uh, district of the yard, uh, which will not be publicly accessible and will remain as a active ship repair maintenance upgrading uh, facility. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, okay, one last call for Council Member Levin, and then um, we're gonna we're gonna move on. And Chair, I see no other members with uh, hands raised with questions. Okay, uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel uh, is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the special uh, Navy Yard District proposal? Yes. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in panels of up to four or five names at a time. If you are a member of the public signed up to testify on the special Navy Yard District application, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. Uh, please note again, once all panelists in your group have completed their testimony, you will be removed as a group uh, and the next group of speakers will be introduced. Once removed, participants may continue to view the live stream broadcast uh, at the council's website. And we will now hear from the first panel, which will include Brady Mixell, Adam Friedman, Renzo Ramirez, and Jonathan Bowles. The first speaker on the panel will be Brady Mixell, who will be followed by Adam Friedman. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Brady Mixell, and I'm the Economic Development Specialist for the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. I'm testifying here today in support of the proposed Brooklyn Navy Yard Special District. For over 40 years, SBIDC has provided services to small industrial and manufacturing businesses and workforce development programming to local residents in Southwest Brooklyn. We understand well the challenges to bridging the jobs uh, offered along the industrial waterfront with the local workforce. The Navy Yard has been a leader in making these connections happen. The COVID pandemic confirmed what industrial advocates have long argued, that industrial and manufacturing jobs, industrial businesses, and industrial land are a vital resource for our city. As the city begins to recover from the pandemic, industrial jobs can be a key part of making our city more equitable because these jobs are accessible to folks with barriers to employment and they offer living wages and a pathway to the middle class. But these jobs need to be accessible to the general public and training for these jobs needs to be part of students' education. The Brooklyn Navy Yard's plan to create an equitable central business district is important to accomplishing this goal. Their plan to modernize manufacturing space, bring and grow industrial businesses on the campus, and expand public space that interfaces with the local community will help integrate industrial business opportunities and jobs into the fabric of communities all over Brooklyn. SBIDC strongly supports the Navy Yard's plan to invest in the future of New York City's industrial sector and the residents in the surrounding community. Thank you for your time. Adam Friedman will be the next speaker, followed by Renzo Ramirez. Good morning. I'm Adam Friedman, director of the Pratt Center, which runs the Made in NYC program, serving more than 1,500 local manufacturers. And I also chair the National Urban Manufacturing Alliance, which includes practitioners in more than 200 cities. As a longtime member of the Navy Arts Board of Directors, I've seen the evolution of their model for mission-driven development. I often use the Navy Yard to illustrate best practice in everything from the curation of tenants to build out a strong ecosystem to the employment center, which has been so successful in recruiting and placing NYCHA residents to their very deliberate and comprehensive redesign of their programs and operations to advance racial and economic justice. Count Chairman Moya and Council Member Reynoso raised a critical issue regarding non-industrial uses, such as hotels, being located in M zones, which could ignite displacement and which I oppose, but that is not a risk here. Converting buildings to maximize profit is not a risk because it is not the mission of the Navy Yard. Creating industrial jobs is its mission. And there are other safeguards, including the Yard's tenanting guidelines and that the board must approve each lease. As the Navy Yard is ultimately controlled by the mayor, uh, it's just not, and I don't think it's an issue. Allowing showrooms and academic space will strengthen the manufacturing ecosystem. 
I appreciate that land use planning typically considers the use and not the user. So it might appear that a for-profit developer is the same as a not-for-profit from a land use perspective. That assumption is no longer valid. A nonprofit developer typically makes different decisions about many things from waste handling and energy efficiency to parking and incentives for mass transit and local employment, which all encourage walk to work communities, all of which lead to a different land use impact. Allowing showrooms and academic space will add to the resources and vibrancy of the yard and support the manufacturing ecosystem. In this case, I have no hesitation supporting the proposed amendment because there are controls beyond zoning, including the contracts and the mission. Let me just say these controls are decisive. And as David Ehrenberg said at the beginning, the zoning should embody the mission. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Renzo Ramirez will be the next speaker, followed by Jonathan Bowles. Time starts now. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. All right, cool, cool, cool. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Renzo Ramirez and I am a member of 32BJ SCIU. As you know, 32BJ is the largest property service union representing 85,000 property service workers across the city. We represent workers who maintain, clean, and provide security services in buildings like the one being discussed at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. 32 BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I am happy to report that the developers affiliated with this project, Building 77QALICB Incorporated and NYC Small Business Services, have a track record as responsible employers. We are happy to report that the developers associated with this project have made a credible commitment to, to creating prevailing wage jobs at this site. We estimate that this rezoning, which will allow the construction over 4 million square feet in support of the creation of manufacturing jobs over the next 10 years. We estimate that the proposed project would increase the commercial office by more than 1 million square feet which could result in 33 additional cleaning jobs, 15 additional security jobs. On behalf of 32BJ SEIU, I respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Renzo. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, Jonathan, Bowles. Jonathan Bowles will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Bowles, and I'm the executive director of the Center for an Urban Future, a think tank focused on creating a more equitable economy in New York. I'm testifying in favor of the proposed Brooklyn Navy Special District. One of the most concerning economic trends in New York in recent years has been the extremely slow growth in middle class jobs that are accessible to New Yorkers without a college degree. In the 10 years prior to the pandemic, one third of all the new private sector jobs in the city were created in just three industries, home health care, restaurants, and retail, each of which is among the lowest paying sectors of the economy. Tens of thousands of additional low wage jobs were created in nail salons, the social assistance sector, and in gig economy positions. At the same time, industries that used to provide large numbers of middle class jobs in New York have had little or no growth in the past decade, including hospitals, finance, legal services, and traditional manufacturing. Where good accessible jobs have been growing in New York, it's largely been in the kind of things being created at the Navy Yard. Jobs related to modern manufacturing and in innovative companies, at the intersection of production, technology, and design. That's why I am so supportive of these proposed zoning changes, which I believe are crucial to enabling the Navy Yard to grow even more good jobs for the future. In addition to cultivating these jobs, the Navy Yard Development Corporation has been among the best in the city in taking steps to expand access to good jobs through place-based job training and educational programs. The partnerships they created with their next-gen career and technical education high school and CUNY's graduate film program at the Yard are models that should be emulated in other parts of the city. I would like to see more of those kind of partnerships. That's another reason I support these proposed zoning changes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions uh, for the panel? Uh, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, this panel is now excused. Uh, Council, if you can, please call the next panel. 
Next panel will include James Williams, Jan Michael Maludo, Kayon Price, Kaisha Kelly, and Sinead Wadsworth. First speaker will be James Williams, followed by Jan Michael Maludo. Time starts now. Good morning. Thank you, esteemed city council members. My name is James Williams, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Nanotronics here in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, testifying in support of the Special Brooklyn Navy Yard District. The world is in the throes of the greatest material supply and health crisis in over a century. The last time our country had to navigate crises like these, New York City had a larger manu manufacturing workforce than any other city in the country. We're living in an urgent time to build. Without the infrastructure to train our neighbors and ourselves how to build for both today and tomorrow, we risk running up against long-term economic struggle. Nanotronics manufactures inspection and process equipment for a wide range of other manufacturers, from biotech to aerospace, from toothpaste to tires. Our largest customers are in the semiconductor and genomics industries, two industries that have become part of our daily conversations. Without the ongoing support of the Brooklyn Navy Yard and its ability to bring us dedicated and resourceful talent, we would not have been able to grow at the speed the world needs. More vocational training for the next industrial revolution is needed now and in perpetuity. These crises are not temporary long-term effects of COVID. COVID stressed the weakest points of the supply chain. This crisis will persist unless we come together collaboratively, collaboratively to foster invention. The next industrial revolution, much like the first American industrial revolution, is being built on the New York waterfront. This city, our city, is uniquely positioned to train and grow the workforce that will bring us all closer to abundance and a better future. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker. Jan, Jan Michael Maludo will be the next speaker, followed by Kayon Price. Hi, good morning, council members, Chair Moya, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Jan Michael Maludo, and I'm testifying in support of the Navy Yard Special District. I represent Ferra Designs, we're architectural metal workers and glaziers. Ferra has been a Navy Yard tenant for over 20 years and employs over 40 talented metal workers, machinists, finishers, and designers. And I'm proud to share that our employees represent all five boroughs of the city. And you can see their work on projects, including Trinity Church Wall Street, Pier 57, and the Morgan Library. I can tell you with confidence that it would be difficult to support our type of work, all done locally by New Yorkers, without the continued support of the Navy Yard. We utilize every zone of our 20,000 square foot space and often mount full-scale mock-ups and pre-installation assemblies that can exceed 20 feet. The XL floor plans in the special district truly represent how a manufacturer like us actively utilizes industrial space. Of perhaps greater significance, the Navy Yard's mission-based business support and workforce development services have been proven to be vital partners in our work. The Al Wiltshire Employment Center has connected us with installers, fabricators, and 18 year project managers. We've trained our machinists at the Steam Center and enrolled fabricators and finishers in new management training. On a personal note, as I've done in the previous testimony, I can also thank the Yard for my own career development. Through City Tech's manufacturing department, I joined the first cohort of SBS's Tech Triangle Internship Program. Interned at FARA in over eight years in multiple projects and now a director here at FARA. Thanks to the Yard, I am proud to say that we've hosted and hired many other City Tech interns since. Go City Tech. As a lifelong New Yorker and a manufacturing tenant, I am proud to work on a campus that constantly affirming its manufacturing centered mission. The yard actively engages its manufacturing tenants and details of the master plan show this. Ferris celebrates the recent arrival of new industrial and construction tenants, including nanotronics, as well as quality transport and access improvements. I've been a ferry commuter since their first day of service and actively uh, use the Dumbo and Atlantic terminal shuttles. I support the vision and uh, we look forward to many years there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be Kayon Price, followed by Kaisha Kelly. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Chairman Moya, thank you for hearing my testimony. My name is Kayon Price, and I serve as the proud founding principal of the New York City Department of Education's public high school program, the Brooklyn STEAM Center. The STEAM Center is a socioeconomically diverse school that is located on the third floor of one of the Navy Yard's largest properties, Building 77, and brings together high school juniors and seniors for the, for the purpose of career and technical education programming across five distinct industries. As a proud Brooklynite who grew up in Crown Heights and East Flatbush, attended high school at George West Mass High School, and has worked on the Navy Yard for the past three years, I'm incredibly proud to be a member of this community, 
and a partner to the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation. Like so many New Yorkers whose community has been significantly impacted by COVID-19, which has only accentuated the deep public health and economic inequities of our city, I am internally grateful for the Navy Yard's support in helping us meet the needs of our community since our inception. Over the past 18 months and since our beginning, the Brooklyn Navy Yard Development Corporation has secured grants, grants for our, our school, purchased wireless hotspots, technology, food, and delivery services, services to help meet the needs of our, young, our, our families and our scholars during their time of need. When the DOE was slow to respond, the Navy Yard jumped in and helped us immediately provide for our community and significantly lower the learning loss that many New Yorkers experienced during the COVID-19 pandemic. During, during the beginning of the shutdown, the Navy Yard placed a call out to its employer community and partnered with our school to utilize the manufacturing equipment in our space to produce masks, ventilator parts, when there is a nationwide shortage. shortage. To recover and grow and thrive as a city, we need to invest in proven models for economic growth for everyone. The Brooklyn Navy Yard has proven that and can, that it can successfully bridge the gap between workforce development, education, private industry, and the public sector to create viable middle-income jobs. That I'm expired. I'm excited to see a special district make it. I'm excited to see this special district and uh, the, the access that it will provide to our community. And I support the special the, the, the proposal that's been submitted to the, the city council. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker. Aisha Kelly will be the next speaker, followed by Sinead Wadsworth. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Kaisha Kelly. I, oh, excuse me. Hi, um, Congressman Moya and Special Committee. Thanks for having me today. I'm here speaking on the behalf of, in support of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and we have been, my, my name is Kaisha Kelly and I'm the co-owner of Hip Hop Closet. I was born and raised in Fort Greene and went to elementary school and junior high school directly next to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. We have been a tenant in the Navy Yard for 23 years and the Navy Yard has been instrumental in helping us with growth. And um, we've utilized the employment center to get employees throughout the years. We've had interns that we were able to hire. And we've also worked with the STEAM Center to have high school interns help us. We manufacture clothing and accessories in our space. And the rezoning of the Navy Yard would be instrumental in helping us grow. We would not be able to grow like we have without the help from the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The Business Services and External Affairs Department at the Navy Yard has provided unparalleled services. And in 2017, we were able to participate in the first Navy Yard business cohort that empowered me to expand my business and ultimately increase our revenue by 175%. Throughout the pandemic, they have never left our side and they've provided many seminars and resources to keep our business alive. Seeing the amazing transformation throughout the 23 years that we've been here has been just tremendous and we look forward to more growth. The proposed rezoning of the Brooklyn Navy Yard would help us to welcome the community, community more effectively, enable us to offer more services and ensure that more young adults enter the workforce with tangible skills. The rezoning would allow all of the businesses in the Brooklyn Navy Yard to hire and create highly employable local individuals. It is for these reasons that I support the special zoning I'm proposal. Expired. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Sinead Wadsworth. The next and last speaker on the panel will be Sinead Wadsworth. Time starts now. Good, af good afternoon, Chair Moya and council members. My name is Sinead Wadsworth, council representative for the New York City District Council of Carpenters. I would like to take the time to express our support for the project. However, I'm a little perturbed that the word jobs is, is, is um, being thrown around after such a uh, horrible pandemic you know a lot of people lost their livelihoods and I didn't hear one mention of careers today I didn't hear one mention of apprenticeships today um, I myself came through an apprenticeship program called non-traditional employment for women 10 years ago and to this day I still have a career that one day I can hopefully and will retire with dignity so with that being said I, would, I wanted to know if there can be any implementation of apprenticeship programs um, 
pre-apprenticeship programs and pathways that people Sinead? Would that be in support of the project? But again, if apprenticeship programs can also be added and give people the opportunity to retire with dig dignity, I think that would really, really, really help people in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sinead. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, and as uh, we move forward, we have uh, still some time to uh, be talking about the issues that you brought up um, uh, today during your testimony. So uh, thank you again for uh, being uh, part of this uh, hearing today. Uh, Council, any more um, panelists? We're, you're, you're muted if we can unmute. Um, Arthur, yeah. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, Sinead Wadsworth was the last speaker on this panel. Uh, I see that Council Member Levin has a hand raised uh, for questions. I just wanted to, well, I, I apologize, I'm uh, uh, chairing another hearing concurrently, so I'm um, step away from that for a moment. Um, uh, we're still discussing um, uh, the Navy Yard, correct? Yeah. Um, uh, it, would it be possible that I can ask um, representatives from the Navy Yard a, a handful of questions? Are they still they're on? Not the on they're not on. Not on anymore. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I just wanted to take the, uh, the opportunity to um, uh, acknowledge the work that they have put into uh, this application, um, uh, the work that they've done really over the last 15 years um, to um, make the Navy Yard a, an example of economic development that um, is focused on uh, job creation, as, um, as Sinead said just now, I, I mean, I, I do think that they are focused on, on career creation um, and career advancement, um, uh, not just uh, not just jobs, but um, businesses and careers. Um, I do uh, want to acknowledge the um, uh, the perspective. Uh, when looking at this application of how we're able to best ensure, or the, you know, the, the, the priority of how we're able to best ensure that um, that the additional floor area that's created um, as a result of this rezoning um, produces light manufacturing um, uh, and other types of manufacturing um, and is not exclusively um, office space that doesn't have a manufacturing component uh, because the Navy Yard is unique in its um, configuration and, um, and the way that it has access to um, loading docks and closed off streets and um, um, uh, aspects, things that, that, that a lot of other industrial areas around the city don't have. Um, that it's important that we uh, take advantage of that um, for the purpose of, 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 of creating um, long-term more manufacturing space. So um, we've been in conversations around this issue um, for a number of months, and so we're hopeful that we'll be able to get to a good um, uh, accommodation there or resolution in terms of how we're able to best ensure that and track that into the future. And um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Council Member Levin, um, for your remarks. Uh, Council, do we have any other uh, panelists? If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the special Navy Yard district proposal, please press the raise hand button now. The uh, chair of the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any members of the public who may have newly registered.
Do we see any um, members of the public? Sorry, Chair, just waiting for final confirmation. Uh, okay, Chair, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on, the, uh, on these items. Okay, uh, there being no more questions uh, for this panel, the witness panel is uh, now excused. Yes, and with that, um, there, I see no other members of the public who uh, wish to testify. Okay. Um, there being no uh, members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU items under uh, C210462 ZMK and N210463 AZRK for the Special Navy Yard District proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. I now open the public hearing on the pre-considered LU item under ULURP number N210406 ZRY for the citywide zoning text amendment to establish a special permit for hotel use proposed by the Department of uh, City Planning. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, council, can you please call uh, the first panel for this item? The applicant panel for this item will include Jennifer Gravel and Alex Plakis, both of the Department of City Planning. Thank you. And if you could uh, please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, just a quick reminder for anyone watching this meeting uh, who requires an accessible version of this presentation, uh, you may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now uh, you may begin your presentation and, and I will just uh, remind you both as you begin speaking, uh, please just state your name and organization uh, for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Moyan. Thank you for having us here today. My name is Jennifer Gravel. I'm the Director of the Housing and Economic Development Division at the Department of City Planning. And I am joined by my colleague, Alex Plakas, who is the Project Manager for the Citywide Hotels Text Amendment. Um, and I'd like to uh, turn it over to Alex to um, run through a brief presentation, and we'll be back to answer any questions you, you may have. Thank you, Jen. And um, if you could bring up the presentation, please. All right. uh, hello, my name is Alex Plakis. Uh, I'm the planner at the Department of City Planning, and this is the presentation on the Citywide Hotel Special Permit. Uh, next slide, please. So the proposed text amendment would create a new special permit for hotel development citywide. It's intended to create a consistent framework for hotel development and ensure that hotels do not negatively affect the surrounding area. Next slide, please. A special permit is a discretionary action which would require any hotel project to be subject to Euler. Uh, a special permit requires environmental review and the application is reviewed by the community board and borough president, the city planning commission and city council. The average time to receive approval ranges between 18 to 36 months. Next slide, please. Over the years, rapid growth of new hotels has occurred throughout the city. In CNMX districts, hotels have introduced conflicts with surrounding uses. Overnight accommodations differ from other as of right uses in proximity because they're similar to both commercial and residential uses, but also have the potential to conflict with both. This unique distinction of hotels may require additional scrutiny to ensure they're developed in ways that won't present conflicts with the neighborhood and local businesses. Hotels have the potential to create land use conflicts in a variety of neighborhood contexts and zoning districts. For example, the hotel on the screen here is located in the Rockaways. And as a hotel with better site planning may have led to a wider sidewalk. 
the current sidewalk leading to the beach is thin and may push pedestrians into the street, causing safety concerns for guests and residents alike. A robust tourism economy is vital to the city's economic health and is expected to recover from the pandemic. Once the industry recovers from the pandemic, hotel development is expected to resume. Next slide, please. So the new special permit will be applicable in higher density commercial districts, mixed use districts, impaired and one R districts where there's not a special permit today. The new special permit will apply to those areas that already have a special permit. And the proposal would apply to the new special Gowanus mixed use district approved by the city planning commission. M1 districts will retain the findings from the M1 hotel special permit since those address unique concerns in light industrial areas. The map here shows the applicability of this proposal. The magenta color shows areas that would require the new citywide hotel special permit. This means that any hotel development would need to apply for this special permit with the Department of City Planning. This process would make all proposed hotels subject to ULERP review, which includes time for the community board's review, adopt and submit a recommendation to the city planning commission. The gray color shows areas on the map where hotels are already subject to this special permit process and require public review. The white areas do not allow hotel development according to ZEP. Next slide, please. So the current findings are that the hotel use shall not impair the future use and development of the surrounding area. And then the CPC approved additional findings are included on the screen here. These two findings are from the existing M1 special permit and are applicable to a wide range of neighborhood contexts and provide additional guidance. These modifications have been in response to community boards and others who have stated that the current finding is vague. Next slide, please. There are modifications to divesting prov provisions. Um, a review of the status of filed and certified applications as of June 30th, uh, June 30th of 2021 indicated that several projects may not have required approvals in time to meet vesting and exclusion criteria and may require additional time to obtain approval and flexibility to modify the proposal. Both the, although the department assumed most filed applications would vest at the day of adoption of the text amendment, many projects have not had sufficient time to process applications. These modifications will not expand the universe of projects that may vest, but give projects who have worked in good faith time to reach the above milestones. Next slide, please. And now we are happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a couple of questions. Um, uh, to go with what uh, the presentation was, what you were saying in the presentation, is there an assumption uh, that a certain percentage of uh, special permit applications would be disapproved and thereby impact um, the hotel industry recovery? Uh, you mean in the assumptions in the environmental review or in the, uh, uh, no, there was an assumption um, of the number of projects that would seek and, and get approved um, in, in, over the course of a, a year, um, but no assumptions about uh, disapproval of applications. Okay, um, and why is the uh, special permit for hotels in M1 districts uh, being preserved, but other existing um, uh, hotel special permits in special districts are being standardized? Sure, uh, I can take that question. Uh, the the M1 hotel special permit was very recently adopted um, and was also intended to, to address the very unique conditions in industrial areas. Um, across the city over time, we have developed a number of uh, special permits, primarily in special districts um, that are similar, but slightly different. Um, so we have what was had become kind of a patchwork framework for, for reviewing hotel development. 
Um, and this proposal is creating a more standardized and consistent way to consider those hotels. Um, but where there are special permits prior to this, they would continue to have a special permit, uh, but would simply be replaced by a consistent framework. Um, if approved, are there uh, certain areas of the city that you uh, feel are inappropriate for um, new hotel special permits? Um, I mean, there are areas of the city where we don't allow hotels and that, that's not changing as a result of this proposal. Um, so the, the, the special permit is, is simply uh, creating a process for additional review in areas where we do believe they are appropriate. So in commercial districts and mixed use districts and manufacturing zones. I mean, I do imagine there may, or may be instances where a specific project, uh, given its surrounding context, um, may not be appropriate, but it would be up to uh, a future sort of commission and, and city council to, to make that determination. Okay, uh, and, and just my last question here. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, for the record, uh, restate uh, the public purpose for excluding shelters from the special permit requirement? Sure. Um, so the special permit is intended to address the concerns related to the siting of commercial hotels. Uh, and would not affect the city's current rules relating to siting shelters. Uh, we understand that there have been concerns expressed about the shelter exemption, but we have maintained it to address really the chronic shortage for temporary housing uh, and to support the city's legal obligation to provide eligible individuals and families with access to shelter. Um, and retaining the exemption for the shelter really provides for sufficient flexibility for the city and for nonprofit providers of emergency shelters to really most efficiently, affordably and appropriately shelter a population with very diverse needs. Um, that's it uh, for me uh, in terms of questions. Uh, council, do we have any council members that have questions for this panel? No, Chair, I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the hotel special permit proposal? Yes, we, we, we do have a, uh, a few witnesses. For members of the public here to testify, please note again that witnesses will be called in panels. If you are a member of the public, sign up to testify on the proposed hotel special permit text amendment. Please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair says that you may begin. We will now hear from the first panel, which will include uh, Janine Nixon and Carlos Encarnacion. Janine Nixon will speak first, followed by Carlos Encarnacion. Thank you. Um, and members of the public, you will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Uh, and the first panelist, uh, you may begin. Clock is ready. Uh, we're going to come back to Janine Nixon and first hear from Carlos Encarnacion. Carlos Encarnacion. Clock is ready. Uh, I'm ready too. Whenever you're ready, you can begin, Carlos. Okay. Um, thank you, panelists. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, address uh, this uh, commission. Um, and a long time resident of Brooklyn. I have seen many changes throughout the years. Some of those changes are positive, some are not that positive, especially for people like me, for uh, people in moderate and low income communities. Um, although we need you know, hotels because we need the influx of money that tourism bring to the city, but we also need uh, the fabric of the city, you know, to be uh, diverse. So that means, you know, including uh, affordable housing in some other settings. So that's why I urge you uh, to support this uh, special permit for hotel, because that will allow for a, a more um, inclusive and diverse city. And also it will impact, you know, the tax base, base of the city. 
Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Uh, next uh, panelist. We'll try one more time to hear from Janine Nixon. Hi, good morning. Good morning, good morning can you Janine. hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Okay, great, great, great. I'm sorry, I did have just a, a little difficulty. It's okay, you can start. Um, okay, thank you. Janine? Yes. You can okay. you maybe begin. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay, sorry, sorry, good remember, morning, Council just, Member. Hold on one second, Janine. Can we get, yeah, we just, we had a, we start your clock. Now you may begin. Good morning, council members. My name is Janine. I do live in downtown Flushing and I have been a Queens residence for many years. I support the hotel's trade amendment because I've seen all firsthand how the hotel's development around here and near the airports have negatively impacted our communities without any input from residents. Over the past 10 years, a lot of the new hotels have opened in New York City and not just in Manhattan, hotels have opened all around the outer boroughs. Some of the hotels have brought tourists to the neighborhoods while others were built in places that haven't become popular neighborhoods to stay in. If there is anything New York City has plenty of these days is hotels. I'm not against the hotel development, the vast majority of the hotels in this city provide good accommodations to millions of tourists. Um, they have good jobs, they generate tax dollars, but I do, I do think that there have been some cases, especially here in Queens, where the hotels have changed the surrounding areas and it's hard to argue that they were needed. It shouldn't be too much to ask that the hotel developers work with the neighborhoods around where they want to build. The city already has a surplus of hotel rooms in 2019, which was a record years, you know, for years of tourism. Um, so it's definitely is not in danger of running out of the hotel rooms anytime soon. Letting the public have a say in the hotel development may slow new hotel construction, but it will help make, you know, sure that the development going forward is substantial and doesn't destroy the character of the city and bring tourists here. That's what they bring them here in the first place. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair, that was the last uh, speaker on this panel. Okay, uh, is there any questions for this panel? I see no members with questions for the panel. Okay, um, there being no questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, can you please call up the next panel? If there are any other members of the public who wish to testify on the proposed citywide hotel special permit text amendment, please press the raise hand button now. Chair, the meeting will briefly stand at ease while we check for any members of the public who may have uh, newly registered to testify. Chair Moy, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on the pre-considered LU item relating to the proposed hotel special permit text amendment under ULOC number N210406 ZRY, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, I now want to open the public hearing on LU numbers uh, 906 and 907 for the 250 Water Street proposal, which seeks a zoning text amendment and a zoning special permit relating to property in Council Member Chin's district in Manhattan. Uh, I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify on this item. If you have not already done so, you may register online and you may do that now by visiting the Council's website at council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that uh, we have been joined by Councilmember Chin. 
and I would like to turn it over to the council uh, member to uh, say some opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Moya. I just wanted to thank you again for hosting uh, a long hearing for a rezoning project in my district. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And also to the committee member. And I just wanna uh, welcome everyone uh, to this hearing today. And I look forward to the presentation and to all the testimony uh, from the community board, from the public. So thank you, Chair Moya. Okay, thank you. One second, I'm sorry. Um, before we proceed, I just need to. I wanna make a, a, a brief correction uh, in my opening statement when I said I now opened up a uh, public hearing on LU's number uh, 906 and 907 for the two um, uh, 50 Water Street proposal, uh, which seeks a zoning text amendment and a zoning special permit linked to property in council member Chins District in Manhattan. I'll note that uh, an application for uh, disposition approval in connection with uh, these actions is expected to be filed with the council at a later date. So I just wanna make that correction before we go into um, the uh, next panel. Thank you, Chair. The uh, applicant panel for this item will include Saul Sherrill, Chris Cooper, and David Karnofsky. Uh, available for a question and answer will include Adam Meister, Wesley O'Brien, and Charlie Fields. Hey, uh, Council, if you could please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, just as a, a reminder um, to the, uh, uh, before the panelists begin, uh, I just want to let everyone know once again, anyone who requires an accessible version of this presentation may send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now uh, your team may begin. Uh, I just remind you to please, uh, when you begin speaking, to state your name and the organization uh, for the record. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moy and Council Members. Thank you for this opportunity to present our proposal today. I'm Saul Sherrill, President of the Tri-State Region for the Howard Hughes Corporation. I will provide today a brief overview of Howard Hughes' role in the community and our project, and then I will turn it over to Chris Cooper, a partner at SOM, to review the design, followed by David Karnofsky, our land use attorney and partner at Freed Frank, to review the land use actions you are considering today. Next slide, please. Over the past decade, Howard Hughes has worked to preserve and revitalize the South Street Seaport. Our work has included giving new life to historic 19th century buildings on Shimmerhorn Row, reconstructing Pier 17 above the 100-year floodplain, and re refurbishing the beloved Tin Building. The parking lot at 250 Water Street has been a barrier and a gap in the urban fabric in the Seaport neighborhood for over 50 years. We caught up to the slideshow. Our proposal with the design approved by LPC would finally transform this site into a welcoming gateway to the South Street Seaport Historic District. Next slide, please. The plan will transform the 50 year old parking lot into a mixed use building near the Fulton subway station. As we all know, a major lower Manhattan transit hub. It will bring much needed new housing, including 80 plus deeply affordable apartments, allowing families making 40% AMI to live near public transit and good jobs with access to the waterfront in a neighborhood where little affordable housing exists today. Our proposal ensure the long-term stability of the beloved South Street Seaport Museum 
activate the streetscape and enhance community life, as well as implement a safe environmental cleanup. Importantly, this proposal will generate over $1 billion in economic activity, creating thousands of new construction and permanent jobs when New York City needs it most. And this new building will add hundreds of new patrons for struggling local businesses and help to fuel New York City's post-COVID recovery. Next slide, please. The proposal enjoys strong support from 32 BJ to local residents, businesses and nonprofits to citywide civic organizations and leaders. Over 100 local small business owners have signed a letter saying the project is needed and will fuel new businesses. And 8,000 supporters or close to 8,000 supporters have signed a petition in favor of this project, a real vote of confidence in our stewardship and vision for this unique and special part of New York City. Next slide, please. And it, it's not every day that you see the editorial boards of three New York City daily papers getting behind a development project. The New York Times, Post, and Daily News, as well as many other publications have endorsed 250 Water Street and the benefits that it brings to the seaport. And the New York Times urban planning and architecture critic Michael Kimmelman praised it as a worthy example of smart urban planning. Next slide, please. I want to take a few minutes and just quickly uh, touch very briefly on Howard Hughes' commitment to and engagement with the seaport community. Um, next slide, please. I took the helm over uh, Howard Hughes in the seaport a little over five years ago. In that time, I made it a priority to invest in ways that benefit all who live and work in this community, as well as those who visit to experience the beautiful waterfront and learn about this essential piece of New York City history. To date, Howard Hughes has invested over 700 plus million dollars in the project, and we've committed another 850 to preserving and developing the seaport, including the, this proposal for transforming the parking lot at 250 Water Street to productive use. Our investments have created thousands of jobs and generated over $1 billion in economic activity, including introducing unique independent retail, dining, entertainment, and cultural events to revitalize this area. HHC has reconstructed Pier 17 and the Tin Building on a new resilient pier, as well as refurbished and maintained the upland 19th century buildings along the seaport cobblestones. And we've made the waterfront more open, accessible, and resilient. These efforts have greatly enhanced our neighborhood, the safety and quality of life. And over the past year and a half, we partnered with our community to ensure the seaport is able to survive and thrive as a city emerges from the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. Here are just a few examples of programming and community events that Howard Hughes is proud to support at the Seaport. Next slide, please. And here are some examples of the robust relationships we have worked with. So many local nonprofits from cultural to social services and environmental organizations that are all doing incredibly important work in the Seaport. I'm now going to hand things off to our architect, Chris Cooper, who's going to talk about our planning process and the LPC approved proposed design. Thank you. Thank you, Chris Cooper uh, from the architecture and planning office of SOM next. And next again, please. You know, there have been decades of planning efforts by the city, uh, the community next and various civic groups. Yet the promise of the seaport has not been fully realized. And it's not for lack of good ideas or worthy aspirations, but there has not been a mechanism for implementation or a source of funding sufficient to realize the broader vision. And that's what we think we are bringing forward today. Next, 250 Water Street, is a unique full block site situated at the edge of the South Street Seaport Historic District, three blocks from the waterfront and adjacent to the towers of Lower Manhattan. Next. For more than 50 years, this site has persisted as a surface parking lot, not contributing to the vitality of the neighborhood or the community. 
as a full city block, the four sides are all unique from one another. And you can see that on the images on the right uh, with masonry historic buildings to our south and east on um, uh, Beekman and Water Street and tall um, and modern buildings to our north and west on uh, Peck Slip and Pearl Street next. Here we show the site in its current use, looking north uh, with, next please. Looking north with Peck Slip School, um, directly to our north and the widened Pearl Street to the west with Southbridge Towers directly across Pearl Street. The site's exceptionally well served by public transportation, especially the many subway lines that can be accessed via the Fulton Street and City Hall stations and the many bus routes that run along Pearl Street, as well as water taxis and ferry stops on the East River. Next. In a two decade trend, Community District 1 has experienced significant residential growth essentially doubling its residents in the past 20 years. Uh, increasingly, the area has become an even more vibrant mixed use community, albeit one that is not as diverse or affordable as other parts of the city. Next. In the blocks uh, immediately surrounding the parking lot at 250 Water is a vibrant neighborhood filled with active streets, sidewalks lined with local restaurants, retail shops, pharmacies, grocery store, um, private and public schools. Um, and as you just heard from Saul, many of these business owners and institutions support this project and an increase in even more local customers. Next. And finally, it's worth noting that um, thanks to significant investments by the city of New York, uh, this neighborhood is also home to several new open spaces. Next. So with that as context, um, let's take a look at the proposed design. Next. Our proposal is a direct response to the city's um, and sites immediate context, both the rich history and the evolution of the broader urban context that surrounds the site. Next. To achieve that, we have proposed a two-part massing that responds to the contrasting scales of this full city block, a low base with a tall um, residential building. Next. And here in plan, you can see how we've shifted the bulk of the building to align with Pearl Street. That's represented in the lighter color. The tall bar is configured as a composition of small rectangular blocks to break down the massing. And uh, to our east and to our south, um, the site faces direct, um, directly low masonry historic buildings. And so we've provided significant setbacks to our east on Water Street of nominally 50 feet and to our south on Beekman Street of 90 feet. Next. The Water Street uh, elevation as seen here is kept low. It responds directly to the scale, texture, and materiality of the district. The street wall heights vary and it's defined by multiple small entrances to um, retail and community uh, facility. Next. On Pearl Street, we've continued the low street wall around the corners, but we break the masonry facade at the center of the block. And we change the material here and the proportion to relate directly to the tall massing above, which clearly associates the tall portions of the building with Pearl Street. Um, all the primary entrances to the building, and I'll show this in plan shortly, um, are located here on Pearl Street. Next, um, a couple of renderings. First, um, standing on, uh, on Fulton Street, looking north up 
Pearl Street, you can appreciate the first the benefit of the deep 90 foot setback, which is on Beekman. It separates the low scale foreground from the taller massing. And then the height of the building is clearly positioned here on Pearl Street. And so the shearing of the volumes that I showed in plan, um, you can see here breaking down the mass of the building. And you also see the break in the masonry facade uh, mid block to create a strong sense of entry for the residences uh, above. Next. And then as we cross the street, cross Pearl Street and um, stand within the district looking north on Water Street, you see very clearly how the two part massing addresses the difference of scale between Pearl Street and Water Street. The tall building clearly faces onto Pearl Street and is in the context of its uh, neighbors that are tall. And, the, um, and on Water Street, um, the, the low massing then enhances and strengthens the district context and relates directly to the masonry buildings that it faces. Next. Here we look at the specifics of our proposal and the stack. Um, the, program uh, section here shows the distribution of program. So we have a five-story base um, of mixed program, particularly at street level, retail, community space, and various entrance lobbies. And then four floors of commercial office space in blue that uh, make up the base of the building. And the residential bar rises above that. And um, as, um, as mentioned, there is 20% of the residential is affordable housing, and that is um, um, shown as rental units, four floors of rental, affordable rental units. And then above that are for sale condominium units. Next. So we look at the um, site plan, you can see that we've focused um, the majority of the programming and, uh, and active entrances on Pearl Street, which is the wide active street. So all vehicular access is off of Pearl Street. The blue diamonds um, um, represent first the loading dock on the um, north and then uh, vehicular access to parking on the south. So there's an entrance to parking and then an, ax, uh, an exit directly onto Beekman, which loops you directly back to Pearl. So we keep the traffic out of the narrow cobbled streets. Um, the, the plan is really organized around one central um, through block residential lobby with the primary entrance on Pearl Street, a convenience entrance on Water Street, um, this is a shared lobby for uh, uh, affordable rental and market rate condominium. And there's an office lobby also on Pearl. And then the rest of the block is activated by small neighborhood retail spaces. And then a anchor community space, which is on the corner of water and Peck Slip facing onto Peck Slip. Next. I'll, I'll conclude with just a few um, more renderings. Uh, the first is the rendering from the Brooklyn Bridge, and you can really see the idea of the two-part massing, a low base relating to the foreground and a tall bar um, relating to the context of the city. The building in height steps down from the height of its neighbors to the south, and the uh, massing of the residential bar is broken into smaller kind of composition of parts to remove it from the language of the broader office buildings in the adjacent context. Next. In this view, we're looking south on Pearl Street. We see um, a variety of scale and entrance conditions, um, including the large residential entrance mid block. And the next final view, um, stepping over onto Water Street, you see by contrast, Water Street um, Next, please. By contrast, Water Street represents a different scale altogether and a, a low um, masonry um, scale that responds and activates and, and um, the, the character of the historic district itself. Next. And I will pass now to David Karnofsky. Uh, David Karnofsky, uh, Free Frank, uh, Land Use Council to the project. Uh, next slide, please. 
the centerpiece land use change here is to sever floor area that currently sits on the waterfront at Pier 17 and moves it from the waterfront uh, to a more suitable upland location. And I'm gonna go through uh, how that works. Next, please. Uh, the first action is to modify the site plan for the existing large scale general development in the area, which consists today of Pier 17 and the tin building shown in red. What would happen is that in addition to the Pier 17 tin building zoning lot, uh, the streets, the DMAP streets that intervene between 250 Water Street and Pier 17 would be added into the large scale and together with 250 Water Street would form a new expanded large scale development. And I'm gonna now skip to the third for a minute. The zoning text amendments also needed to form this large scale is a zoning text amendment that confirms that these DMAP streets, these streets were DMAPed in the 80s and have no floor area associated with them, may serve as zoning lots for purposes of the definition of a large scale. The former streets became zoning lots upon the DMAPing in 83, uh, but at that time there was also zoning text added to the zoning resolution that said that they would continue to serve as streets for certain zoning purposes related to height and setback and the like. The purpose of this text amendment is simply to confirm that they can perform the function of zoning lots for purposes of the large scale. With the large scale in place, the next action going back to number two is to allow for the distribution of floor area from Pier 17 to 250 Water Street. 234,630 square feet of unused floor area on Pier 17 would be moved to 250 Water Street. In addition, the large scale would be used to facilitate height and setback waivers that would accommodate the building that was approved by the Landmarks Preservation Commission and last week by the City Planning Commission. The proposed waivers would permit the building to reduce the minimum base height in certain locations, increase the maximum base height in other locations, and allow encroachments into setback areas along Peck Slip and Pearl Street, and exceed the maximum permitted roof height of 120 feet. All of these waivers, as I said, are intended to facilitate the building approved by LPC. In addition, the building requires a curb cut authorization on Pearl Street, which is a wide street. This would be a 20 foot curb cut and would serve as the entrance as um, Chris explained to the below grade as of right accessory attended parking facility with the exit located on Beekman Street. And the last couple of actions listed here relate to the site plan for Pier 17 and reflect minor changes to the Pier 17 site plan, including the addition of bollards, three guard booths along the access drive and a skylight on the Pier 17 building, as well as a realignment of the access drive which was on the apron that runs from South Street to the Pier 17 building. And that's the summary of the land use actions. Next slide. So this is, as I touched on earlier, this is a project that will deliver many benefits for the community in New York City. I'd like to review a few of those exciting attributes in greater detail in the next few slides. Next slide, please. As is well known, Lower Manhattan is one of the most affluent neighborhoods in New York City with little affordable housing. This was exacerbated by the removal of 1,600 apartments that comprise the Southbridge Towers from the Mitchell-Lama Housing Program leaving the neighborhood well out of reach for working families. Our proposal, which will be uh, privately financed, will voluntarily conform to the requirements of mandatory inclusionary housing program through a binding agreement with HPD. This will immediately increase diversity and bring needed affordable housing to this area. Specifically, we're proposing to bring some 80 permanently deeply affordable family apartments at 40% of AMI, area median income, approximately 45,000 a year for a family of four. The 
The affordable housing will incorporate on-site amenities as well as a community facility space of approximately 5,000 square feet. Importantly, these new homes will be located near one of New York City's largest transit hubs, good employment opportunities, and high quality schools. Next slide, please. The proposal will create thousands of construction and permanent jobs and generate needed economic activity, as you can see from this slide. Next slide, please. The Seaport Museum is the heart and soul of the historic district. The longstanding cultural institution has been a champion for the historic district and bolstered its vitality. Its leadership, staff, and volunteers work tirelessly to preserve and promote the story of this historic entryway to our city through exhibitions and programs in landmark buildings and on historic ships. Its collections preserve thousands of artifacts and records. HHC development rights purchase will generate $40 million that the city will, the city will set aside for a museum endowment fund that will generate significant annual investment earnings that will be distributed to the museum for operating support, ensuring its long-term fiscal stability. In addition, the city has also committed $10 million of capital in the recent budget to advance funds for future museum capital re rehabilitation projects. Next slide, please. We are designing a building to meet and exceed lead silver. And now I'm going to hand it over to back to Chris Cooper, who's going to talk about that. Yeah, sure. I just want to make a point that we are, um, you know, sustainability is on the front of everybody's mind right now. And we are making great steps with this project to have it be very aggressive to meeting the new local law um, 97 and working towards an all electric future and, um, and also building a resilient building we are on the edge of the um of the design flood elevation and this is a fully um, resilient project as well next and the only thing that i would add to that is that in, in, in within howard Hughes, we have a full team that is working on sustainability and these issues that will be uh, intimately working closely with chris and his team on this to make sure um, the project contains many hallmarks of what is recognized as smart urban planning and design. For example, it will eliminate an outmoded 50 plus year old surface parking lot. It will add residential housing units close to transit jobs, transit and jobs. It will have a vibrant mix of uses, including residential housing, offices, neighborhoods, retail and community oriented space. The design is LPC approved and contextual to the historic district. We've located the height and bulk as Chris mentioned, closer to the financial district and put the loading and parking access on Pearl Street, a wide commercial street. The streetscape design is contextual as well with bluestone and cobblestone sidewalks, street trees and historic light fixtures that will harmonize with the historic district. Next slide, please. And as to environmental, I'd like to reiterate that Howard Hughes is an active member of this community and the safety of our community and neighborhood is of critical concern to all of us. When we purchased this site, we were fully aware that contamination was present and that it had been there for over 100 years. We immediately voluntarily entered the New York State Brownfield Cleanup Program, a rigorous program that mandates robust community input and close oversight by the New York State DEC and DOH. We've been engaged in that process now for over two years and have committed to transparency since day one. HHC has funded an independent community monitor with expertise in hazardous materials to ensure that the community can track every detail of the project. As of now, a remedial investigation work plan has been completed by Langen Engineering in consultation with Community Board One, our elected officials, and the community monitor, and we have been approved by the state DEC and DOH. DEC and DOH are now reviewing the draft remedial action work plan. And we have a website dedicating to providing public and transparent information. Final slide, please. I'd like to thank you again, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee and council member Chin. We very appreciate, appreciate your consideration of this project, which we and our many supporters believe is essential to moving the seaport forward. 
We believe the Seaport days are best at our day, best days are ahead. We hope to continue to play a dynamic role in its recovery and a bright future for New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions before I turn it over to uh, Council Member Chin. Um, you know, we, we have heard concerns from the uh, adjacent school about potential construction impacts. Uh, can you describe any measures uh, you're planning to avoid any disruptions? Uh, <clears throat> sure, thank, thank you, Chair Moya. Um, we, we are gonna be um, working through a robust set of, of measures to protect the, the adjacent community. Um, these will range from um, sidewalk bridges to appropriate signage, uh, safety barriers and netting, uh, noise mitigation features. Um, we'll be undergoing a uh, or undertaking a construction protection plan with um, consultation from the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission to protect uh, historic structures. Um, and we will um, be forming a construction working group to work very carefully with um, all of the surrounding neighbors and all of the sensitive receptors. Um, we, um, we are in, a, in dialogue and we'll be, you know, as we finalize our construction plans um, with the neighborhood to make sure that uh, the appropriate mitigations are in place from a noise perspective, from an environmental perspective. Um, and some of those, you know, examples um, include um, uh, providing for uh, uh, storm windows or, you know, excess um, levels of glazing to the extent those are required, um, replacing air conditioning units. So it's a whole range of things. Um, we, we spelled out a number of those in the, um, the very detailed uh, environmental impact statement that was um, uh, worked through with community input. Um, and uh, those are just a few of the highlights. If um, uh, Wesley, uh, if you had anything to add to that, I'd uh, encourage you, um, as I know you were you know, carefully involved, as was Charlie Fields with AKRF, um, in terms of analyzing all of the various uh, impacts and mitigations uh, that are under consideration. Sure, I, I, would, just, I would just add that, that the, the measures that are committed to are, go, they're very fine grain. There are a number of, of construction best management practices that, that uh, the applicant team has committed to in terms of emissions reduction and noise reduction uh, during construction. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, Ed, I know that you were talking about uh, the affordable housing um, units there. Uh, because this proposal doesn't include uh, an upzoning here and instead relies on a transfer mechanism. Can you explain how the affordable uh, housing units will be memorialized as part of this project? Uh, yeah, David Karnofsky. Um, you, you're absolutely right. It is not uh, governed by MIH, strictly speaking, because it's not an upzoning. Um, however, um, HHC has agreed that as a condition of its ability to use the floor area that it's purchasing, it will enter into a regulatory agreement with HPD that will require adherence to all of the requirements of, of MIH um, as a program. So that uh, the closing on the development rights cannot take place until that regulatory agreement has been executed. Okay, thank you. Um, and how will this uh, development improve the pedestrian experience around the area? Uh, and will there be any new uh, crosswalks added here? Chris, do you wanna take that one? Yes, there are not additional crosswalks being added, but I, what I would say is that we have, um, we have been careful to put any congestion outside of the, co the narrow cobblestone streets and focused the primary entrances onto Pearl Street, which then have direct connections to public transportation. And so we have all of our entrances are specifically the direct entrances are recessed off of the sidewalk. And then we have gone through, we are actually enhancing the entire perimeter sidewalk with historic uh, materials. So stone um, sidewalks and, uh, and a specialty paving around the perimeter. But I would say that the primary gesture we have made is to place the entrances carefully on the wide street um, of the block. Okay. 
Um, and my last question, and I, I, I think you were touching upon this towards the end of the presentation, but as you know, the building uh, is in the 100 year uh, floodplain uh, beyond the minimum building code standards. What uh, flood mitigation strategies will the um, proposed development uh, employ? So you can just get into more of uh, Sure. Uh, maybe I'll start there and Adam, you may want to um, continue, but we are doing um, dry flood proofing of the majority of the perimeter. And we are, um, so we are implementing storefronts because we're also in a historic district. We don't want to build barriers or visual barriers. So we're implementing glass storefronts that are also storm proof, that are flood proof. And, um, and so we're actually going above and beyond to try to make sure that we bring the program all the way down to sidewalk level, but still provide a full um, uh, barrier of uh, flood protection on the perimeter. Our site is kind of half in, half out of the uh, floodplain. And so all of the primary entrances are on Pearl Street, which is the high point of the site so that we don't have any primary entrances within the floodplain. And so we also then know that our building can um, be operational during flood and also immediately after flood. And we know also that our building will not cause any unintended consequences to the perimeter um, to buildings beyond our site or outside of our site. The only thing I would add to that is that the, the building mechanical systems and critical infrastructure will be elevated uh, generally above the first floor and well out of the uh, out of the floodplain. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's it for uh, my questions. Uh, I now want to turn it over to uh, Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Chair Moyer. Uh, thank you I'm for your nervous. question. Thank you. Uh, I just want to also to follow up with the noise mitigation uh, question, because, you know, the development is going to be right across the street, you know, from two schools. And so I know that we have experienced in low Manhattan um, that construction time, you know, can be flexible when kids are in school. And are you looking at that? Because especially when you are doing the, the real noisy stuff of pile drilling or the foundation work, um, that you need to take that into consideration. Um, so that's one question. Uh, the other is that if you can do a breakdown on the, uh, on the MIH in terms of the different uh, AMI and number of units um, in those category. And I also have some uh, interest in terms of your climate, you know, resiliency and your presentation. You talked about uh, rainwater, uh, retention, I mean, like capturing rainwater, I mean that. So how is that work in terms of utilizing um, that resource to water the plants or uh, do, you know, to help, you know, green, uh, green the area? Um, and the other concern is that right across the street from the school, I mean, the whole, the peck slip space, there's a playground further down, but is there a commitment to really helping the school do a play street so there's more active um, open space uh, for the Pexip school? So, so Saul or sure. Adam? Yeah, th thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Um, I'll, I'll just go through through each of these. Um, oh, and one I more. Think yeah. One more is that I saw in the real <clears throat> deal that HEC is talking with Pace University about doing a possible community theater on your office space or retail space. So maybe if you could elaborate on that, because I have never heard about it before. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll go through each of these and, and, and other members of, of the team, I think will we'll, um, contribute as well. Um, in terms of the, the noise mitigation, um, again, you know, we're, it's, we're very uh, much committed to working with our neighbors um, to, to minimize um, the impacts from noise. Um, in terms of specific timeframes, you know, we're gonna be, as we get to the point where we have a detailed construction schedule, we will be engaging with, uh, with those local neighbors, with the community board to, to outline um, that and specify it in great, in great detail. And we are you know, open to, you know, working uh, around and, and making the schedule as flexible 
as it can be in terms of uh, you know times of days and and critical periods so that we minimize that uh, that disruption. Um, in terms of the uh, the number of units and the affordability, um, we were uh, as was in the presentation. Um, we are um, targeting an average of 40% AMI. Um, we don't have the specific mix in terms of um, you know where that'll fall. So some some of the AMIs will be below and some will be above. Um, it's going to be pursuant to the, um, the 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 deep affordability option within MIH. So we will conform to that. I think there is a a cap of 130% AMI, but I, I'm not sure we'll even be up that high to hit the average of 40%, but it'll be around that 40% and, and that's what the unit average will be. Um, and the size, the unit size requirements also will conform to the MIH parameter in terms of the mix um, and the, um, you know, for example, a uh, number of, you know, two, two bedrooms versus studios and so on. Um, on the, uh, the climate resiliency, um, Chris, maybe you could you could um, chime in here. I'd be happy to. So you mentioned um, rainwater retention or stormwater management. And I, one thing I want to make an important point is that right now this is a surface park, parking lot and all the rainwater falls onto that lot and then runs um, downhill from where it falls directly. The big advantage that we have is as we build the site, we have major setback in outdoor spaces that can then catch the rainwater. So all of our rooftops are designed with landscaping and with the way that we're, um, we're um, uh, planting and, and accommodating the roofs to capture the rainwater instead of letting it just run off the site to the adjacent sites. And so then once we hold that, we can do, we do two things with it. Some we retain to actually use for, um, for, for, for the maintenance of the landscape on the roof, and some just gets um, taken slowly into the stormwater system. So it's a better way of managing the stormwater um, on the site than what is currently there today. Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, in regard to the, uh, yeah, so I don't know if you want to, the, the two uh, I, questions I, 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 that were left were the Play Street and Pace and anything else you wanted to add. Yeah, to. As, as, it, as it relates to Play Street, obviously it, it, it uh, involves uh, coordination with DOT. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, um, we'll, let them, we'll let them finish up. Yeah. It's okay. uh, it, it involves um, coordination with DOT and we're working very closely with DOT. We, we, we favor the Play Street and we'd like to see it uh, stay and make sure that not only is it protected during construction, but it's something that stays uh, beyond construction in the long term. Obviously, that's somewhat um, requires coordination among city agencies. So we are working with them and we'd like to see that happen as well. As it relates to your question on Pace University, um, you know, they have expressed interest in the community about finding a theater space. Um, they're expanding their theater program and um, we have no um, commitment with them, no, no letters of intent or anything like that. They were curious to find out about the base of the building. And because of that um, question and with just some discussions we had with them, we wanted to have that as an option if down the road Pace were, um, we were able to come to terms with them about building them some type of um, uh, you know, space that would be good for the, for the arts. Um, but there's no transaction or nothing that we can share with you at this point. Okay, I mean, it, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think it'd be nice to have that going, but um, <laughs> that'll be a nice addition, right? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'll if I have any other question, I'll I'll come back. But I really we, we look agree, forward to hearing. We agree <laughs> I look that forward to nice. hearing the testimony from the public. Thank sure. you. Sure. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council Member Chin. Uh, Council, do we have any uh, other Council members that have uh, any questions? Uh, no, Chair, I don't see any members with questions for the panel. Okay. Um, there being uh, no further questions, the applicant panel is excused. Um, Council, are there any members of the public who wish to testify on the 250 Water Street proposal? We just need you to unmute. Arthur, sorry. Sorry. For members of the public who are here to testify, please note again that witnesses will generally be called in panels of four. 
If you are a member of the public who has signed up to testify on the 250 Water Street uh, proposal, please stand by when you hear your name being called and prepare to speak when the chair says you need to begin. We will hear from the first panel. We have approximately 60 persons registered. Uh, the first panel will include Michael Kramer, Diana Switage, Paul Goldstein, and Adrian Sosin. I uh, chair, with your permission, I just want to make a quick procedural announcement to all of uh, people waiting to testify. If you have registered and you are now waiting in the Zoom, uh, there is no need for you to use the raise hand uh, function. We will get to everyone and uh, we appreciate your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder for our members of the public, um, you will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, please do not begin until the Sergeant at Arms has started the clock. Um, and now the first uh, speaker may begin. Michael Kramer. Time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Michael Kramer and I represent the Seaport Coalition. In the matter of 250 water, FOIL emails show that city planning was instructed by City Hall to proceed as a priority project, to either drop or give lower priority to another project, given their workload and pipeline. Deputy Mayor Vicki Bean organized a weekly Tuesday 4 p.m. 250 water City Hall EDC DCP LPC check-in to keep it moving through the regulatory pipeline. The applicant has unleashed a team of lawyer lobbyists upon city agencies. The former general counsel to DCP is now representing HEC. The former general counsel to LPC is now representing HC. In the first three reporting periods for 2021, almost $600,000 has been spent on lawyers and lobbyists. Fried Frank's fourth period filing is now a month overdue, so these numbers through August 31st might approach as much as 750,000 or more. This application is flawed. Not only is the development at Pier 17 not integral to 250 water, neither are the pedestrian ways which provide the only access to several buildings on these blocks and do not abut 250 water or Pier 17. It is an absurd con construct that you should reject. Seaport streets define the boundaries of blocks Zoning lots are found within blocks, including former streets in the proposed, in the proposal is just a workaround scheme to move air rights. Manhattan Community Board one has a plan to fund an endowment for the South Street Seaport Museum with this, without this tower overwhelming and dominating the historic district. This large scale general development plan diminishes the seaport's unique relationship to the water and compromises the last intact 19th century neighborhood in a place where New York began. Informed members of the City Council Land Use Committee will find the 250 water EULA to be a corporate giveaway by the mayor and a product of We implore council members to stand up to the mayor on this application and vote no. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker. Diana Switage will be the next speaker followed by Paul Goldstein. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Diana Sweetai. I'm Director of Planning and Land Use at Manhattan Community Board 1. CB1 is strongly opposed to this application for the privately owned 250 Water Street site as it seeks major changes to the longstanding seaport zoning. It is an egregious departure from years of carefully crafted zoning regulations meant to guide the orderly growth of the seaport and the modifications proposed by HHC to reconfigure these rules are to advance a private profit driven agenda. CB1 is extremely disheartened by CPC's vote to approve this application with only one objection and almost no discussion. In 2003, CB1 sponsored a ULERP application to change the zoning to C62A and won overwhelming support from the community, property owners, the Seaport Museum, Downtown Alliance, CPC, and all elected officials. This current zoning caps building heights for new buildings at 120 feet and is meant to maintain the low scale size of buildings within the unique historic district. CB1 has adopted multiple resolutions indicating it would support a new building at 250 Water Street that complies with the existing zoning and is extremely troubled by the proposed building that is roughly three times taller than what is currently permitted. There is critical concern and uncertainty surrounding the Seaport Museum's endowment and the Pledge John Street law expansion as a result of this proposal. The project team in the city are currently working to find a solution to this problem, but regulatory hurdles may prohibit the funds from being guaranteed to the museum, and the exact mechanism for this funding has not yet been shared, including what guarantees are in place. 
Already, EDC has not fulfilled its 2019 promise to the Seaport Museum with the FCRC funding stream it asked CB1 to support. There's a history at the Seaport of agreements left unfulfilled by HHC, including the Pier 17 rooftop once presented as an expansive open space for primarily community use, now mainly a private event and concert venue, as well as a commitment for 10,000 square foot local and regionally sourced affordable and accessible market, now planned to be a high-end food market curated by celebrity chef. CB1 is extremely troubled by the idea of support for this project in exchange for a guarantee to save the I'm museum, inspired. the potential that this will be eventually added to a left of, list of commitments left unfulfilled. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be Paul Goldstein, followed by Adrian Sosin. Time starts now. Okay. Ready? Okay. Ready. This 345 foot tall tower before you would be a great addition. All right, well, just one second. Uh, we just got to restart the clock. Thank yep. you. There we go. This 345 foot tall tower before you would be a great addition if built virtually anywhere else in lower Manhattan, but it's grossly out of scale and inappropriate for the South Street Seaport Historic District. Approving these ULERP applications would set several bad precedents, including one, allowing development rights to be moved into historic districts. What will prevent this maneuver from taking place in other historic districts? Two, rewriting the special rules governing the transfer of development rights in the seaport whereby they are only supposed to be moved to sites outside the historic district. And three, allowing developers to rewrite the rules which allow the transfer of development rights from an adjacent site by instead using a DMAP street to create a fake connection to sites located blocks away. The current C62A zoning was put into place in 2003 when the city approved a plan supported by CB1, the Downtown Alliance, local elected officials, EDC, the Seaport Museum, and the City Council. The current proposal totally ignores good faith efforts by the community board and community to suggest alternative ways to help fund the Seaport Museum and to build affordable housing that can be done without approving a building three times the height of what is permitted. We are aware of other local property owners outside the seaport interested in purchasing seaport air rights. The city should let them bid for these rights so that we can move them outside the historic district and still raise money needed for the museum. I urge you not to approve the proposal before you today. Let's work together to come up with a better plan to help the seaport museum and build more affordable housing while also preserving and protecting our special Seaport Historic District, and I thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next speaker. Chair, that was the last speaker on this. Uh, no, excuse me. The next and last speaker will be Adrian Sosin. Adrian Sosin. Time starts now. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm Adrian Sosin. I live in Southbridge Towers. And for everyone who lives in this formerly Mitchell-Lama development, it remains affordable housing for 1,650 families who will be adversely affected by the noise and dust of construction for many years and to the loss of daily sunlight forever. I must bring your attention to why to pause 250 Water Street to not hastily move forward a project that will ultimately harm New York City more than it will ever help. What is being discussed is a fraud and a theft of public property, but legally, namely the historic Seaport District, the unique and irreplaceable national treasure is imperiled by real estate interests seeking an inappropriate tower of luxury condominiums that will threaten the foundations of the surrounding historic buildings one of which was just evacuated this week and break the zoning precedents. 
The rezoning and lease applications create a geographical fiefdom for a single private property owner, in this case, Howard Hughes, that will privatize public spaces beyond the, the time when any of us is alive. The oversized building that in the Howard Hughes Corporation has applied for has implications that are being overlooked in the haste and priority the mayor's administration has awarded it. What is most immediately important is the danger to public health posed by this rush. 250 Water Street is a toxic nightmare. The parking lot borders both the public pep, pep slip school and the blue school that serves hundreds of families. Sensitive receptors now imperiled by Howard Hughes' threat to break through the site's protective cap almost immediately upon receiving approvals, exemplifying the shock doctrine applied to a local community. The parents and communities appeal to stop this excavation before safety is ensured adequately. Their plan does not even consider COVID protocols. Please do not do this and please wait to certify this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Uh, do we have any council members uh, with questions? I uh, see no members with questions for this panel. Okay, there being um, no questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And if you could, please call up the next panel. The next panel will include Andrea Goldwyn, Jonathan Boulware, Marissa Williams, and Adam Ganser. The first speaker will be Andrea Goldwyn, followed by Jonathan Boulware. Time starts now. Uh, good day, Chair Moya and Council Members. I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking for the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy's Public Policy Committee attended numerous meetings in late 2020 and early 2021 to review the application for 250 Water Street that was made to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. The committee appreciated that the project team listened to comments from the public and the commissioners at several LPC hearings and responded to them. The Public Policy Committee supported the final proposal to LPC, which the Commission approved. That proposal was much more successful than earlier versions in reflecting the context of the South Street Seaport Historic District. The building base features a warm palette and materials that complement the fine-grained details of the historic streetscape. The tower section was reduced in height and its massing relocated to the westernmost edge of the, excuse me, westernmost section of the lot at the edge of the historic district. Variations in the fenestration and subtle terminations at the roof line made the tower more visually interesting. With these modifications, the building will be a better neighbor to the South Street Seaport. This site has proved to be a long and unfortunate challenge, which many have tried to solve. The South Street Seaport Historic District deserves more than a parking lot. We believe this is a good solution. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony today. Um, next speaker. Jonathan Boulware will be the next speaker, followed by Marissa Williams. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Moya. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jonathan Boulware. I live in the South Street Seaport Historic District with my family. I also serve as the president of the South Street Seaport Museum. In the 1960s, when what we now know as the historic district was facing demolition, a band of volunteers stood in front of the wrecking ball. These same folks founded the Seaport Museum, creating a completely unique organism, a museum that saved a district and functions as its programmatic anchor. Today, the museum provides a, an irreplaceable perspective on New York, a metropolis that had, was a seaport long before it was a city. And indeed, much of what we think about when we think about New York has its roots in a seaside trading port that would become the financial and cultural capital we know today. The seaport with the museum as its beating heart is the birthplace of New York. It is for this compelling reason that I and so many others for decades have poured our energies into this perennially under-resourced but critical institution. Embedded in the founding concepts of the museum was the premise that real estate operations and devices like air rights transfers would provide needed support for the museum long-term. This has been pointed out, did not work consistently. But the proposal before this committee today is what will really preserve the seaport as we know it, as we love it, long-term. 
It proposes to use an air rights transfer, a device that was invented here in the first instance, first used here to deliver reliable recurring revenue to the cultural anchor of the seaport. These mechanisms were carefully designed to affect exactly this outcome. The seaport's own early 1970s master plan envisioned just such a building on this site. This is a good and appropriate use of this device and its success will mean a thriving seaport that illuminates New York for its residents, for its visitors and for the world for generations to come. I thank you for your consideration on this and for um, the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Um, next panelist, please. Next panelist will be Marissa Williams, followed by Adam Ganser. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Marissa Williams and I'm a representative of 32BJ SEIU. I am here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project at 250 Water. 32BJ is the largest property services union in the country representing 85,000 property service workers in New York City, including many who live and work in the neighborhood. 32BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the communities where they build. I am happy to report that the developer Howard Hughes has recently made a credible commitment to creating prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. On behalf of 32BJ SEIU, I respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Council, can we please call up the next panelist? Next panelist, Adam Ganser. Time starts now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Uh, my name is Adam Ganser. I am the executive director of New Yorkers for Parks. New Yorkers for Parks is a hundred year old not for profit that champions equitable access to quality parks and open spaces throughout New York City. We do this through research, advocacy, and programming. I am testifying today in support of HHC's proposal to develop a mixed use building at 250 Water Street. The project will spur economic development, add residential housing near transit and good jobs, create permanent and deeply affordable housing in lower Manhattan's affluent seaport neighborhood and generate funding for the Seaport Museum, a district and asset that are essential to the fabric of New York City. Further, the development will create a welcoming gateway to the seaport, increase pedestrian access to existing and planned waterfront parks, and provide additional open space through pedestrianizing and activating streets near the seaport. It will also refurbish the Esplanade and Titanic Park. This is the right time for a development like 250 Water Street in one of New York City's densest neighborhoods. HHC is prioritizing affordability, increasing access to existing and future open spaces and parks, and increased access to pedestrian only streets, priorities that match the direction of the city's advocates and push to create a more livable and equitable New York City. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. I see no members with questions for this panel. Okay. Um, Seeing uh, there's no questions for this panel, this panel, um, this witness panel is now excused. Council, if you can please uh, call up the next panel. Next panel will include Diego Rabayo, Joanne Gorman, Emily Hellstrom, and Megan Malvern. First speaker will be Diego Rabayo, followed by Joanne Gorman. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Diego Roballo and I work for the Historic Districts Council. The Historic Districts Council is the advocate for New York City's designated historic districts and neighborhoods maritime preservation. Its public review committee monitors changes within historic districts and changes to individual landmarks and has reviewed this application. The public encountered components of this application have, have improved immensely. However, this doesn't change the fundamental issue of scale that is at the heart of this project, this debate, and this historic district. Absent from this extensive restudy is a survey of new construction within the historic district since the time of designation, and a considered study and analysis of why those approved buildings are successful. Unlike those projects who became contextual neighbors, this proposal and this applicant believes it to be the exception to the rule. 
This is not a seaport scale building and no matter how nuanced or considered the base of, of a building is, it is extremely difficult to hide a skyscraper. To this point, this skyscraper cannot hide here and therefore it is an imposition. The Historic Districts Council looks forward to seeing a scale appropriate proposal at a future hearing or meeting. If it cannot be seaport size, perhaps it just does not belong here and the applicant should build the bulk that they desire outside the historic district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next uh, speaker. Next speaker will be Joanne Gorman, followed by Emily Hellstrom. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Joanne Gorman, and I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of South Street Seaport. The Howard Jews Corp recently replaced a prior plan to access and redistribute city-owned air rights within the protected seaport with its latest contrived large-scale general development framework that mocks the meaning of street, adjacency, common ownership. Its plans would exploit city-owned development rights meant to preserve seaport assets and public streets demapped for public benefit to advance a sole developer's private profit-driven agenda. It played on a financially strapped museum and the city housing needs by initially dangling 50 million contribution and 100 affordable rental units as bait. The money was never a contribution. The affordable units are relegated to low floors with separate elevators and separate mail rooms, while prime views are reserved for the luxury condos above. With deceptive wording and promotion, Howard Hughes has worked to manipulate city agencies and local elected officials to acquiesce to a tower that dismisses the unique low scale setting of the seaport. As far back as 2019, Howard Hughes originated and participated in multiple meetings with city agencies, the museum, our borough president, and our current local council member, bringing participants into constant contact, creating a setting choreographed by Howard Hughes for all to become vested in its plan for 250 water. Under the guise of applicant, Howard Hughes has access to our city agencies that the general public is never afforded. On May 16th, the Seaport Coalition initiated a legal challenge to the landmark's May 4th approval of a 324-foot tower as appropriate within the seaport. So the judge recently dismissed the legal action is not yet ripe for judicial review. He also dismissed it without prejudice. Advocates watching the seaport will bide our time for the LPC apple to ripen. The city is on notice as it continues to expend resources to rush this project through. This is the wrong project for the historic seaport. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we can call up the next uh, speaker. Emily Hellstrom will speak next, followed by Megan Malvern. Time starts now. My name is Emily Hellstrom, and I am the PTA co-president of the Pexlip School and a co-founder of Children First, a grassroots organization with over 600 family members. I wanna make sure that you know how this plan will affect the hundreds of pre-K and elementary school children who attend school directly next to this site. How untrustworthy this developer is. From the beginning, they told our school community that there was only organic mercury when they knew that there was toxic elemental mercury from a former thermometer factory. They told us there was no mercury vapor detected during testing, but the report says there was. They told us we were doing test pits, but they didn't. Saul talks about a community monitor, one that we advocated for and secured. We recently uncovered an email from a FOIL request that shows that Saul was angry when we didn't comply with the deal to support the project once she was in place. HHC with their slick lawyers, lobbyists and billionaire investors spread their money around to buy support. They display unprecedented arrogance and no one holds them accountable. In the historic seaport district, they say one thing and do another, but this time the health and well being of our children is at stake. Just look to their last ULERP to see the promise, uh, public promises and amenities disappear. A 10,000 square foot community market never realized. A promised public open green space, now a private outdoor concert hall. Public streets taken over as private clubs that you need a special credit card to enter. And now they promise $50 million to the museum with no legal mechanism to pay. Even their promise of affordable housing is deeply suspect. It is not guaranteed. The housing is relegated to poor floor and they have a lawsuit against them in another state for raising maintenance on tenants just to push them out. If the takeover of our public spaces does not bother you, I hope the health of our children does. 
They want to use a zoning trick to rip the lid off a site that contains elemental mercury, toxic irritants, neurotoxins, renal toxins, and more. As an NYU scientist put it, the chemicals discovered in the soil are a who's who of environmental toxicology, all so that billionaire Bill Ackman and other shareholders can make even more of a profit. Above all, for the health of our children, I urge you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker will be Megan Malvern. Time starts now. Chair Moya and the members of the subcommittee, thank you. My name is Megan Malvern. I'm a 15 year plus resident of the Seaport area, a mom, a hard worker, PTA vice president, and a New York City resident who has been wholly disregarded by the woman you are prepared to give deference to on a project of which she has no meaningful knowledge or depth of care. For more than a year and a half, my school's principal has asked uh, Ms. Chin to hear our concerns from the parents who have children going to school just inches from where a rushed and incomplete toxic remediation in the state Brownfield program is set to start in January ahead of this building's construction. The last time the city trusted another agency about the safety of the air in lower Manhattan, tens of thousands of residents were poisoned by the toxic air of September 11 terror attacks. To this day, thousands suffer from our city's failure to do their own work and verify findings. This FEIS is a blueprint for disaster that defers the safety of New York City's children to an out of reach agency filled with people who do not have any skin in this game. It is my son who will be exposed to the neurological toxins, not theirs. I beg you, please watch CBS's news report on mercury fears at the seaport by Natalie Dudridge about the problematic work done to date. This council has the life and health and education of nearly 800 children in its hands. Margaret is gone in eight weeks. You will be left to explain why you approved a project that will A, cost the city millions of dollars in devalued assets benefiting Howard Hughes, rely solely on the state to oversee a never before attempted elemental mercury cleanup just inches from our young children, believes HHC's unofficial MIH delivery and trusts that the promised funding of an undetermined amount of money via yet to be seen agreement will find its way to the perpetually poor and poorly managed South Street Seaport Museum. This proposal also, I'd like to point out, sets a precedent that sidesteps the council's authority on allocating city monies to cultural centers. Why does HHC- Directly, I would also ask the chair Boya Please, would you take a meeting with my principal? Because Margaret Chin won't listen to us and she won't return our phone calls. Thank you, and please turn down this. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, let's move on to the next panelist. Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. Do we have any questions for, for the, this panel? No, Chair, I see no members of questions for the panel. Okay, seeing none, uh, this witness panel is now excused. Uh, if you could, please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Kate McCletchy Sheldon, Paul Hobitz, Brendan Sexton, and Ernest Tollerson. Kate McCletchy Sheldon first, followed by Paul Hobitz. Time starts now. Yes. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I just didn't see myself. Okay. Um, all right. right here. So thank you, council members. My name is Kate McClutchy Sheldon, representing the Waterfront Alliance, the leader in waterfront revitalization, climate resilience, and advocacy for the New York, New Jersey Harbor region. The Waterfront Alliance unequivocally supports the Howard Hughes Corporation proposal to develop a mixed use building at 250 Water Street that creates affordable housing in Lower Manhattan Seaport neighborhood and generates much needed funding for the Seaport Museum through the sale of air rights. It is important to recognize the wide support that this project has garnered, including the Landmarks Preservation Commission, which found the project appropriate. Howard Hughes Corporation has conducted extensive outreach to the local community through the Seaport Stakeholder Planning Workshops, which we have participated in. Their commitment to making the redevelopment of 250 Water Street part of an overall plan for district-wide improvements is clear. The Waterfront Alliance is committed to sustainability and mitigating the effects of climate change. We are therefore pleased that the 250 Water Street project will meet or exceed regulatory requirements for resiliency and sustainability and will be certified lead silver at a minimum. 
Importantly, we believe this project will support, um, provide significant and needed funds to the South Street Seaport Museum. The museum would receive sustainable funding as well as new resilient building in order to operate as a world-class institution. And the plan will allow the museum its first ever reliable recurring income stream, helping to put it on sound footing and fulfill its true potential. Waterfront Alliance feels strongly that the South Street Seaport Museum is a critical and important part of the city's past and future, and yet the museum is at a crossroads. We believe this is the right project at the right time for the Seaport, Lower Manhattan, and in New York City. We urge the City Council to support the land use actions necessary to make the development possible. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. It will be Paul Hobitz, followed by Brendan Sexton. Time starts now. Paul Hobitz, I need you to accept the unmute request if you see it. Come back. Why don't we get back to Paul? Yeah, and go to next. the next speaker. We'll go to Brendan Sexton next. Brendan Sexton, who will be followed by Ernest Tollerson. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. My name is Brendan Sexton. I'm a longtime local resident. I'm an urbanist, and I'm chair of the. Hello. Party. Hello. Was there a problem? Yeah, this is Paul Hobitz. Am I allowed to speak? Well, we're going to come right back to you. Okay. Just hold on. Uh, let Brendan uh, finish. So, Sergeant General, if we can just restart the clock. Come Brendan, on. just, yeah, you can start and then we'll go to Paul right after. Okay. Yes. I'm Thank sorry. you again. Hello again. And I am again Brendan Sexton, the chair of trustees, board of trustees at South Street Seaport Museum. Uh, the museum, as some know, has been running most times, or at least much of the time, on fumes ever since Superstorm Sandy and then COVID-19, and we could close. People have to keep that in mind if we are not able to secure necessary funds to keep us up and running. What we do in the next few weeks and months will determine the museum's future forever, whether there is a future. I genuinely believe that this proposal deserves your serious attention and support so that we can together make a bold commitment to historic preservation by investing in the district's historic home and its steward, what Jonathan calls the beating heart of the historic district, your museum, telling about the birth of New York City. Reliable recurring men revenue for the first time will put us on a, put a platform underneath us to help ensure that we will be here and on a more sound footing so that we can more seamlessly weather storms like those of the past 20 years, and so that we will be here to serve New Yorkers and our visitors. We will use the infusion of critical support from this project to stabilize, reopen from a place of strength, open, we want to be open, and then grow. Our focus must be on showcasing our incredible collection, not just our ships, but our photos and maps and art, all telling the story of how the port was critical to the founding of our city and then of America itself, how the port and Lower Manhattan are central to the story of both the transatlantic slave trade and the struggles for freedom, how the businesses in and around the port led to New York City becoming the global financial capital it is today, in short, our city's history. We take our job as steward of the district very seriously, and re the reality is that the museum's well being and its job as steward of our history was the key motive for creating the Seaport District in the first place. And this plan is the best, most appropriate plan to, to uh, achieve that. Please approve this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to our next speaker. Paul Hobitz will speak next. Paul Hobitz will be followed by Ernest Tollerson. Hi, Hi Chairman. Hi, Paul. How are you? <laughs> I'm OK. Chairman Moyer and members of the City Council, Thank you for your service. Uh, unfortunately, I only have audio available. So my name is Paul Hovitz, retired vice chair of CB1, advisory board member of the Downtown Hospital, 
board member of Manhattan Youth, and resident of Southbridge Towers for 37 years. I support the implementation of Howard Hughes' 250 Water Street proposal. Before Prius 17 was rebuilt, the seaport was a ghost town. Howard Hughes brought life, jobs, and renewed activity to our seaport and our community. Eleven years ago, our Spruce Street School was in need of f fundraising. The taste of the seaport was born. Howard Hughes provided funding each year in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now this event includes our Peck Slip School as well. Their community support extends to our Bowery Mission, our hospital, and our South Street Seaport Museum, centerpiece of the historic district. The proposal before us provides for all of the above as the desperately needed affordable housing. Six years ago, Southbridge Towers voted to exit the Mitchell Lamba program for private ownership. This removed 1,650 middle-income affordable housing units from our district. Our children live in a diverse world and need the benefit afforded by that diversity. This 250 Water Street proposal is smart for all parties. It will allow Howard Hughes to move ahead with real planning for the seaport and New York City, resulting in support for our arts, cultural entities, including the Seaport Museum. Howard Hughes has invested a billion dollars in our community. They've shown their I'm intent smart. is tied up with mutual benefit for the locality. We sink or swim together. We allow a partial application of historic air rights within the historic district, gain affordable housing, save the Seaport Museum, and allow it to become a brand new digital age Seaport Museum. I remind those in Save Our Seaport that uh, the Save Our Seaport Museum was the organization we created. Please well, do not kick it to the ground. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna have to wrap it up. Okay, thank you. Um, next and last speaker on this panel will be Ernest Collerson. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Ernest Collerson. I'm on the board of the South Street Seacourt Museum, and I've lived in Lower Manhattan, or what ought to be called New Amsterdam, for 40 years. Uh, without the museum's uh, pierside and landside treasures, New York would have a difficult time unpacking the phenomena, people, and forces that turned a, a sleepy trading outpost into a world city. The museum's assets are what makes the historic district come alive. As a trustee with the fiduciary responsibility to, rebu to, to rebuild the museum's sources of recurring operating revenue, I have a deep and abiding interest in the community benefits fund that would be created if 250 Water Street uh, is developed. Frankly, revenue from any kind of commercial activity within the South Street Seaport Historic District, including revenue from any new land use development, should indeed must provide financial support for the museum and its mission to tell the unvarnished truth, the good and the problematic about the rise of New York from the 1600s until today. As the conscience of your constituents, the city council has the power to resuscitate a bedrock principle of this historic district, which was created after the birth of the museum and was intended to support the museum as the historic district's anchor institution. As the city's legislature, I hope you choose to breathe new life into this foundational principle. Again, capturing new sources of revenue within the historic district to support and advance the museum's mission. If a viable proposal emerges from the EULA process, the museum and affordable housing should be the primary beneficiary of community benefit funds. Those funds will not only ensure that this museum exists to tell the unvarnished truth about New York, it will also prevent the historic enclave from being disfigured by the geography of nowhere. In short, the community benefits fund should prioritize two smart and worthy investments, restoring the financial stability of the South Street Seaport Museum and building affordable housing in a neighborhood that sorely needs it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Chair, yeah, that, uh, that was the last question. Any questions uh, from uh, any of our, my colleagues? 
Oh, Chair, I see no members with questions. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, this witness panel is now excused. If you could please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Linda Roche, Nicole Rossi, Linda Hellstrom, and Aliyah Sumro. First speaker, Linda Roche, followed by Nicole Rossi. Time starts now. We have our first panelist. Hello. I'm I sorry. It's okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you. Hear you? Yep. Where, should, where, where did you, where, where did you last, last hear from me? We just heard Nothing. Entertainment. Nothing. So whenever you're uh, ready. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank okay. you for the update. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in opposition of this application. My name is Linda Roche and I'm a 43 year resident in the Seaport area. I would like to call your attention to the Community Board One six page resolution overwhelmingly opposing this development, setting forth very specific issues and flaws that the community at large also overwhelmingly agrees with. From the beginning, this project has had back office dealings with city officials and city agencies the community was not aware of, which we have, which has, has been borne out by many FOIL requests we received. Um, and, and holding the Seaport Museum hostage with a bribe of money in order to get elected officials on board is disingenuous at best. The brownfield cleanup concerns are very real and a very big problem for the two schools and the residents uh, adjacent to the property. And I would beg you to listen to the parents' concerns because they are real. Uh, I asked the commissioners to think about this historic landmark district and the over 10,000 people who signed their name in opposition to this project, keeping the building to its legal height of 120 feet and make it 100% affordable housing. And the community will thank you for your concern in preserving this 19th century historic district. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next uh, speaker. Nicole Rossi, who will be followed by Linda Hellstrom. Time starts now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Hi, thank you for your time. My name is Nicole Rossi. Uh, I am the vice president of the 265-267 Water Street Co-op Board. I am also the treasurer of the Peck Slip PTA. Uh, I have two small children, uh, Sienna and Luca. They are five and six. They both go to Peck Slip. Um, and we live right down the block from 250 Water Street. Um, I'd like to go on the record regarding, um, regarding 250 Water Street. I'd like to request that the city and building regulators maintain accountability for the projects that they approve. As of now, there appears to be rationale in favor of 250 Water Street because of its ability to provide affordable, affordable housing. Unfortunately, it's my understanding that this affordable housing will come at the cost of possible mercury contamination to residents and to elementary school aged children, including my own of the Seaport area during the time of the proposed construction. There appears to be an inconsistency in the approval processes. Owners applying for glass railings on rooftops, for example, are shut down. And yet approvals of large structures that could check an affordable housing box despite the human cost otherwise is passed with approval. I'd like to provide two anecdotes from this block alone. The Pexlip School, when it was built, was built abutting a historic building. There were many exceptions that were overlooked or allowed. Just this week and by tomorrow, there are 26 families that need to be evacuated from that building because it is no longer structurally sound. Just a few days ago, all, as I said, they've all, they've all been given notice to evacuate. And, uh, hold on, sorry. Um, residents on the entire block are fearful of the, the building's collapse and the health repercussions of, of what could happen. I'm expired. In, okay. Please vote this loud. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Linda Hellstrom, 
who will be followed by Aaliyah, Aaliyah Sumro. Time starts now. Can you hear me? I think I'm, I have an echo. Uh, well, Linda, you may have uh, you may have two devices going on at the same time, your phone or your- uh, oh, I wasn't sure I was going to call in and then- Oh, um, take one off, so Linda. I do? I take one off, yeah. One off, so I need to mute it. Okay. Now you have to log off of, of, of either the, the computer or get up uh, the, the phone, one or the other. Okay. Is that better? That's, that's better? better, Linda. Okay. I'm Linda Hellstrom. Um, I live on Water Street. Just because a Howard Hughes promised a donation to Gail Brewer and Margaret Chin's favorite charity and a small number of units of affordable housing that will likely never be built, one corporation is then allowed to break rules that everyone else who builds in the seaport has had to follow. Elected officials, why aren't you asking Howard Hughes is purposely letting things run down around the parking lot? Demanding that HHC clean up the trash and piles of shards of broken glass on the corner of the Peck Slip School Street. Howard Hughes is rushing to dig by January. 1,200 truckloads of soil containing thermometer mercury and, gar and garage oil will be removed. Beep, 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 beep from backing trucks loaded with toxic soil all day long with kids and teachers sitting in COVID mandating open classroom, open window classrooms. You should be actively working to prevent HHD from breaking ground during school sessions. Our granddaughter. Did we lose? We seem to have lost Linda Hellstrom. Yep. Okay. Um, Linda, you can always submit your testimony. Um, we have it already. Is here that she's back. Linda, if you're back, you want to unmute yourself. You got um, to accept the unmute request. Okay. Um, our granddaughter attends Peck Slip School, built with the expectation that zoning rules would be followed. And as of right building, 120 feet tall. That only takes one year to build. This monster tower, 200 feet over zoning, that actually looks like a replica of Creedmoor Hospital, will take over five years to build. Five years of dust, pile driving, clanking steel, and beeping trucks rumbling all day long during six hours of the school day for 200 kids, some of them for their whole elementary school career. You, the city council members who vote on this, should be out demanding that this process stop until we have safe answers about the toxins. We are not a divided community. Far from it. We are hundreds who live directly next to the site and thousands who live in the district. Don't turn your backs on the 800 children, okay. teachers, families, and elderly Thank you, Linda. Thank you for your testimony today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Aliyah Sumro. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Ali Asumro, and I'm the Menipace Fellow in Land Use Law at the Municipal Arts Society of New York. From a policy perspective, MAS is fundamentally opposed to allowing the transfer of city-owned development rights to a private party without clear disclosure of what agencies, institutions, and projects ultimately benefit. In the case of 250 Water Street, the full array of project benefits, the scope of each individual benefit, and the reliability of them remains obscure. The original intent of the Seaport Subdistrict was to ensure that development rights transfers benefit the South Street Seaport Museum, not a city agency or private developer. We continue to support the intent of the 2003 rezoning and maintain that the city's historic zoning policy for the seaport be respected. MAS would support an appropriately scaled development at 250 Water Street, 
while transferring the balance of development rights outside the Seaport Historic District. MAS maintains that the city must disclose the development rights value and the legal process of facilitating the development rights transfer. Without this disclosure, the public does not have the information to evaluate whether the proposal can be fully executed as planned and publicly discussed. Regarding the museum funding, as of today, HHC has not provided the public any details about the museum funding proposal. At this point, there is no guarantee that the original 50 million will be offered to the Seaport Museum. MAS stands firm in that details of the funding mechanism must be finalized before this project can be approved. MAS recognizes the importance of developing 250 Water Street, especially since the site has remained a vacant parking lot for decades, as well as building affordable housing in a high opportunity and transit rich area. However, we strongly urge the principles embodied in the city's zoning policy for more than 40 years be respected. If permitted, this proposal would significantly depart from the city's zoning intent and may subsequently be a negative precedent for a historic district citywide. We urge the council to reject this application. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. That was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Um, any questions from my colleagues? Uh, no, Chair, I see no members with questions. Okay. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, and if you can, please call up the next panel. Next panel will include Anne Beaumont, Neil Flaherty, Jay Jacobson, and Susan Murray. First, we will hear from Anne Beaumont, followed by Neil Flaherty. Clock is ready. My name is Ann Beaumont and I've lived on Pearl Street, one block from 250 Water Street for 11 years and I've been a volunteer at the South Street Seaport Museum for 15 years. Save Our Seaport was founded in my living room. I am pleased to speak in support of the proposal before the subcommittee today. The beating living heart of our neighborhood is the South Street Seaport Museum and its ships are iconic symbols of New York and its history. And the museum is much more than its ships. It's care, it cares for thousands of artifacts and preserve some of the oldest buildings in the city, including Skirmerhorn Row, the original World Trade Center. The museum's work is hard and expensive, and it's also important and worthwhile. With so many obligations and a slate of bad luck that runs from September 11th through to Hurricane Sandy in 2012, it's not a surprise that the museum would be back on its heels, even though it has done all the right things. But COVID has been a step too far. The investment in the museum included in this proposal is a critical lifeline that will allow the museum to plan for the future from a place of financial strength. The choice is simple, either we build on an unhistoric parking lot and save the cultural anchor of our neighborhood, or do we do nothing and lose that anchor, that invaluable landmark forever. That's the choice and there are no viable alternatives to the proposal before you today. The reasons to approve the proposal are compelling and significant and I hope you'll support it. The reasons given not to build the proposed building are neither and they are merely reasons never to build any building ever. Construction is disruptive. That's a fact of life with any construction and yet we build new buildings in the city all the time. Another complaint is that about the Brownfields cleanup, which is adjacent to two schools, not to mention hundreds of homes, including mine. It's high time to do the cleanup and it's unfathomable to me that any parent honestly wants their child to go to school across from an unremediated toxic waste site for a day longer than necessary. Time is short, so I won't attempt to revisit all of the complaints about the proposal, but I will simply close by asking you to support it. The time has come to build at 250 Water Street. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Neil Flaherty, who will be followed by Jay Jacobson. Clock is ready. My name is Neil Flaherty, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this plan that will enhance the district, provide jobs, increase affordable housing, and sorely needed financial support to the South Street Seaport Museum. I've been a part of this community since I began working in the financial district in 1967 and started volunteering at the Seaport Museum in 1981. This museum is more than just about ships. It connects us to our city's history and the people who built it. The ships are an incredible asset for our city, but so are the rest of its collections, the maps and historic artifacts, not to mention the bygone skills and culture it keeps alive. 
The museum is critical to the district. It attracts visitors from all over the world, and this tourism provides the lifeblood to many of the district's small businesses. This project will provide the financial stability that the museum needs and deserves. This project will allow the museum to continue its mission of educating the public and the stewardship of the seaport environment. The project is not a detriment. Instead, it will provide a great boost to the district that the existing parking lot has not and certainly will not in the future. The project will add affordable housing, something the community has been in need of for decades. It will also provide jobs and will add new life to our streets, supporting our small businesses, eateries, and cultural institutions. If I have to choose between a parking lot and no museum, or a multi-use building and a vibrant seaport museum that future generations can experience, I choose the latter every time. This project will provide the financial stability that the museum needs and deserves. I ask you to support it and the South Street Seaport Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, speaker. Jay Jacobson, who will be followed by Susan Murray. Clock is ready. My name is Jay Jacobson. I am a lifelong New Yorker and have volunteered. Start my video. How does that work? Okay. I have volunteered at the museum for about 40 years. It's a heck of a place and it really is terrific to have as part of the city of New York. We have got in New York an abundance of museums. We have great museums for the arts. We have great museums for natural history, but the Seaport Museum is a great museum for the city and to tell the tale of the people who have worked in the city and built it to the metropolis that we are today. We have suffered setbacks at the museum. 9-11 knocked it off its feet for two years. The financial crisis of 2008 hit the museum hard and Sandy hit it a hell of a lot harder. But doing nothing about it and not standing up for it at this point is giving up. The redevelopment of 250 Water Street by the Howard Hughes Corporation and the commitment to both units of affordable housing and to investing in the museum is, as I understand it, the plan that is a combination of creative corporate capitalism and a contribution to the cultural capital of New York. Let's do it, let's get it done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next panel, uh, next uh, speaker, please. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Susan Murray. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Susan Murray. I am a proud South Street Seaport Museum volunteer and an advocate for the Seaport Historic District. I support the 250 Water Street proposal because it will further the legacy of the Seaport and the preservation of New York City's most unique and important neighborhood. I grew up in a working class family, but I was fortunate to have a mom who brought me and my siblings to just about every New York City cultural or historical site we could reach by foot or mass transit. I am truly thankful that the historic district was founded 50 years ago, and it's still here for families today. But as a volunteer since the early 1980s, I know the museum has had its share of ups and downs. I saw the physical and financial impact Hurricane Sandy had on the entire neighborhood. Of course, now we're dealing with COVID-19. This proposal will give our community members not only stability, but the ability to thrive. The much needed investment in affordable housing will bring socioeconomic diversity and re-energize small businesses and local institutions. I often hear about New York's strength and resilience. Just think what new jobs and retail stores will do for economic resilience. And think about how the building's base facade will blend in with and beautify the district compared to the current parking lot, which doesn't blend into anything or inspire anyone to consider New York's history. The environmental benefit will be cleaning up something no neighborhood wants, a brownfield site. 
As for zoning, this is a unique situation for an historic district, but this project offers a unique opportunity. Now is the time to invest in communities like the seaport. This project is exactly the kind of project New Yorkers need to advance to a better future while staying connected to our past. I strongly urge you to approve this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. At the last, Susan Murray was the last speaker on this panel. Chair. Okay. Um, that being the last speaker and seeing uh, no members uh, with questions. I uh, this, oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember Chin has a hand up. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, thank this panel. I mean, the volunteers that's been volunteering for so many years. And I know that you have worked hard to support and save the museum. And I, I also wanted, um, you know, and from your testimony, you live right there. I mean, it is unconscionable for people to think that we would allow anything to harm our children and our neighbors. You know, we've worked through this whole, you know, process with the State Department of Health, the oversight agency from the state that oversight, you know, the brownfield cleanup, we advocated for an independent monitor. Me and my staff have been meeting with parents, principal, community members. You know, we believe in the health and safety of the resident and of our children. And that's gonna continue. There will be monitoring on the site, even the city council. I introduced, legis I introduced legislation to even provide more oversight on mercury cleanup. So I just wanted to get that on the record that my staff have been so committed and myself working on this issue and working with Howard Hughes, make sure that oversight are in place. So, and going forward, it's so important as all the people who testify, the museum is the one that created the historic district. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Look, the mechanism, how to get the money to the museum, we are still working on it to make sure the museum gets every dollar that they deserve. And we will get that done before we vote in the city council. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the time. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilwoman. Um, so uh, that being uh, it for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. And if you could call up the next panel, please. Next panel will include Grace Lee. Grace Lee. Time starts now. Hi, is there a way to turn on my video? No? Okay. Everyone can hear me? Yep. Hello, my name is Grace Lee. I'm a Lower Manhattan resident and a mother of three children who have attended school for nearly a decade at the Blue School just steps away from 250 Water Street. I am entirely offended by other people in this community telling parents how they should feel about a toxic waste site in front of their children's school. Every day I walk by there with my two-year-old, three-year-old child, and I have to worry about whether they can go to school safely. I stand in strong opposition to this development because it is a threat to our kids and our community. The South Street Seaport neighborhood is angered by two schools that are home to over 800 children. You don't have to be an engineer to know that years of construction of this outsized, out of scale luxury building will undoubtedly impact those schools. The work from this project will rob our children of an outdoor play space for six years, which is entire and elementary school career. Our kids have spent nearly two years shut inside our apartments due to this pandemic, which might get worse before it gets better. These kids need to be in school, have safe places to play, but no one can tell us how do they expect these kids to learn safely. And as we continue to battle COVID, we want to ensure our unvaccinated kids are back in classrooms that are safe and ventilated. How are teachers supposed to open the windows to dust and noise, which jeopardize not just the health and safety of our children, but also their ability to focus in a quiet learning environment? Neither do the developer nor the electeds have give us any, given us any answers on this. I am tired of our kids being viewed as collateral damage to this pandemic and now to this development. We cannot put a price tag on the health and safety of our children. Howard Hughes already showed indifference when they told our group of moms not to worry that there was only a little bit of mercury on the site. We as mothers had to go to the archives and discovered that the site had been a thermometer factory and that it presented more danger than Howard Hughes initially wanted to acknowledge. 
As recently as last month, Howard Hughes' engineer attempted to mislead the public by saying no mercury vapor was found on the site when it in fact was detected in multiple areas of the lot. So now as parents, Time. we have to ask ourselves, what else don't we know about? What else doesn't Howard Hughes want to acknowledge? We want our children to be safe and there is nothing, not even a museum that is worth our children's health. I ask you to vote no. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, next speaker, please. Uh, that was the last speaker on this panel, Mr. Chair. Okay, seeing um, no questions from uh, my colleagues, uh, this panel is, uh, this witness panel is now excused. If you can call up the next panel, please. Next panel will include Christina Rakos, Louis Coletti, Terrence Cullen, and Angkor Dalal. Christina Rakos will speak first, followed by Louis Coletti. Time starts. Hi. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, committee members. My name is Christina Rocco's, uh, mother, business owner, wife, and huge fan of my neighborhood for almost 15 years. Um, this subcommittee has the advantage of already knowing what happens if the Howard Hughes Corporation proposal to develop 250 Water Street fails to pass. An empty eyesore of a lot sitting underutilized for perhaps another 50 years never properly cleaned up, more blight. And for what? We've been over and over the pros and cons of building at the edge of the historic district. The Landmarks Commission were careful and exacting in what this type of construction needed to be. And Howard Hughes listened and responded. The anti-progress folks are well-organized and loud, but please do not mistake their noise as representing the majority of affected residents. This mixed use building design offers so much to the community. Desperately needed housing included eight, including 80 units of affordable housing and new jobs for area residents. And that's setting aside the side benefits of an influx of cash to save the Seaport Museum. That would be great, but it's not what drew my family to the area. Instead, the five of us are here for the excitement and beauty of the seaport, its restaurants and its stores, and lately the many cultural offerings at Pier 17. The transformation of Pier 17 by HH HHC has been a massive success. If you haven't actually been to the seaport lately, you really need to see the new life it has breathed into what was once an ugly underused mall. In conclusion, I urge you to allow the very important cleanup of 250 Water Street to begin and be a part of the positive and exciting transformation of Lower Manhattan. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker. Louis Coletti will be followed by Terrence Cullen. Time starts. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, Chairman Moy and member of the council, uh, I wanna thank you for this opportunity uh, to give testimony on this subject and also to thank you for continuing to do the city's business during these very difficult times. Uh, I couldn't have said it any better than Councilwoman Chin did. I'm glad she said it and I fully agree with everything she said. Uh, we are here obviously, and I shouldn't say obviously, to offer 100% uh, support to this project. This project uh, has gone through one of our more extensive review processes and change in scope um, to meet the community's needs that I've seen in a long, long time. And that's a credit to you, uh, a credit to Howard Hughes Corporation. And, and, and this is a badly needed project um, on a parking lot that has been such an unseemly gap in our city's urban fabric for over 50 years. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a little bit of a different attack and focus on the economics because um, I, I think you've had a, a number of people testify about the benefits of the project. Um, it's time to get the city moving again, okay? According to the uh, New York City Independent Budget Office, here are some staggering numbers. Here's what COVID has cost us in over a year and a half. $9.8 billion in construction activity, 74,000 jobs, $5.5 billion in total wages, and 8.3% 8, 8 in, in commercial rent mortgage recording taxes. We need to get this city moving. My members 
I represent 1,200 union contractors um, who have the largest number of minority and women-owned contractors who are looking for work in the state of New York. We employ the 100,000 members of the building trade unions who are 55% minority uh, and women, and we need work. And this is a project whose scope and scale make absolute sense for the future of New York City. Time. I'm done. Well, you can you can wrap up. I'll give you time to wrap up. Okay. Let me say. Let me wrap up and say this. Uh, back in 1998, the City Council did a report called "Hollow in the Middle: The Rise and Fall of the New York City Middle Class." And 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 the genesis of that report, the main uh, the main summary was that we had more less people in the New York City middle class in 1998 than we did in 1977. Well, today I would suggest to you that that hole in the middle is a crater. And the construction industry represents the opportunity to give all those New Yorkers, 43% who don't have high school degrees, opportunities to work in a project that makes sense for the community and for the city of New York. I strongly urge you to approve Thank you. this project. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Terrence Cullen, who will be followed by Ankur Dalal. Time starts. Good afternoon, Chair Moya, Council Member Chin. Uh, my name is Terrence Cullen. I am the Communications Director for the New York Building Congress. On behalf of the Building Congress, we support the HHC proposal for 250 Water Street. At a pivotal time in our city, this project to provide affordable housing, create jobs, and boost economic activity is critical. Since our founding in 1921, the Building Congress has advocated for investment in infrastructure, pursued job creation, and promoted preservation and growth in the New York City area. Our association is made up of over 550 organizations comprised of more than 250,000 professionals. Through our members, events, and various committees, we seek to address the critical issues of the building industry and promote the economic and social advancement of our city and its residents. As a 100-year-old organization, the Building Congress celebrates the lasting impact of the past on today's urban fabric. We appreciate how the project will complete the pro prominent street, excuse me, streetscape by transforming a parking lot into a contextually appropriate mixed-use development and how funding for the South Street Seaport Museum will restore the heart of this historic district. Moreover, HHC has addressed community concerns related to the height and massing. The current proposal creates a seamless transition between the more modern tall structures lining a wide Pearl Street and the historic buildings on the narrower water and Beekman streets. The transfer of air rights will also ensure a low rise waterfront for the neighborhood. Lastly, with our city at a critical economic moment, this project will create at least 80 affordable housing units for extremely and very low income New Yorkers, generate $850 million in economic activity and support approximately 1,600 construction jobs and 1,700 permanent jobs in the commercial, retail, and nonprofit sectors. The Building Congress proudly supports this proposal and urges the committee to advance 250 Water Street. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Ankur Dalal. I'm Sarge. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak in favor of this project today. I support this project because it will produce hundreds of new homes in the neighborhood, including many affordable homes that are desperately needed in this part of the city. The proposed development is located in Manhattan CB1, which has lost thousands of affordable homes this past decade. In 2014, the Southbridge Towers, located across the street from 250 Water, voted to exit the Mitchellama Affordable Housing Program, removing over 1,600 affordable homes from the neighborhood. Today, we have an opportunity to begin to correct this wrong. While one building can't support 1,600 new affordable apartments, it is a start. I hope the council understands that some of the opponents to this project from whom we heard earlier today are simply trying to protect their property values. Leading members of the Seaport Coalition and Save Our Seaport own apartments, the views of which would be affected by 250 Water Street. And the president of the board of an adjacent building that's pushing to preserve the lot as is wrote a letter asking residents to oppose this building because it would, quote, decrease property values for units that face the East River. What's particularly troubling to me is that some of the neighbors who oppose this project live in the newly privatized Mitchellama buildings. When they needed affordable homes, the government helped these folks. Now some of these folks are trying to pull the ladder up behind them in the face of a proposal to create new affordable homes in the neighborhood. 
The city should not stop reasonable development on a parking lot that will fund a museum, create jobs, and build affordable homes for New Yorkers. I urge you to support the project. Finally, I'd like to personally thank Council Member Chin, her leadership on this project, the Elizabeth Street Haven Green project, and the Soho rezoning shows a commitment to creating new homes for New, York New Yorkers, including homes for immigrant families like mine, even when it would be politically easier to capitulate to local NIMBYs. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is, was that the last speaker? Yes. Um, great. Uh, seeing um, none of my colleagues have questions for this panel, the panel is now excused. Uh, and if you can, please call the next panel. Thank you. The next panel will include Jay Hellstrom. Jay Hellstrom. Time starts. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Jay. Thank you very much. I'm Jay Hellstrom, and I want to assure you I'm not a NIMBY, and I am for building. And I dislike being called various things without my ability just to speak to those. But that given the fact, the Seaport needs your attention and commitment to turn down this project. You can, right now, preserve our historic district, a cultural and economic engine where we in the world can see the birthplace of modern New York City. Or you can open the floodgates to a magnitude of variances, contrived street abandonments, and dubious precedents. For what? Just another luxury, generic tower with no legal commitment for affordable units, and that will start the, and jumpstart the demise of the historic Seaport District. Already we in our neighborhood is my community anticipate uh, are seeing the anticipation of breaking this road. Water through this row of 18 and 19th century buildings in their true setting, not in a sad uh, museum state, but in the actual real. It's showing a sad glimpse into the future of its demise. Two large build, abandoned buildings on each corner of Water Street, my block, recently put on the market have just been left to run down with broken windows, graffiti, just waiting to be developed by maybe many, many stories higher just as 250 Water Street is seeking approval. And who testified at HHC for each of these hearings? Four downtown developers. Gail Brewer and Mark, Margaret Chin try to save a museum but risk ruining the historic museum that's supposed to be its steward. This in league with the Howard Hughes Corporation who lied about making a $50 million donation to save the museum. While basking in applause for being so generous, they invented a scheme to get the city to give the money. But HHC says the museum won't get any money unless their demands are met with a variance of two or four feet Time. over 140. And I say for years, the historic Division is just another ordinary bunch of tall billings if you approve this. So don't cast your vote for Howard Hughes and more greed and for their billionaire. Please turn down this transition. Thank you. Okay, Chair, that was the last speaker on this panel. I see no members with questions uh, for this panel. We will now hear from the next panel, which will include Denny Salas, Roland Lewis, Jill Poklemba, and Elizabeth Kerr. The first speaker will be Denny Salas, followed by Roland Lewis. Time starts. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Denny Salas, and I ask this committee to support this housing project on the basis of how it, will, how it will positively affect working class families. Building affordable homes in this wealthy neighborhood will provide access to good schools and economic opportunities that are otherwise non-existent in many of our poor communities. The increased socioeconomic diversity will allow families and their children to learn from those who may be better off and access resources that are typically unavailable to them, as several studies and my personal experience have shown. 
in our city, the chance to, to succeed is often dictated by where a child lays their head at night. And I urge this council to see the opportunity for some of these families and support the 250 Water Street project. On a side note, opponents attacking the personal character of council members of color borderline on traditional racist tropes. Council member Chin, you have done an excellent job supporting affordable housing projects throughout this district during your tenure. Your legacy is one of helping working class families and is commendable and to be mimicked. Thank you for your time, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. The next speaker on this panel will be Roland Lewis, followed by Jill Poklemba. Roland Lewis. Time starts. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, committee. Uh, good to see y'all. Um, I'm a strong proponent, I'm speaking as a private citizen, strong proponent of this uh, uh, development at 250 Water Street. I think it's an important uh, contribution to ensure the longevity of the South Street Museum, important for the South Street District in downtown Manhattan, and important for the entire city of New York. I have a couple of uh, unique characteristics, uh, uh, qualifications for my testimony. I, for 10 years, I had a, a good fortune of working in the South Street Seaport District, but I had also the slight misfortune of staring at that vacant lot or the parking lot for 10 years too. Um, this building as designed is, will be a vast, vast improvement for that area. Um, and as some of you may know, uh, as I led uh, for 13 years, the Waterfront Alliance, again, I'm speaking now as a private citizen, um, we fought the Howard Hughes Corporation over an ill-conceived uh, project at the Tin Building in the river. And we defeated them, actually. They, they, that building is not going to be built. But uh, this is, a, as you heard from my former colleague earlier in the testimony, this is a very different building, a different time, and much, much to uh, commend it for, uh, for your approval. And finally, uh, as uh, my good friend Margaret Chen uh, will remember, uh, I was a housing advocate and housing developer for many years, as she was too. And I can't uh, emphasize enough uh, on the resiliency and the economic development and all the other good things, the affordable housing for downtown New York is so important. Southbridge Towers uh, uh, went sort of quasi-private. That Mitchell-Lama is no longer a, uh, um, a part of the affordable housing mix. We need more affordable housing in the city of New York. We need more, especially in downtown, which has become kind of a wealthy enclave. So I, I again, I, I urge the council to approve this uh, project and thank you very much for your time. The next speaker on this panel will be Jill Poklemba. Jill Poklemba, who will be followed by Elizabeth Kerr. Time starts. Hi, my name is Jill Poklemba. Um, I'm a senior director at New York Harm Reduction Educators. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of our organization as well as our executive director, Sam Rivera. Uh, we are in the process of merging with another nonprofit organization um, to be called One Organization uh, On Point. And we connect medically underserved residents of Manhattan to harm reduction services, um, specifically to address the opioid crisis, um, as well as the crises of homelessness and incarceration. Um, we, although we are located in Upper Manhattan, we serve residents of all parts of Manhattan, including, including the Lower East Side, Chinatown and the financial district. Our executive director, Sam Rivera, was born and raised on the Lower East Side um, and has deep roots and deep connections to the Lower East Side community. He also has a close friendship with the actor, Louis Guzman, uh, who was actually involved in advocating for affordable housing going back to the 1970s in the Seaport District. Um, and the two of them strongly support this project as well as our organization. Um, we believe it will be a strong community-based project that will create opportunities for people in Lower Manhattan and in the neighborhood where they both grew up. We strongly support this proposal and know how important it is to create affordable housing for residents of Manhattan. Before he became executive director last year, Sam Rivera was associate vice president of the Fortune Society, um, where I also worked as well. It is a reentry organization that owns two housing facilities in Upper Manhattan. 
um, one of which was a mixed use supportive and affordable housing facility that gave us the opportunity to see the impacts, the positive impacts that facilities like this can have on the entire neighborhood. And New York City definitely needs more projects like this. We've also had the opportunity to participate in events in collaboration with the Howard Hughes Corporation and have seen firsthand the positive impact it has on other charitable organizations. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Elizabeth Kerr. Doc is ready. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for giving us the time to, uh, to speak and address you all. Uh, it's going to be a long afternoon, and I know a lot of people have very passionate positions to present, so I will attempt to be brief. Uh, while I am in support of the development at 250 Water Street, both in terms of the architectural, housing, and economic possibilities, I'm speaking primarily as a longtime volunteer at the South Street Seaport Museum, and I strongly support this proposal in that it will secure the future of this vital institution. The museum is one of the things that brings people to the Seaport District beyond simple commerce and entertainment. It offers an absolutely unique perspective on the mercantile history of the city, the power that built the city that it is now and that we all love and want to see continue with all the health and economic viability it can. It offers uh, visitors an absolutely unique perspective on the city, on its history, on its waterfront even, which is something most of us don't have the opportunity to pay enough attention to. In short, um, I am very hopeful that this proposal will be passed and that as part of this exciting, innovative development uh, in, the, in the neighborhood, the, the future of the museum will be secured and its many offerings uh, preserved for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, that being the last panelist uh, and seeing no questions from uh, my colleagues, uh, this, this witness panel is now uh, excused. If you can please call up the next panel, please. The next panel will include Bob Tierney, Mark Bozik, Nelson Chan, and Richard Dickema. The first speaker on the panel will be Bob Tierney, followed by Mark Bozik. And Mr. Chair, if I could just make a brief logistical announcement uh, for anyone who is currently logged into the meeting uh, and wishing to testify, you are required to register online uh, in advance at the New York City Council's website. Uh, the website is www.council.nyc.gov forward slash land use. Uh, again, uh, if you intend to testify uh, at this hearing, we need you to register uh, online at that website. And uh, now we'll go to the first speaker, Bob Tierney. Clock is ready. Unmute. Can you all hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. And to the uh, chair of the subcommittee, Chair Moya, to Margaret Chin, who I worked with for 12 long years, 12 great years as chairman of the Landmarks Commission from the year 2002 on. And I'm here on my own behalf today because I believe deeply in the importance of the South Street Seaport Museum and it's inextricably entwined to the historic district. Both will be saved in my opinion and stabilized for the future by approval by this subcommittee and the full council of the proposals, the that have gone through an exhaustive public process. It's multiple city agencies with multiple public, much public input. Uh, my specific focus really for obvious reasons was to look very carefully at the preservation issues. And I did, I went into them in great depth, look to be careful that no, nothing was done here that was of course inappropriate or that would in any way be a a bad precedent for other historic districts. Luckily, in both counts, this came out totally with flying approval and flying colors. Uh, this is a 50 year, this parking lot has been here for 50 years. We can have the opportunity of building on it in an appropriate way as the commission has found, Landmarks Commission has found with no demolition 
it's a dream come true in a way. No demolition, a new site, nothing is harmed, no historic fabric is touched. And what do we get in response, or what do we get after all is said and done? A viable historic museum and an incredibly important viable historic district. So I'd like to thank again, Margaret Chin for all of her support over the years, my dozen years or more uh, in public service and thank this committee for doing its work on this important project. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Mark Bozek, who will be followed by Nelson Chan. Clock is ready. Hi, um, uh, good afternoon um, and thank you all. As a New Yorker, since I was uh, 18 years old, I could not be happier seeing how dedicated and caring HHC has been in revitalizing this incredibly revitalized neighborhood. And this past September 11th, we opened the Experience the Times of Bill Cunningham exhibit in the former Abercrombie and Fitch store, creating an immersive exhibit based on a documentary film I made about New York Times photographer Bill Cunningham. And we've had 7,000 people over here um, visit the seaport in the last uh, six weeks. Now the plug is over. Uh, in the past three months, I've spent nearly every night and day at the seaport, staying at a hotel a few blocks north on Pearl Street. I leave the hotel at 5 a.m. every morning and have to pass by the 250 Water Street parking lot. Given all the care and new beauty that has been brought to the seaport, passing the parking lot reminds one of looking for parking in the Bronx for a Yankee game. It is also the location that I completely avoid at that time of the morning and I cross the street. The tired notion that a big bad Texas corporation and a billionaire investor is coming in with no respect or understanding of the existing beauty is just pain, plain baloney. The number of people that have come to the seaport in these last two months that I've interacted with, more than half who have not been here since getting drunk in the 80s and smelling the fish market at the smelly Pier 17, have been absolutely blown away by how the seaport has changed for the better. A historic district does not mean a hysterical district with out of date and bogus complaints about toxic dirt and fear mongering that anyone these days or ever would put any child at harm. A historic district cannot become hysterical. I resoundingly support the 250 Water Street project and see its future as a final jewel into the seaport to what is otherwise a tawdry, dirty parking lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Nelson Chan who will be followed by Richard Dykema. Clock is ready. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the City Council. My name is Nelson Chan, a lifelong New Yorker born and raised in the Lower East Side and currently the Director of Affordable Housing at Haffey Downtown Manhattan Community Development Corporation. My passion and our mission is to ensure that immigrant New Yorkers and low-income communities of color can continue to live in the neighborhoods that they built, that they helped build. Chinatown and the Lower East Side and all of Lower Manhattan are in the midst of an affordable housing crisis that has only grown more dire during COVID. It is for this reason I'm here to testify today in support of 250 Water Street a project that will create 50 or more uh, units of deeply affordable housing in Community Board 1, where a very small number of affordable units have been created in recent decades. The project now is sized to more appropriate levels for the area, making it contextual with the surrounding community. The development is also a positive catalyst for economic development and job creation in the neighborhood. But for me, what's exciting about this plan is again, the creation of 80 units of affordable housing, permanent affordable housing at 40% of area median income or below. And this is incre incredibly unusual in today's market and especially important in CB1. As an affordable housing advocate, my hope is that the project's permanent affordable units will have a community preference and even a NYCHA preference. I'm also advocating for the inclusion of social service staff to provide adequate support for the tenant body as well. Our community has been devastated by the pandemic and is in desperate need of affordable housing, good jobs and supportive services. This project can be a big step towards the recovery of lower Manhattan. Again, I am very supportive of this project and urge the city council to support as well. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, the next panelist, please. Richard Dykema will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Box ready. Okay, try it again. My name is Richard Dykema. I'm a resident of the Fulton Seaport neighborhood. I'm in the Seaport District multiple times a week. Uh, I applaud the Howard Hughes Corporation for what they've done so far. And uh, I appreciate the proposal that they've made uh, for housing, which New York City desperately needs. Um, you can always argue against any housing proposal on the basis of that it's gonna create more density and there's gonna be construction. That's just the nature of having more housing. But if you don't have those things, you don't have more housing. And this is a great proposal uh, and the city council should, uh, should support many more proposals like that. The uh, current ugly parking lot does nothing to enhance the historic district. Uh, whereas the proposal will bring in more people, will bring in more customers to the Seaboard District that makes it viable financially, and that will also uh, help the reopening of the Seaport Museum. And so I, I thank the council members for their service and uh, ask the council and the subcommittee to approve the uh, project as submitted. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, seeing that there is no questions uh, from uh, my colleagues, um, this uh, witness panel is now excused and I'm gonna turn it over to our council for a uh, brief announcement. Thank you, Chair. I just wanna make a quick reminder to all those uh, listening. If you have successfully registered and you are waiting for your turn to testify, we will, uh, we will get to you. Um, so we ask that you please just be patient and do not use the raise hand function. Similarly, if you have already testified, there is no reason to use the raise hand function. Uh, thank you for your participation. The next panel will include Christopher Marte, Colleen Robinson, and David Sheldon. Christopher Marte. Clock is ready. Hi, Chris, can Hi. you? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, thank you for hosting this committee, uh, Councilmember Moya. Um, one thing I, I, I really reject the uh, text amendment that's happening here with 250 Water Street. The main reason is the demapping of streets. The city, if approves this rezoning of 250 Water Street, it did not learn his lesson from what happened in Hudson Yards, where we have one developer who will go by any means to get the development they want. And that's what Harry Hughes is doing now with demapping of streets and transferring of air rights, which I believe is an illegal transaction that's happening within a historic district. This is gonna to continue to set a terrible precedent for historic districts and protected areas throughout this city. So I ask you and the rest of the committee to vote no on this proposal and I'll follow up with a more thorough testimony. Thank you again. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Um, can we please call up the next uh, speaker? Colleen Robinson, who will be followed by David Sheldon. Clock is ready. Hi. Can you hear me now? Sorry. We can hear you. Hi. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, my name is Colleen Robertson. I'm sorry I'm outside waiting to pick up my kids from tech slip school in five minutes. Um, so I don't have my video on and it might be a little bit loud. I am uh, the PTA co-president at tech slip. I have two little boys, a kindergartner and second grader. Um, I have been PTA co-president for the past two years and I've been trying with our principal to get a meeting to ensure the safeguards be put in place um, and no one seems to be listening. It's very, very upsetting. Um, please do not approve this right now. Um, please make sure the health and safety of our children is ensured. 
this construction is going to be so damaging to them. I was a teacher um, for 12 years over at PS89 when there was construction happening in Battery Park City and firsthand saw kids breaking down and unable to learn because of the pile driving, because of the noise pollution. It, it, this just cannot happen. Um, and thank you for your time. Lastly, I, I just want to say I find it so offensive, as do others, that Chair Moya is posting on Twitter during a hearing about a development that is threatening the health and safety of our children. Daily, my seven-year-old asks if we've been able to stop Howard Hughes from taking their play street. This is all so heartbreaking, as you can probably hear from my voice, trying not to cry. So thank you so much. Please do not approve this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. You can please call up the next uh, speaker. Next and last speaker on this panel will be David Sheldon. Mark is ready. In Okay. David, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is David Sheldon. Thank you for this opportunity to, to testify. I have been a volunteer at the South Street Seaport Museum for 20 years. In fact, I was part of that meeting in Ann Beaumont's living room when Save Our Seaport was founded. And I have continued to be an active member of Save Our Seaport ever since. And continued in that capacity to advocate uh, for the South Street Seaport Museum. And I couldn't agree more that it is something that we must save, we must preserve, and that it is in fact the beating heart of that district. So where's the $50 million? We have heard about this, this bonus since this project hit the ground, and yet we have never seen anything made concrete or viable. It's still under discussion. We're still working on it. I hear these quotes every day, and yet I do not see this money. It is instead a diversion and frankly, and it makes me heart sick, a tool to suborn the resources of the museum. That doesn't stop me from volunteering and it doesn't stop me from wanting to see that museum thrive. I wanna say something about views. Are we thinking for a moment that the Howard Hughes Corporation will not be using the views from its tower as a selling point and yet somehow the rest of us aren't allowed to even talk about it. And as a point of fact, frankly, most apartments in Southbridge Towers don't have a view in question anyway. I wanna close with one moment. Um, I was able to have dinner with two friends of mine who I used to sail with at the seaport. They'd been away for quite some time and they went down to the seaport and they came back and over dinner they said, good Lord, that place has gotten really pricey. So let's think about that when we think about affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, there being no questions um, by my colleagues, uh, this witness panel is now excused. And council, please call up your next panel. Next panel will include Kim Boosie, William Thomas, James Kaplan, and Aaron Singh. Kim Boosie will speak first, and then William Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Kim Busey, and I am a long-term resident of Lower Manhattan and specifically the Seaport uh, District. I raised my family here, and I've been a resident for over 20 years. I'm also trained as a physician, and I'm a K-12 school leader, leader for children with um, various disabilities. I strongly support the HHC proposal. First, the project is needed and is needed now. In a time of deep economic need and vast uncertainty, New York City needs economic development urgently. This project can begin construction only a few months from now if it is approved and allowed to move forward. Now, when it is needed. Jobs, customers, visitors, we need them now. And the, the value of the affordable housing cannot be overstated. Second, I believe this project is safe. If done correctly, construction is at worst disruptive, but neither physically or mentally harmful. I have confidence in the safety plan, this team's proven ability to run a safe construction site sensitive to our community's needs and for the oversight provided by various governmental organizations that I trust, including Margaret Chin. 
Third, the project's design is deeply respectful of this historical neighborhood and concerns raised were responded to multiple times over very long periods of time. The land use actions and air rights transfer are necessary to get this done. You know, of course, HHC is a developer. I've become convinced that they are one of the good ones. Um, their investment in our neighborhood has made this area believable and vibrant again, instead of derelict and deserted. Prior development and investment in our area brought new public schools, community centers, um, and, and many new residents. They're so good that many new residents move here to attend them. This is the same type of transformative project, and I urge you to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker will be William Thomas and then James Kaplan. Hawk is ready. We can come back to William Thomas uh, and take James Kaplan next, and then Aaron Singh. I'm begins. James Kaplan, if you can hear me, you need to accept the unmute request. Okay, we'll try to move on uh, to Aaron Singh and come back to James Coppin later. Aaron Singh. Mark is ready. Can you hear me? This is James Kaplan. Hey, James, one second, okay? Uh, did we have Aaron on already? I don't see that his mic is on yet. We could take James okay. Kaplan and then- Let's take James on. Let's take James and then we'll go to Aaron, okay? Okay. So Aaron, hang tight. James, when you're ready, uh, you may begin. Okay, my name is James Kaplan. I'm the chairman and past president of the Lower Manhattan Historical Association, which is a consortium of various historical groups in Lower Manhattan, including the Francis Tavern Museum, the New York Veteran Corps of Artillery, the Museum of American Finance, and various other patriotic groups. I am speaking in support of the proposal of the Howard Hughes Corporation for 250 Water Street. I remember 50 years ago, when I began working in Lower Manhattan and things were much worse economically, how the South Street Seaport Museum and its parade of ships showed us how things could get better. I remember particularly how the concerts at Pier 16 with performers such as Peter, Paul and Mary, Pete Seeger, Joan Baez and Bob Dylan inspired us to believe the city could recover from its economic and psychological doldrums. Uh, it seems that now the South Street Seaport Museum has over the years fallen on tougher times and is in need of funding. I've now sat through and testified at five public hearings on this subject. From my perspective, the focus has been on what is and the failures of the recent past, but I urge you, the members of the city council, to focus on not the recent failures, but what once was and what could be in the future. Let us rebuild the great cultural and historic center, which once stood here on the East River to an even greater one in the future. In our view, more than even finance, it is the, uh, 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 it's, it's the city's history and its cultural resources, which will be the key to its future. Uh, we have never in the 50 years that I've worked on Wall Street begrudged letting a private developer that was investing money make some money from a project if it was for the public good. I urge you to support this project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we'll go to Aaron. Hawk is ready. Hold on, Aaron. Got it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Moya. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify here. Uh, my name is Aaron Singh. I'm the Vessel Operations teacher at the New York Harbor School and a longtime uh, volunteer at the South Street Seaport Museum. In fact, 
I started off as a volunteer in 1995 and got my captain's license at the ripe age of 19. And uh, I've been fortunate to see the museum through thriving years where hundreds of thousands of public, uh, public school students were able to visit the vessels, get down to the waterfront. And I wanna bring in a topic and kind of a point of view that the Seaport District is not just Lower Manhattan, the South Street Seaport is New York City's five boroughs access to the water. I grew up in Spanish Harlem and I got down to the water and found this amazing career path to be able to work on the water. 92% of the folks that work in the harbor are white Caucasian male. And so the goal of a harbor school, which South Street Seaport Museum started back in 2003, is to get a diverse group of students that come from an urban area connected with the water in marine science and tech. And so we look forward to actually South Street Seaport Museum and Howard Hughes building up. And this 250 Water Street proposal is gonna give the museum the power, the support that it needs to continue to get back on track uh, post 9-11, post Sandy and uh, the financial crisis. And so we need to be able to support this idea. And again, think a little bit about this. You don't think about the students that have to get access to the water. When most people think about waterfront, they think about uh, real estate development, high price condos. I'm talking about getting inner city kids down to the waterfront to learn, respect, experience. And I wanna thank um, you know, uh, you know, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and Councilwoman Chin, who has done an amazing job for the district and thinking about young people. So I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um... For your testimony and the next speaker will be uh, William Thomas. Block is ready. Hi there, I, sorry my Zoom crashed, um, but my name is Will Thomas. Uh, I'm here to support the proposal for 250 Water Street uh, as the executive director of Open New York. Uh, we're an independent grassroots pro-housing organization. Uh, we hope the city council will support the project as well as it provides desperately needed housing. Um, New York has a terrible housing shortage, which I've repeated uh, many times for the city council. I'm gonna repeat some of those facts again uh, today. Uh, between 2010 and 2017, median rents increased by more than double median wages. Homelessness has reached the highest level since the Great Depression. Pre-COVID, one out of every 10 elementary school students in New York City public schools went home to shelters. So moving on from a global pandemic, we'll need as much affordable housing as we can get and the 80 below market homes that this rezoning would offer is an ideal place to start. Uh, that said, the market rate homes that uh, uh, 250 Water Street will also provide will help by proactively preventing displacement elsewhere. Uh, the median household income at the seaport is well over six figures. More broadly, the financial district is a very desirable neighborhood. And although it would be many families first choice, uh, if they can't find uh, new places to live here, they will simply bid up the price of existing housing Families who would otherwise have lived in that housing will instead move to more affordable neighborhoods. As displaced demand increases, up goes the rent, which forces currents to allocate ever larger shares of their income to stay in their homes and knocks those who can't pay to the street. So if we don't let young professionals live here, they're not gonna disappear. They're gonna further displacement pressures across the city. We live in a city where there aren't enough homes for the people who wanna live here. It has horrifying human consequences. That's the hulking mass over the neighborhood the quality of life issue we really have to address. Um, but one other thing I would ask the, the council to consider is uh, to uh, eliminate parking from the proposal. The area is so transit rich, I would ask the commission encourage replacing the parking with literally anything else. Um, thank you. Thank you, William. Um, that being the last uh, speaker for this panel, and seeing no questions from my colleagues. Uh, this uh, witness panel is now excused and um, I'll have the council call up the next panel, please. Next panel will include Huntley Gill, Timor Galen, Eric Antocal, and Catherine McVeigh Hughes. Huntley Gill followed by Timor Galen. Uh, Chris Redden.
can we see if um, we have them on? Huntley Gill uh, will be the first speaker if you can. Okay, we're gonna come back to Huntley Gill. Uh, Timur or Timur Galen will be the next speaker followed by Eric Antokal. Hello, can you hear me? Can hear you. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah, um, if, if you can hear me. My name is Timur Galen. I'm a resident of Lower Manhattan and an architect. I submit this testimony to underscore five points that I've already made in testimony to the Landmark Preservation Commission and the City Planning Commission in their review of 250 Water Street. First of all, 250 Water Street's site is suitable to receive additional density. The full block site easily accommodates the inherently, inherent complexity of higher density mixed use development. It is proximate to public transportation, bus, ferry, subway path, and the cycle path. It occupies a zone between the historic seaport buildings and the financial district, and the site is more appropriate to receive additional density the neighboring pier or water fence sites. Second of all, the additional density is being deployed to accomplish an appropriate mix of uses. Market rate housing, which will help extend several decades of growth in the residential population of lower Manhattan. Affordable housing, which is key to sustaining the vibrance and diversity of the neighborhood. Retail services and community oriented spaces at street level and alternative workplace located at the podium. Third, the economic benefits of greater density are being distributed in a very thoughtful way. Crucial support for the South Street Seaport Museum, an essential public and cultural destination that must be in sound and viable institutional shape to anchor the district and for the district to remain sustainable. Affordable housing and of course, other community facing uses. Fourth, the planning and fundamental massing of the proposed project is appropriate in the context of the historic district and has only been improved since its initial hearing back in the early part of this year. The contextual base is in scale and uh, empathetic with the, um, uh, with the built fabric of, of the district itself. The residential tower sets back decisively from the contextual base and has a modest presence on the skyline and ground floor uses in the proposed streetscape successfully integrate with those of the district. In summary, the 250 Water Street application demonstrates a sound partnership between essential public interests, first and foremost, the museum, the district, and affordable housing and responsible private development. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Eric Antokal, who will be followed by Huntley Gill. Well, I'm just ready. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you so much for holding this hearing. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Antical. I'm the Assistant VP for Programs at Non-Traditional Employment for Women. We're a 44-year-old nonprofit organization serving the five boroughs and beyond um, in pursuit of uh, training, placing, and retaining more women, uh, trans folks, and gender non-binary folks in the construction industry, specifically uh, the union construction industry, uh, where apprenticeship training and great wages and benefits are possible. <clears throat> Um, Lend Lease, which is the uh, uh, a supporter and general contractor on the project, has committed to uh, the use of our new signature projects model um, on this project, uh, which is why I come to you all um, uh, testifying in favor of this project. Um, they've committed to set a workforce diversity goal, uh, specifically for women workers um, uh, on the project, uh, which not only creates additional opportunities for more women uh, to come into the construction industry through union apprentices, 
apprenticeships, um, but it will also create opportunities for those women who are already in the industry uh, to have uh, richer career paths as they face um, bias and other sorts of oppression uh, in the industry. Um, so we uh, so we support uh, Lendlease and Howard Hughes in uh, in setting these diversity goals for the project, and we recognize the positive impact uh, that this project, along with the diversity goal, uh, will set um, uh, and put in place for the five boroughs of New York, um, including local residents uh, who are primarily low income. Um, and we, uh, again, support this project and, and hope you all will, will move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker will be Huntley Gill, followed by Catherine McVeigh Hughes. Time starts now. My name is Huntley Gill um, with Guardia Architects. I'm a preservationist and a maritime preservationist. Um, I first became involved with um, the seaport and this neighborhood when I was out of graduate school at Columbia and um, was working for the mayor's of office of development. And I'm very familiar with the whole history of the planning concepts here, which of course um, relates to transfer of development rights, uh, the original idea behind the museum's development. And as I look at this proposal, all I can say is uh, to support it is that it is fulfilling exactly that vision, the idea of the low rise historic streetscape surrounded by taller buildings um, that's in turn supported financially. I also have to say, having been a friend of the Grusens, um, that it also, I think anything that provides a good solid wall between the seaport district itself and the Grusens towers behind, which really break up the street front and, and um, uh, form a very bad background visually and as a planning element to the um, seaport district is a good thing. So all in all, my view of this and all of the planning that goes into it is that it's fulfilling the original vision of the seaport district and I urge its support. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. Catherine McVeigh Hughes. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. I served on Manhattan Community Board One for 20 years, half of that time as chair or co chair. I have lived downtown since 1988. For all those 33 years, 250 Water was an urban blight and nothing was done. It's great to see change coming at last. As someone who cares about our neighborhood and is committed to its future, here are seven facts about this proposal. One, 250 Water in Eyesore replaces a 50-year-old parking lot with a beautiful building designed by a world-renowned architect. Two, it removes a contaminated brownfield that has threatened the neighborhood for more than a century. Three, it restores affordable housing loss when Southbridge Towers went private. Four, it brings new residential customers to the restaurants and small businesses of the neighborhood. Five, it provides new facilities for schools, including a play street and community center. Six, it creates a new future for the South Street Seaport Museum, its vessels and collections, and its education mission. Seven, it demonstrates a billion dollar commitment to lower Manhattan post COVID, a transformative investment that echoes and expands on the recovery of downtown after 9-11. This project provides amenities that we have needed for decades at a time of significant budgetary constraints. When the Seaport District was created in the 1960s with the South Street Seaport Museum at its heart, the city planners included in the district the nearby blocks of Lower Manhattan specifically for redevelopment, not for preservation, to support the museum and the district for the long term. The article from May of 1969 attached to my testimony confirms this. Now's the time to execute on this vision, seize this unique opportunity, and support the 250 Water Street project, the right project at the right time. Thank you very much. I'm just gonna hold it up. Hopefully it's from the New York Times. It might be a little blurry, um, but I hope you take a minute um, to see the second page on my testimony and all my affiliations have been disclosed. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your testimony. Uh, that being the last uh, speaker on the panel and seeing no uh, questions, uh, this witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, please uh, call up the next panel, please. Panel will include Patrick Quinn, Frank Schiami, Daniel Del Vecchio, and Carrie Nolan. Patrick Quinn first, followed by Frank Schiami. Time starts now. Hello, 
Uh, my name is Patrick Quinn, and I'm here today representing IPIC Theaters. We're a nearby business located in the seaport in the beautiful and historic Fulton Market Building. We strongly support the HHC proposal to develop a mixed-use building at 250 Water that will spur economic development and residential housing near transit. It'll create permanent, deeply affordable housing in Lower Manhattan's affluent seaport neighborhood and generate funding for the Seaport Museum. Our IPIC theaters locations serve as meeting and entertainment locations for communities. And as such, we are heavily invested in the communities we serve. While we love the seaport, we've been disappointed that years into our operation, 250 Water still remains an unsightly gap in the cityscape. The parking lot at 250 Water is a major detraction from the neighborhood and it impedes its walkability, particularly at nighttime. The construction of the building design that the LPC approved will activate this block from morning until night, not only improving safety, but also improving neighborhood morale. This will reinforce the boundaries of the historic district while staying contextual to its surroundings by being taller along Pearl and lower as it meets the interior of the historic district. We truly believe the 250 water project will transform the pedestrian experience throughout the seaport by connecting critical blocks of the historic district with a cohesive mixed use plan. This will translate to an increased engagement with the seaport from residents within and outside of the district. And it's critical to the long-term sustainability of businesses within the district. There are many businesses like ours struggling desperately to survive as a result of the pandemic. And the addition of the 270 apartments plus 1,700 permanent jobs that the development will generate will support local businesses and add to the vibrancy of the community. In order for IPIC and other businesses to survive and for the seaport to thrive, we need 250 water to be built. This proposed project solves so many problems the seaport district and city currently face and does throw so through smart urban planning. We at IPIC urge the city council to support the land use actions necessary. Thank you so much. The next speaker on the panel will be Frank Schiami, who will be followed by Daniel Del Vecchio. Time starts now. Okay, am I unmuted? Is my camera on? Your camera is not on. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon. Thank you, Councilwoman Chin and all of the council members for your time. I'm Frank Siami, CEO of Siami Construction. Uh, I have been involved with the Seaport for over 40 years. I have started by building the Siemens Church Institute. And when I built that building, I fell in love with the neighborhood. I ended up buying three buildings there, uh, two of which were historic, had my offices there for 20 years became the board chair of the South Street Seaport Museum. Just love the district. I'm also the past board chair of the Landmarks Conservancy. And as a preservationist, I strongly believe that we must save the historic seaport. The fact is that 250 Water Street project, it's the only viable plan that exists to achieve this goal. The plan will add a dynamic, resilient building with affordable housing in place of a parking lot that for a half century has blighted the district. As a builder, I'd like to highlight that Howard Hughes Corporation has shown its commitment to the seaport through its rebuilding of Pier 17, the restoration of the tin building and the management of complex projects throughout the area. They've done this with sensitivity and expertise. Their transparent, rigorous approach to the necessary environmental cleanup of 250 Water Street and the initial planning as outlined in their draft environmental impact analysis are in keeping with their community-minded value system. The Howard Hughes Corporation ha has been a trusted and robust, robust partner to the historic Seaport Museum, to local nonprofits, to arts organizations, to small businesses throughout the neighborhood. This is a sound plan and a win-win for the South Street Seaport and all of New York City. Thank you for your time. Next speaker will be Daniel Del Vecchio, followed by Carrie Nolan. Time starts now.
Daniel Del Vecchio, if you can hear me, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your. Yes, I did. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Daniel Del Vecchio, and I strongly support the HAC proposal to develop a mixed use building at 250 Water Street that will spur economic development, add good jobs, create permanent, deeply affordable housing in Lower Manhattan's affluent South Street Seaport neighborhood, and generate the funding to stabilize the Seaport Museum. I urge the City Council to support and approve the land use actions necessary to make 250 Water Street possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Next and last speaker on this panel will be Carrie Nolan. Time starts now. Carrie Nolan, if you can hear us, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Try to accept the unmute request by pressing star six on your phone. Okay, we will uh, come back to Carrie Nolan uh, later. That was the last announced speaker on this panel. Okay, um, seeing that uh, we have no uh, questions from uh, my colleagues, uh, this witness panel is now excused. And if you can call uh, the next panel, thank you. Next panel will include Laura Norwitz, Stephen Stefan Edick, and Joshua Picard. Laura Norwitz, followed by Stefan Edick. Time starts now. Laura Norwitz, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank can you hear you. Very much. Whenever you're ready, Nora. Very good. Laura, sorry. My name is Laura Norwitz. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Education at South Street Seaport Museum. I support the proposal. I've got a couple of points to make. The particular design of the proposed construction is not inappropriate for the neighborhood, and you cannot uncouple saving the Seaport Museum from preserving the historic district. I think most of the people here agree that the Seaport Museum is a good thing and worth saving. I wish it were saved already. Do I like tall buildings? No, not particularly. But this tall building that abuts a neighborhood of tall buildings just shifts the tall building line slightly. So what will be the experience from the street? Right now, walking past a parking lot, there's lots of light, lots of visible sky, there's what looks like open space because it's a parking lot. And what will take away from that sky is any structure that's four or five stories tall. From the street, it's not a tower or a tall building that'll block the sight lines. It's the bottom few floors, anything that's not set back. And building as of right wouldn't help. In fact, it might even be worse. Wouldn't it be nice to have a park there instead? Sure. But Howard Hughes is a business, so that ain't gonna happen. Do I wish we could save the Seaport Museum another way? Sure, we could put air rights on the market, but what if nobody wants to buy them? I think if there were another way to save the museum, it would have been done already. Oh, I'm a parent and I was a classroom teacher for years. So yeah, it would be lousy for construction to happen right outside the classroom windows. I would hate it, but this is New York and and in New York, things get built. This is what happens in New York. Uh, also, maybe some of our neighbors think that it doesn't really matter what happens to the museum. Maybe they think if the museum is gone in the neighborhood, the Seaport Historic District, it would all still be there. But no, because if the museum is gone, then Wavertree is gone, Ambrose That's is gone. Hard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Stefan Edick followed by Joshua Pickard. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stefan Edick, and I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to speak in support of the proposal for 250 Water Street. 
Um, I'm a career maritime heritage professional. I've been deeply involved with the Seaport community since I was employed there from 1998 to 2002. And um, I think as we're focusing on the immediate, you know, on the immediate, it's important to take a step back and put the Seaport in the larger context, because starting in 1968, the Seaport was a standard bearer, not just for maritime heritage preservation, but for historic preservation in general as a small group of determined people kept the district from the wrecking ball. Um, and as, uh, <clears throat> as noted uh, by Ada Louise Huxtable, the role of uh, historic districts is not to embalm history, but to work as part of a dynamic uh, conversation that combines old and new for the preservation of the historic fabric um, as a living thing. <clears throat> the uh, Others have spoken here much more eloquently about uh, the qualities of the building, about the importance of the affordable housing, the employment opportunities that will, uh, <clears throat> will be involved. I'd like to address just two things briefly. The first is the significance of this project to the future, uh, the viability and the sustainability of the Seaport Museum. Um, the Seaport Museum is, as others have noted, a real icon um, for the history of New York and for the history of the nation, um, which was, after all, created by ships and shipping. And it, um, in all of the different uh, things that converted uh, wilderness and uh, Native American First Nations territory to the most vibrant community in the world, uh, the Seaport Museum and maintaining and preserving that connection uh, plays a plays an absolutely vital role, <clears throat> and few organizations, um, a few museums, if any, have had to endure the sort of challenges that the Seaport Museum has has had to in the last twenty years. Um, whether disasters, natural or man made, they've um, they've presented a a huge a set of challenges, and uh, this part. The, the project provides uh, funding for the museum that will keep it viable going on into the future. And then second, as a side uh, note. Uh, Stefan, uh, thank you very much. Uh, your two minutes uh, have expired. Thank you. thank you for your testimony today. Next speaker, please. Joshua Pickard. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me now? We can yeah. hear you. Okay. Yep. We can hear you. Good afternoon, committee members. Uh, my name is Joshua Picard. I'm a partner in Noah Hospitality Group, which operates eight restaurants in downtown New York. I am speaking today in support of HSC and their mixed use building at 250 Water Street on behalf of myself and my partners, Luke Ostrom and Andrew Carmelini. We invested in the Seaport District and support this evolution into a wonderful balance between its history and the future. This development will help spur increased economic development, add residential housing near public transit and good jobs, create permanent and deeply affordable housing in Lower Manhattan's affluent Seaport neighborhood and generate funding for the important Seaport Museum. I've lived in downtown New York City since 1981 and know the Seaport quite well over the years. I'm a founding board member that created the NoHo bid, so understand the development process in such cherished neighborhoods. I was happy to see the modifications made during the landmarks approval process and now feel confident this development will be an important addition to the Seaport District and has been carefully scaled to the existing historical structures and is inclusive to the community needs. Over the past 20, 32 years, I have been involved in building 22 restaurant concepts in four states. I recently completed a three-year project with Howard Hughes at Pier 17, where we recently opened Carney Mari Mr. Dips. I can tell you with years of firsthand experience with HSC that it's been the most conscious builders we've ever worked with. They take an extraordinary level of responsibility in its handling of all the projects in this area. While we understand that construction may be temporarily dis disruptive, we have confidence in this team to run a safe, sensitive, and responsive construction operation at 250 Water Street. The building's design is contextual to its surrounding, specifically the building's low rise where it meets the interior of the historic district and taller along Pearl Street, which is wider and faces the high rise financial district. I thank you and I urge city council to join us to support the land use actions necessary to make 250 Water Street possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
please call up the uh, next panelist, please. Uh, Josh Picard was the last speaker on that panel. Okay, um, seeing no questions, uh, this uh, panel is now excused. If you can, please uh, call up the next panel. Next panel, the next panel will include Scott Dwyer, Edward McWilliams, Dara L. Badanuni, and Lily Chopra. Scott Dwyer will speak first, followed by Edward McWilliams. Time starts now. Scott Dwyer, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Scott Dwyer. I'm representing Sons of the Revolution in the state of New York, uh, who own and operate Francis Tavern Museum in Lower Manhattan, a historic site dating to 1719, and a museum which opened in 1907, a short walk from the South Street Seaport Museum. We strongly support the Howard Hughes Corporation proposal to develop a mixed use building at 250 Water Street uh, that will, among many other things, replace an unsightly parking lot and make possible significant funding for the imperiled South Street Seaport Museum, an essential component and anchor of the historic district, allowing it to restore and reopen its historic buildings and plan for future expansion. After a lengthy stakeholder process, uh, the current design approved by the New York City Landmarks Commission will transform the lot, and enhance the neighborhood and the, and the historic district. We urge this body to support the land use actions necessary to make this development possible. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, thank you for your testimony. The next speaker, please. Edward McWilliams, who will be followed by Sarah L. Badanuni. Time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Moyer and the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to participate. And uh, my name is Edward McWilliams. I'm a representative of the New York City District Council of Carpenters. And I'm here to offer our strong support for Howard Use Corporation's proposal to develop a mixed use building at 250 Water Street. New York City needs economic development now more than ever and needs more projects like this one, which encourages investment and is poised to be a robust part of Lower Manhattan and New York City's economic recovery. The plan will generate substantial investment in the seaport of some $850 million, creating 1,600 muchly needed construction jobs and over 1,700 permanent jobs in commercial, retail, and nonprofit sectors. Not only will 250 Water Street spur economic development, it will add good jobs, it will create permanent and deeply affordable housing in Lower Manhattan's affluent South Street Seaport neighborhood and generate funding to stabilize the Seaport Museum. I urge the council, the city council, to support and approve the land use actions necessary to make 250 Water Street possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker. Hi, uh, my name is Sara al Betanuni, and I've been a longtime resident of uh, Lower Manhattan. Uh, we moved after shortly after 9-11 to the neighborhood, and uh, I've seen the growth and the revitalization of the neighborhood, and I continue to hope and believe that we can continue doing this. This proposal will bring much needed jobs to the neighborhood. And again, I cannot stress enough how, what the Seaport and Howard Hughes has done for us in the neighborhood. It's appreciated by uh, a lot of us who live down here. I wanted to stress on two things that have been brought up. And I, I have worked with Councilwoman Chen when I was PTA president at Spruce and nobody likes and loves our kids more than she does. And I know she has done all her due diligence. She has always been a huge supporter of the kids. While we were having construction uh, uh, during that time, it actually was much more traumatic for the parents than the kids. The kids were fine. Our kids are fine. They're like now trying to get into college. And I even remembered when I moved into the neighborhood and I was trying to get into PS 20. Uh, 234 it was sandwiched between two construction sites 
And I just felt grateful that they will just take my application. I did not feel like I was entitled to tell them, don't do anything. I just wanted my kids in a good education, free education in New York City. And that's what we have been getting. So I just wanted to stress that the kids will be fine. Uh, I've been around a lot of construction. And in fact, a District 75 school down the street now from Pexclip School has a huge construction site on Beekman and nobody has said anything. I haven't heard anything about that. And those kids in District 75, they have sensory issues and this construction is going on with no issues. So I just wanted to stress again that this would be great for the neighborhood. It's now one of the best neighborhoods in New York City and it's been just great living here. And thank you so much for everybody's time. Take care, bye. Thank you, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Lily Chopra will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Lily Chopra. I'm the Executive Director of Artistic Programs at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, known as LMCC. And it is on behalf of LMCC that I'm honored to testify today in support of the Howard Hughes Corporation Plan, as we care deeply about the South Street Seaport neighborhood, both its physical assets and the local community within it and around it. For more than a decade, Howard Hughes Corporation has been strongly committed to supporting and enhancing arts and culture in the seaport area. And we're thrilled to see after so many years an achievable proposal come together to provide the South Street Seaport Museum with a plan to thrive for the long term. It is our strong desire that the museum and its landmark spaces and historic assets will continue to be an important cultural anchor in the seaport for the decades more to come. The proposal for the parking lot will bring affordable housing and community space that long underutilized sites, which LMCC is indeed in support of both the inclusion of affordable housing and a dynamic community space as being further important assets to the downtown diverse community. Under its leadership, the Howard Hughes Corporation has proven to be responsive to local concerns, as well as supporter of arts and culture within and around the district. And so we really appreciate their outreach to the local community and their commitment to making the redevelopment of 250 Water Street inclusive of local voices and responsive to their concerns. The design is sensitive to the historic district and responds to the issues raised by many community members. So it is our hope that the commission will approve this appropriate sustainable development, which offers a vital opportunity to strengthen the historic district and bring affordable housing, jobs, economic development, and enhance the cultural offerings of the seaport and of lower Manhattan. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, next speaker. Sure, that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay, um, that being, uh, seeing no questions from uh, my colleagues, uh, that witness panel is now excused. And if you can call the next panel, please. Next panel will include Carrie Nolan, Douglas Hanau, Maria Ho Burge, Michelle Coppersmith, and Sanad Wadsworth. Carrie Nolan will speak first, followed by Douglas Hanau. Time starts. Great, thank you. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to the council. Uh, my name is Carrie Nolan. Um, I have a, a couple of roles. I'm a very long-term um, volunteer at the South Street Seaport Museum, where I started as a volunteer in 2005 um, on the Pioneer, uh, Schooner Pioneer. I've worked my way up and I am now a captain. Um, I am also an architect and can speak about the, um, the appropriateness of this project. Um, I, am, I work with Byra Blinder Bell, which I'm sure as you know, um, is very well versed in historic uh, uh, projects. Um, also, just in full disclosure, uh, the South Street Seaport Museum is a client of ours, but we do not benefit from this project. Um, I think what I'd really like to speak to is just um, the experience of this that this building will uh, give to the street level. Uh, the Seaport is a very walkable neighborhood, as you know, and having the, the parking lot right now, it's, it's, a, it's a blight. It's just a, an empty spot. Um, I used to live on Pearl Street. Um, and having to walk past that, I can tell you it'd be a much more pleasant experience if there was a residential building there along with uh, retail at the ground floor. It will just improve the pedestrian experience um, to have this building there instead of the parking lot. 
um, as somebody who used to live in the neighborhood, uh, I was priced out uh, about 10 years ago. Um, so having additional housing in this um, neighborhood, especially uh, with the affordable housing that will be put in the tower, I think is a, a really great move and will help um, hopefully diversify the neighborhood as well. Um, I think that that is all I have to say. Uh, thank you for letting me speak and I hope that you support um, the South, South Street Seaport Museum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Maria Ho Burge, followed by, excuse me, Douglas Hanau will be the next speaker, followed by Maria Ho Burge. Time starts. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. My name is Douglas Hanau. I'm a lifelong resident of New York City, raising two teenage daughters. I want to ask Council Member Chin to support this project wholeheartedly. I personally wish it was bigger and I personally wish there was more housing, but as it is, it's a great plan. New York City is facing a climate and a housing crisis. Every elected official, every community group, every community board says this. So when the opportunity to build housing and additional housing that's dense, that's um, climate, that's better for the climate than existing housing, that has um, features that make it environmentally better comes along, we reject it for parochial reasons. We have to start stepping up as a city and build housing everywhere. A parking lot is a great place to start. So my children, my teenage daughters, hopefully will have a place to come back to when they graduate college, when they finish high school and want to work in the city. There needs to be housing. And that's just my family. There are homeless families right now. There are working poor families who can't live near jobs, who can't live in Manhattan, who can't live in the city. And we're continually telling them, no, we don't want you here by denying projects like this. So please pass this project, pass all the rezonings and pass everything. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Maria, please. Maria Ho Burge to be followed by Michelle Coppersmith. Hi everyone. Hi Maria, whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Hoberge. I'm a 15 year Seaport and Friday resident, a Peck Slip school parent and a local small business owner. I have been and am currently in the Seaport community for the long run. I'm testifying in support of Howard Hughes proposal for 250 Water Street. I have to set the scene for you with regards to Howard Hughes. Before the company came to the Seaport, as many of you know, the area was made up of a hodgepodge of schools with no soul or spirit. Since they've come in, they made the Seaport a destination again, one that all New Yorkers can be proud of. They have been responsible and generous community partners, having donated to local schools hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. I'm also co-chair of the Taste of the Seaport Festival that takes place each fall. Just this year, Howard Hughes again donated over $100,000 to support our school's arts programs. Our kids have musical instruments because of this company. They've also provided family-friendly programming from tree lightings to ice skating, all for either free or at a reduced cost uh, for people who live in the neighborhood. As a longtime resident, the improvements made to the seaport are why I continue to live here. As a mother, I enjoy the amenities of our neighborhood with my family on a weekly basis. As a small business owner, I'm appreciative of the business Howard Hughes brings to the seaport, but we do need more. As far as areas of attention in lower Manhattan, this building will help with safety. The area has gone up and down in terms of safety and the improvements that Howard Hughes have brought and will bring are going to bring more people to the area and help with safety. Patronage for, small, patronage for small businesses. As a small business owner, my salon is very close to the heart of the seaport. If we are all to survive after the pandemic, we need more people in the area. I, re I received zero help from the government. I need more people in the neighborhood to patronize my salon in order to survive. And I will tell you that many, if not all of the small business owners in this area feel the same way. And affordable housing. I understand that as many as 80 new units will be offered 
And I may add that, of course, the views in premium apartments will be safe for those who are paying the premium price. It's a business, not a charity. I just have to say that. One last bit, as a parent, I would be remiss not to mention the mercury concern. I trust that Howard Hughes will carefully and 100% manage the process of removing it and dealing with it in a responsible manner as they are parents too. And as we've all heard today, Margaret Chin has vetted this process carefully. In summary, I urge you to approve the zoning for 250 Water Street and join me in applauding Howard Hughes for turning an ugly parking lot into something useful and in keeping with the area's aesthetic and continuing to build up our beloved neighborhood. Thank you for listening and considering my testimony. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Uh, the next speaker, please. Michelle Coppersmith, followed by Sanad Wadsworth. Hi. I'm Starch. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle and I live in CD3, but my office is in CD1 at 85 Broad Street. Prior to COVID, I passed um, the parking lot at 250 Water Street every day, and I am a uh, sure that this development would brighten that area significantly. Other folks talked about how they avoid it. I do as well, except for when I have to drop my city bike off there or pick a new one up. Um, and I'm sure that it would brighten it by both removing the parking lot and also all the new residents that would come as the prior speakers talked about how important they are. I could see this patch of asphalt turning into a more vibrant place with people that would patronize seaport businesses and others and give back to the district in other civic manners. I hope that you will take into consideration that CD1 is a district with excellent transportation, schools, access to parks, and with below average levels of poverty, rent burden, and commuting times. Our city is an ever-changing place, which is what makes it magical, and this development will be a positive change for a neighborhood that is both so dependent on the business district and the tourism that has both, have both been hurt by COVID. I ask that the council vote yes on this proposal because we, would, we should not be held hostage by a few property owners concerned about changes or devaluations to their property. If we keep limiting bu bu buildings like this, developers will continue to only build the most expensive housing. If Ford had a 5,000 car per year quota, do you think they're building escalades or focuses? That's the situation we're in currently because we so strongly limit the building of new housing here. I first spoke in support of the original proposal, which had much more affordable and other housing before LPC demanded a reduction on November 12th, 2020. That is almost one year ago. In the past year, I've spent hours waiting to testify in countless meetings to support one apartment building that would replace a blighted parking lot. Please think about who is able to do that. I feel blessed that I can and how that might distort the so-called community input that you receive in proposals like this. I've been on five of these meetings at least. I can't even count anymore. And in every meeting, the people who are notably asked, absent are the people who would potentially live in the affordable housing. Again, please vote yes, but also please remove the parking minimum. And thank you, Council Member Chen, for your support of affordable housing in our district. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker. Sanad Wadsworth will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Time starts. Good afternoon, Chair Moya again and members of the council. My name is Sanad Wadsworth, council representative for the New York City District Council of Carpenters. And we strongly support the Howard Hughes Corporation proposed to develop a mixed use building at 250 Water Street. The proposal offers a vital and timely opportunity to bring affordable housing apprenticeship opportunities, and economic development to the seaport in Lower Manhattan. The parking lot at 250 Water Street has been in an unsightly gap in the urban fabric for 50 years. The building design approved by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Com Commission is respectful of the history and its urban context, and it will enhance the neighborhood and the historic district. I urge the city council to support the approved land use actions necessary to make 250 Water Street possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, was that the last speaker? Okay, uh, seeing no questions from my colleagues, uh, the witness panel is now excused and I now ask you to please call up the next panel, please. The next panel will include Jessica Lappin, Bob Gasney, and Niral Shah, and Denise Porter. Jessica Lappin, followed by Bob Gasney. I'm Starch. All right. Hi. Hello, Chair Moya, and hello, Councilwoman Chin. Um, lovely to see you. I'm the president of the Downtown Alliance, Jessica Lappin, which manages the Business Improvement District south of Chamber Street, and uh, pleased to be in support of the 250 Water Street proposal before you today. 
While the seaport is not by legal definition within our assessment area, it is a vital asset uh, for the neighborhood and the entire city. We believe this mixed use proposal continues to be an important opportunity to create jobs, to boost our local economy at such a critical juncture in our city's recovery, to build sorely needed affordable housing in CB1 and save the museum. Uh, New York City needs economic development now more than ever, and this $850 million investment uh, will create more than 1,000 construction jobs, 1,500 permanent jobs, and uh, new patrons to support our local businesses and merchants, uh, those who've struggled so hard. And, and of course, during the public review process, the applicant has worked hard, really hard, to be responsive to a breadth of community concerns and feedback from LPC. And in addition to being approved by the CPC, the project's also endorsed by the Daily News, the Post, the New York Times editorial board, uh, our borough president, uh, Gail Brewer, a broad coalition of residents, businesses, and civic uh, associations, and of course, uh, Councilwoman Chin. Thank you for all of your leadership on this project. Um, furthermore, uh, this building will be resilient and sustainable in structure, and our neighborhood knows, unfortunately, firsthand, just how important it is to protect the seaport from climate change and rising sea levels. So in closing, um, on behalf of our board of the Downtown Alliance and myself, we strongly support Howard Hughes' application and encourage you to vote in favor of these land use actions to make this development possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Always good to see you. Hope you're well. Same. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony. Um, next speaker, please. Bob Gasney will be the next speaker, followed by Niral Shah. Time starts. Hi, my name is Bob Gassimia, and I represent the ownership of the hotel, commonly known as the Mr. C Seaport, located very close to 250 Water on the corner of Peck Slip and Front Street. Our group owns the real estate in addition to operating the hotel business located there, which hotel is one of the largest employers in the Seaport District. We strongly support the proposed development. Us property owners are very lucky to have an organization like the Howard Hughes Corporation who have spent considerable resources improving the Seaport community and making it a de desirable place to live, work, and visit. Their investment and developments have been carefully thought out and well planned and have allowed the Seaport to be competitive with other parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn. As we all know, the Seaport was quite dilapidated just as recent as seven or eight years ago but it has significantly improved in all facets, mainly from Howard Hughes's vision and commitment to the neighborhood. The 250 water project is appropriate in design and scale and will only further improve the viability and longevity, which is property, us property owners and businesses need to survive and compete. The mixed use development will boost economic development, add much needed residential housing near public transit, both affordable housing and market rate housing and create valuable jobs the city desperately needs as we try to surface from COVID. Of course, the museum will bring a cultural draw to the seaport, which Howard Hughes is funding in association with the development. We are one of the closest large properties and businesses next to the parking lot and it's an eyesore and is in need of improvement. Howard Hughes has proven to be a responsible developer. We're lucky to have them leading the construction. We all know construction could be disruptive temporarily and few property owners are as impacted as we are due to the proximity, but it's the right decision to support the project and improve our seaport community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Errol Shah, followed by Denise Porter. Time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Neeral Shah. Um, I live, I've lived in New York City for almost 15 years. I work in Lower Manhattan and uh, thanks for the opportunity to express my strong support of this development. Um, I, you know, this is a first for me. I've actually only been actively opposed to development efforts in the city before, <laughs> but I, I do feel differently about this one. Um, maybe I feel a little closer to it because I've actually had the opportunity to sail on one of the giant schooners going out of the seaport. To me, there's a fundamentally important reason to support this project, and that's because the city desperately needs more housing, particularly affordable housing, and particularly in a place that's closer to where people actually work. Uh, I, I don't see this as just a luxury project. I, I see it as something that aims to be a place where everyday people can live, visit, 
eat, go to school. Um, and I, I hear the concerns of people, especially long-term residents who are opposed to it. And I think this is part of what the city always struggles with, with preservation. And, and maybe no site has been as fraught as the, the seaport recently. Um, there, there, there's always an effort to try to preserve the past in, in a way that it, it can't really be held in place. And it has the risk of rendering a place uninteresting and inaccessible. And that doesn't really further the purposes of preservation if nobody wants to interact with it. You know, for, for whatever my aesthetic judgment is worth, I find the proposal to be attractive architecturally, consistent with and reinforcing the character of the neighborhood rather than displacing it. You know, I've seen my own neighborhood change over the past decade, often for the worse. And, you know, maybe at other times, just in ways that stir up my petty resentment that it's not my neighborhood anymore. But part of what's hurt North Brooklyn is that rezoning meant a free for all of haphazard construction with no regard for the people or places or appearance where buildings were put. This to me is a cohesive plan, not just a set of buildings that takes into account how residents and visitors interact with the space, the needs, services, and infrastructure of a diverse community, and even the way that climate change is going to increasingly threaten lower Manhattan. I think Time. against the alternative that it remains a fallow parking lot for yet another decade, uh, and that there's no funding to keep these important sites of the past uh, available. I think this is a good project, a useful project, and I hope the city approves the, the land use changes necessary for it to go forward. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next speaker, please. Denise Porter. Time starts now. Hi, this is Denise Quarter, and I am the founder of a downtown website called fideyefamilies.com. I am a homeowner downtown, and I'm the parent of two kids who attended Tech Slip, and would like to voice my support of the cleanup and building at 250 Water Street. The parking lot has been an unsightly eyesore for over 50 years. The building design has been restructured many times with the input by local community leaders, residents, and stakeholders having an opportunity to help revise this building. The new design is respectful of neighborhood history and its urban context. In addition to the enhancement of the neighborhood, the cleanup in the proposed new building will assist the many businesses in the seaport and employ so many more. This neighborhood is struggling and this project will bring needed new customers to local restaurants and retailers. The project will make possible significant funding for the struggling seaport museum, an essential component and anchor of the historic district. With this funding, the museum will be able to restore and reopen its historic buildings and plan for future expansion. The Seaport Museum is a hidden gem and over the years has been a great destination for my family and for my children who attended the, min the Museum Mini Mates program, had field trips there and participated in an after school program, which was supported by Howard Hughes. It's important to save the Seaport Museum and bring it back to life. As a 15 plus year resident, I'm someone who has witnessed the transformation of the Seaport. I appreciate the community building efforts of Howard Hughes and their willingness to revise the proposed structure, height, and timeline. HHC continues to support our schools as recently as last week and with sponsorship of the Taste of the Seaport, which raises money for enrichment programs at Peck Slip and Spruce Street. Their engagement with the downtown community continues to improve the school experience for over 1,000 public school students. Their community efforts continue, even as some have been against the project. The organization continues to support local nonprofits, such as the Fulton Street Market, and continues to host fun events, such as community concerts, and holiday events, which all lead to increased visibility of this amazing neighborhood. There are many reasons to support the efforts to clean up and develop a mixed use building at 250 Water. Creating a safe Time. and healthy neighborhood for all to enjoy is just one reason. Thank you so much. And I offer all my support to this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next speaker, please. I believe that was the last speaker on this panel. Okay, uh, seeing no questions from uh, my colleagues here, uh, this panel is now excused. And if you can call up the next panel, please. Next panel will include William Kornblum, Adam Brodheim, Jeremy Moss, and Nick Romthal. William Kornblum first, and then Adam Brodheim. Time starts. William Kornblum, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. OK. 
Okay. William, you can begin whenever you're ready. Native New Yorker and resident of Jackson Heights, Queens. For three decades, I ran a planning and research center for the National Park Service at the CUNY Graduate Center. I've done research for the Statue of Liberty, Battery Park, Battery Park City, and many other waterfront sites in the city and the region. So I am intimately familiar with the issues raised here. I speak as a private citizen and have no connection to the Hughes Corporation. Council members, you have my sympathy for what is clearly a difficult decision, at least for some of you, I suppose. Stewardship of the historic district seems to be opposed to stewardship of the South Street Seaport Museum, a central cultural institution. But without the endangered museum, the district becomes a hollow shell. I fear some of the district's lower Manhattan neighbors are guilty of loving the museum to death. The proposal represents a trade-off that is urgently needed. Finally, and on a personal note, my family and I sail our city's waterways on an historic cat boat. A sailboat originally built in 1916 and restored by the late Michael Korchmar. Michael was one of the first captains of the seaport's beloved schooner, the Pioneer. He was one of the many who learned his trade as a boat builder and captain originally at the seaport. The museum with its historic ships is a vital institution of the city's waterfront and for all those whose livings are gained on its waters. Please give the entire seaport a new lease on life by supporting this well-crafted proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Adam Brodheim will be followed by Jeremy Moss. Time Good starts. Afternoon. My name is Adam Brodheim, and I'm a historic preservationist studying at Columbia University. I want to echo the other preservationists who have spoken before me today that this is a fabulous project that will replace a parking lot with housing and will build, enhance, and complete the historic fabric of this neighborhood. During the course of this project, some folks have fear-mongered about the precedent that this project would set for our historic districts. The precedent it would set is allowing our historic districts to grow and evolve to meet our needs as New Yorkers. The Landmarks Preservation Commission isn't going anywhere. In fact, it has already brought major changes to this project to make it better fit with the surrounding environment. I am a historic preservationist. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I love our historic districts, and I'd love to see this building rise inside a historic district, showing how it's not only okay, but appropriate for our districts to adapt and evolve. To do otherwise is a disservice to the history of our city. The only recommendation I have is to get rid of the parking from this development. We know that it's not necessary for the success of this project, and as we look for ways to reduce our impact on climate change, this is an easy no-brainer. The EIS showed that there are 1,500 parking spots in garages within a quarter mile of this development. We don't need 100 more. Thank you for your time, and please support this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Jeremy Mo Moss, who will be followed by Nick Rumpfall. Time starts. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council Member Chin, Chair Moya and the other committee members. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jeremy Moss. I'm here in several capacities. Um, I am uh, first and foremost, a longtime owner at 324 Pearl Street, uh, a 50 unit condo. That's uh, just a block away from the site of 250 Water Street. Um, I also work as uh, executive vice president of office leasing for Silverstein Properties. So I've been involved with uh, repopulating the buildings at the World Trade Center uh, since uh, after 9-11. Uh, so I have a long uh, experience in Lower Manhattan and I'm a, uh, a huge advocate for, uh, for its long-term sustainability. And lastly, a, a lifelong New Yorker. Um, just want to make three points today. First of all, um, the, uh, the project is, uh, as, as I see it, uh, respectful of the uh, context, historic context of the district, uh, of the scale and the architectural language, uh, including my building at 324 Pearl Street. Um, I know many of uh, my, my fellow residents uh, share that view. Um, secondly, uh, I think uh, we're, we're all very excited at the prospect of having 
the streets get street, streetscape restored and having something more than a parking lot as our neighbor. Um, and, and third, it's going to bring not only affordable housing and jobs, but is, is clearly the linchpin to the long term viability of the museum. And as a New Yorker, you know, I can definitely say there, there really is no conversation about a historic district without without the museum. Um, so with that, I thank you for the time and uh, encourage you to vote in favor of the land use actions necessary to make 250 Water Street possible. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Nick Ramfall will be the next and last speaker on this panel. Thank you all. My name is Nick Ramfall and I wish to, to express my unreserved support for the 250 Water Street redevelopment. I have a very close connection to the project by virtue of having previously lived in Lower Manhattan for many years. The fact that I currently work downtown and having strong ties to many of the folks at Howard Hughes who have worked tirelessly and with the best of intentions to make this project a reality. New York City is emerging from the pandemic, battered though not defeated. It is in deep need of vital economic development. The bottom line of this, of this project cannot be argued with. It will generate substantial investment in the seaport of some $850 million, creating 1,600 construction jobs and over 1,700 permanent jobs in the commercial, retail, and nonprofit sectors. From my personal experience, I know that HHC and Sawin and his team are good neighbors. They are measured, reasonable, and considerate and support a broad range of local civic groups as was evident from their sterling efforts during the pandemic. Over the past decade, HHC has invested and, com and committed 850 million in projects at the seaport. That area of lower Manhattan is far more inviting for families and aesthetically pleasing due in large part to HHC's e e efforts. The historic district will be completed for the, for, the, for the first time with the development of the site. It has been nothing more than an undeveloped surface lot for 50 years. In the final analysis and having young children myself, I appreciate its use as a playground for some, but I'm hard pressed when measuring that against all those families that will be helped in meaningful ways and lives that will be changed for the better by the economic and social benefits that will flow from this development. Thank you for your time and allowing me to testify. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, that being the last speaker and seeing no questions for this panel, the witness panel is now excused. And if the, you can call up the next panel, please. The next panel will include Stacy Shubb. Stacy Shubb. Mark is ready. Hi. Uh, my testimony is not a well-crafted script loaded with buzzwords as I don't work for the museum nor HHC. I don't own a business and I'm not on the board of any charity that they support, nor do I hope to do business with HHC in the future. I'm just a local resident who's lived at Southbridge Towers for over 25 years and I'm speaking from my heart. No, I do not have a view from my apartment. So if I believe this project will reinvigorate the neighborhood, then I am fighting against my own financial self-interest since this property value should go up. So why do I fight it? Well, first, it doesn't fit within the historic district. And I challenge any member of this council to look at the model, showing it's easily five times the height of the neighboring historic 18th and 19th century buildings. Tell me with a straight face that it fits, really. If you haven't seen it, you can go to the website and see it for yourself. It's enormous and it will change the character of the seaport forever. And I don't mean in a good way. So since it can't win approval on its own merits, that's why there are all these red herrings and hyperbole that's thrown into the mix. The parking lot, the museum, affordable housing and economic development are all important. The parking lot though, as an eyesore, we all agree we want something better than the disgusting parking lot that HHC runs, but we can do better than this proposal. The museum, we all want the museum to survive, but the museum relying on a promise a $50 million endowment that may never materialize. And even if it did, wasn't it just our money gained through the transfer of taxpayer owned air rights? Think of it as re-gifting. We give the money to HHC and they give it to the museum, maybe. Why not just sell the air rights to the highest bidder without it having to go through a developer? 
And let me share this as a previous executive director of a 501c3 myself. My number one responsibility was fundraising. I'm amazed at the lack of fundraising success. Everyone loves the museum, but nobody's willing to give money. The $50 million going to the museum kind of feels like a broke I'm person surprised. winning the lottery. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you for your testimony today. Um, you can please call up the next speaker. Chair, sure, that was the uh, last speaker on this panel. Okay, um, seeing no questions uh, for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. And if you can call up the next panel, please. This panel will include Bershnaw Green, Ashlyn McGuire, Harrison Grinnan. Bershnaw, Bershnaw Green, pardon me, to speak first. Clock is ready. Well, good afternoon. My name is Bertrand Green, and I am the president and executive director of the National Maritime Historical Society. It's a nonprofit founded in 1963 to raise awareness of our nation's maritime heritage and how our seafaring roots continue to shape the future. The Society is the national voice of our maritime heritage. We have a global presence. Our publication, Sea History, is the preeminent journal in the field. We host national conferences. Our website is the unparalleled go-to for maritime heritage resources. Our advocacy efforts bring funding to the heritage. I've introduced who we are so you will understand how we know how significant the South Street Seaport Museum is to the city and our country. I am testifying today to support the appropriateness of this proposed project, as it will ensure the South Street Seaport Museum's survival, an unparalleled contribution to New York's cultural landscape and a decades long chronicler of the nation's maritime history. New York became the prominent port in America and that built New York City and that built the nation. New York City needs to tell that story. The museum's painstaking stewardship of several historic buildings in the district, including the bound print shop is essential to the seaport's vitality and preservation. This historic district simply would not be what it is today without the museum. Its closure would put several historic buildings without the, without the district at risk. Allowing the closure of the seaport museum would be giving our consent to the erasure of our nation's historic beginnings and growth. It would mean the destruction of our historic district as we know it. Frankly, it would put New York City to shame. I'm expired. The only world-class city with no maritime museum. Even Paris, hardly a port city, boasts an amazing maritime museum. In closure, the National Maritime Historical Society endorses this wise and appropriate investment in historical preservation. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker, please. Ashlyn McGuire will be the next speaker, followed by Harrison Grinnett. Talk is ready. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you. My name is Asa McGuire. I am general counsel to the Contractors Association of Greater New York, which is a multi-employer association of construction managers and general contractors. I'm also a New York City resident, though in Community District 7, which has also seen a significant amount of construction um, around Columbia University, where I live. So I understand the impact construction can have on a neighborhood. I've also personally experienced that the disruption that it causes is temporary, while the benefits that it creates are not. This is a critical and timely project. Construction is critical to the revitalization of New York City. The construction stall occasioned by the pandemic has had a significant impact on our economy and on our construction jobs. As you've heard from other <coughs> people testifying, this project will provide some 1600 construction jobs. What comes with that, their use and contribution to businesses all around the construction site is important to revitalizing the economy. 
A recent study by the Building Trade Employers Association showed that each job on a construction site results in a multiplier of 1.32 jobs, and every dollar spent on a construction site results in 1.32 spent in the city. This is vitally needed uh, money and an economic boost for the city at a critical time. In addition, as you've heard, the construction industry is important because it provides well-paying jobs to people without an advanced degree. It is a path to the middle class, which is critically important as people try to come back from the problems that the pandemic has caused for them personally and for the city. I know that um, Howard Hughes Corporation is a responsible builder and will hire a responsible construction manager to oversee the project that it will be safe and adhere to all protocols. And I encourage and support the project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And next speaker, please. Harrison Grinning. Clock is ready. Clock is ready. Uh, hello, my name is Harrison Grinning. I'm a resident of Council Member Levin's District in Brooklyn. I'd like to testify in support of this uh, of, the, of this project. Uh, actually, I've never been to the Seaport Museum, although after all I've heard about it today, I think I might have to go, it sounds great. My main support of this project comes from the homes that are part of it. Uh, I believe it's at 280 homes now after the smite, after the downsizing and the LPC process and uh, 80 affordable. Those 80 affordable homes, I, I think everyone can agree New York needs more affordable homes, especially at such a deep AMI level at 40%. That's really remarkable. Uh, rich neighborhoods like this are exactly where we're supposed to use MIH because the market rate rents are able to support such a great level of amenity for the community, both through the Seaport Museum as well as the affordable housing. Uh, but I'd like to also talk about those 200 market rate homes. Every additional market rate home we build in a neighborhood like the Seaport, which is directly next to the financial district, directly reduces displacement out in Brooklyn, in Queens, and in uh, north, the north parts of Manhattan and in the Bronx. Um, as an example, I know many people who have high paying jobs who live in uh, lower Manhattan and then other people with slightly lower paying jobs who aren't quite able to afford it. So they live in Prospect Heights, they live in Sunset Park, they live in all these neighborhoods where people who've lived there for decades are getting, being pushed out. And it's not like they want to push people out. You know, no one, no one chooses uh, when they're moving to the city, like they dream of living in Sunset Park, they dream of Manhattan. Um, I really like Brooklyn, but not everyone dreams of that. Um, so I think that creating more homes so that people can actually live where the market rates are telling us they want to live, that helps to reduce displacement, not only locally, but also throughout the city and to create kind of a more fair and affordable city for everyone. So I'm a strong supporter of this project. I think that it's a, a, a you know, it's going in on a parking lot I mean, next to a bunch of towers that are already taller than the one that's going in. This is a pretty easy call for me. I'm strongly in support. Thank you. For Thank your time. you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next speaker, please. Stephen Marmon. Stephen Marmon. Stephen Marmon, if you can hear me, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. If you're on a telephone, you should unmute by pressing star six. Stephen Marmon, if you can hear me, we need you to accept the unmute request in order to begin your testimony. All right. Okay. I believe we're having some technical difficulties, uh, Chair. That was the last speaker on this panel. Okay. Uh, seeing no questions for this panel, the uh, witness panel is now excused. Uh, Council, can you please call up the next panel? If there are any remaining participants who wish to testify on the 250 Water Street proposal, please press the raise hand button now. You may do that on a telephone by pressing star nine. Once again, if you are uh, here in this meeting and you have not already testified, 
and you wish to testify on the 250 Water Street proposal, please use the raise hand button and you can do that on a telephone by pressing star nine. Okay, we have a couple of additional speakers to share. First speaker will be Donald Hong, who will be followed by Howard Weisenfeld. Donald Hong. Mark is am, ready. I, am I unmuted yet? Can you hear you me? Are. Yep, we, can we, hear you. You. we can hear you. All right, I'm Don Hong, UA3, and we do support this project. Uh, we feed somewhere around 1,400 people a week in lower Manhattan and as many as 7,000 per week in New York City. We've given out over 6 million masks during the summer and we have daily trucks of PPE going out. Now with hard coming money from uh, the city uh, and we thank Margaret Chin for introducing us to Howard Hughes and many other corporations who have made it possible for us to function and deliver all these goods to New York City and food. Uh, corporations have been able to respond now I live in Chelsea in Hell's Kitchen, even though I grew up in lower Manhattan and Hudson Yards, I saw them develop. And yes, I lost my, the entire beautiful view of, uh, of uh, Hudson River disappear before me, but so did the uh, drug trafficking and the sex trafficking and the, and the uh, prostitution disappeared as well. It is a much safer and a much more thriving area. You have businesses and restaurants that are coming back after COVID and were thriving before. Howard Hughes South Seaport of eight years of, of desolation is now brought back South Sea Seaport. And it's not just important to South Street Seaport, it's also important to Chinatown and Lower Manhattan, all of, all of Lower Manhattan. Because with housing coming in, both low income and affordable and, and market rate rentals, that's people who are gonna spend money in our neighborhoods. We need this type of project. We need development. Uh, the economic development and the, this becoming a destination for lower Manhattan will help us all. So I approve and I believe this, this project will be a great contribution, not just to South Street Seaport, but all of lower Manhattan. And I am a born and raised lower Manhattan boy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Howard Weisenfeld who will be followed by Stephen Marmon. Mark is ready. Um, hi, my name is Howie Weisenfeld and I've been working in Lower Manhattan now for over a decade. And I strongly support the Howard Hughes proposal to develop a mixed use facility at 250 Water Street. I think it'll spur economic development. Um, it'll add good jobs and needed jobs you know, as we're coming out of the pandemic and create housing. And I think from everything we've talked about today, I think that's one of the most important things now here in Lower Manhattan and, and in Manhattan in general is after the pandemic, getting back to affordable housing. Um, right now that it's urgently needed. Uh, we've heard today from uh, that the building design, which we heard today from the New York Landmarks Preservation Commission, that, that this building is appropriate and it has been approved. It is respectful of the history of the waterfront and it's used in the urban context. And I believe it will help um, the historic district grow. Now, as I said, in New York City, there is an urgent need for housing and especially for uh, affordable housing. We, we've talked about this, but as somebody that's you know, been working here for 10 years, there is census data that shows that New York City has grown by over 600,000 people around the past 10 years. You can see it when you walk around. Um, but in that same time, the number of housing units obviously has not grown by any stretch of that imagination the same, uh, in the same way. It's close to like 200,000 units. So I think that this project is appropriate and, and can grow um, the area in the way it needs to grow and can help the city grow. Thank you. Stephen Marmon will be the next speaker. Stephen Marmon. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, my name is Stephen J. Marmon. I live just one block north of the proposed project from 1981 to 1986. 
and I strongly support the revised plan for 250 Water. I moved to 324 Pearl Street to begin work as an investment banker for Merrill Lynch in the summer of 1981 so I could walk to work rather than take the daily subway rides I had previously used while living on the Upper East Side. That was two years before the opening of most of the South Street Seaport campus. The area back then was a desolate site, except late at night and very early in the morning when people and trucks flooded the streets to handle the tons of fish at the Fulton Fish Market. But for a few restaurants, Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, this is not something you can do in recording. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. For a few restaurants, like the like the late lamented Bridge Cafe, there was little in the ways of stores and services. And if one needed anything, then a hike north to Chinatown or west of Broadway was required. With the opening of the Seaport Complex in late July 1983, there suddenly was a flood of shops and bars and restaurants. When I walked home late at night from One Liberty Plaza, the streets were packed with other New Yorkers and tourists enjoying the historic and unique attractions of the Seaport and Pier 17. Almost every day I walked by that empty parking lot at 250 Water Street and wondered what and when something would rise at that location. Now we have a plan for residential buildings that will fit into the neighborhood, providing housing for hundreds of new residents. Many of them will, like me so many years ago, be those seeking a way to walk to work. I saw the dramatic change in the neighborhood after the opening of the Seaport Complex. As one who was a campaign and city hall aide to Mayor Ed Koch, another Bridge Cafe fan, I well know the critical importance of affordable housing lively streets and available shops and restaurants to the community. These buildings are not only appropriate in their location. Stephen, it, it, if you can just wrap it up, we ran out of time already. Okay, uh, they, they provide the funding needed to keep the seaport open. The seaport needs to become an exciting and lively part of Manhattan like it was um, today. And I urge you to approve the proposal for 250 Thank you, Thank you Stephen. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, the next speaker, please. Next, we will hear from Nisi Eber. Nisi Eber. We lose Nisi. Just checking. Uh, it appears that we have lost Nisi. Chair, uh, just going to check with our staff. Uh, just please stand by for one moment. Sorry, Chair, we do have one additional registration under the name Lisa Wong. Lisa Wong, if you can hear me. Uh, you are being called to testify after having registered. Uh, and if you can hear me, I'll ask that you please raise your hand, which you can do on the telephone by pressing star nine. Uh, all right, Chair, it appears uh, that we do not have Lisa Wong. And with that, I see no other members of the public who wish to testify on this item. Okay, uh, there being uh, no members of the public who wish to testify on LEU's number 906-907 for the 250 Water Street proposal. The public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. 
Uh, that concludes today's business. And uh, I remind the viewing public that for anyone wishing to submit written testimony for items that were heard today, please send it by email to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and I would like to thank, yep. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I apologize. Here's, here's that Councilor Chin has a hand. Yes, oh, absolutely. Oh, no. I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, to Councilmember Moya for this long hearing again, right? And I wanted to thank everyone who came to testify, uh, whether you are pro or against. I mean, there's been a lot of work on this. And I just wanted to, you know, reassure that we still got work to do, especially on the funding mechanism uh, for the Seaport Museum. We're gonna get that done before we come back to the council vote. And I also wanna thank the committee staff and, and our land use uh, staff and the sergeants. And thank you for uh, supporting us on this long hearing. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, and with that, I would like to thank the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, the subcommittee council, uh, land use and council staff, and the Sergeant at Arms for participating in today's meeting. And I would like to close by uh, wishing my mom a very happy birthday. Uh, I know she's watching. So ma, feliz cumpleaños, uh, te quiero mucho. And uh, with that, uh, this 